Sustainable development described as partial demolition of existing buildings, retention of three-storey building and former industrial chimney and redevelopment of the site to provide a mixed use um, scheme comprising blocks of two to seven storeys and accommodating commercial floor space at basement, ground, first, second, third, fourth and fifth floor, 50 residential units at part first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth floor as well as a, a cafe floor space at ground floor level, landscape, communal gardens, pedestrian link routes to the Regents Canal and other associated work. Uh, that was a little bit of a, a potted uh, description of development, um, uh, but uh, that uh, development is proposed to take place at 49 to 50 Eagle Wharf Road, Hackney N1 7ED. Description of development enough for those online to know that they're in the right place. Okay. So yesterday we uh, dealt with Mr Callum and Mr Hodgson, that's the council's planning witness and the Rule 6's uh, uh, planning witness. Today we're going to hear the evidence of Mr Marks. Mr Marks is the appellant's uh, planning witness. Just before we do that, are there any housekeeping matters or any matters that we need to raise, please? Yes, just, just a couple of things, Mum. Uh, Mr. White, there's a horrible feedback again. Anyone on the line able to do something about that, please? Try it again if we turn our microphones off. Please try again, Mr. White. Yes, good morning, Mum. Is that better? I think it is. I think it is. We'll soon find out. Okay. I, I had three matters to raise. The first is, did you get, we've sent through what we hope is what we wanted, the application form from 2017, I, as I understand it. Um, I hope you've got, well, you might not have a copy, but at least you can know that it should come through to you at some stage today, because that was one of the items outstanding. Uh, no, I did receive that. I received right. that before we resumed. Oh, uh, good. I took that as IQ27. Perfect. Is Perfect. that everybody else's understanding? Yes. Thank you. Good. That's the first thing. The second thing is, have you have you managed to get a copy of the um the the, uh, the LPA versions have been sent through to you of the on the consultation responses. You know the the elusive document has that come through? Yes, to you? I I got that. Thank you very much. And I've got that. I took that as IQ thirty one. That yep. was received yesterday, and I took that as IQ thirty one. I've actually got a matter to raise after you, Mr. White, but please carry on. Yeah, the, the next thing is, you recall our discussion yesterday was without Mr. Hodgson's evidence in chief, and I'm glad to see Mr. Harwood as Mr. Hodgson as his wingman today. <laughs> but can I just, we might want five minutes today just to discuss con proposed condition 41, because it seems that there's a bit of a, a clash between the case for the council and the case of the rule six potentially there might not be but i just think it merits discussion because obviously as i put to miss dodgson yesterday movement between the e classes is not required planning mission but the council is seeking a condition at the moment a suggested condition 41 which might restrict what the floor space could be used for and it's just i think it does merit canvassing a discussion as to in the light of how the Rule 6 party put their case yesterday. That's point three. Point four, can I just, just to put you and Mr Beard and Mr Harwood out of your, and um, we'll obviously deal with this with Mr Marks and Chief, but can I confirm the appellant is not going to allege the tilt of balance and it's not going to allege in relation to the HLS position. And the reason it does that, and I think the most sensible way, is in the light of what Mr Beard said yesterday that the council do not confirm an acceptance of 3.89 years. The position facing you is frankly the council haven't 
given you evidence on what the HLS position is. And in, and in the absence of Mr. Marks doing that, the position is that it cannot be confirmed or whether there be a shortfall. So we are happy to contend. We make no comment on the correct interpretation of the MPPF, but we are content to proceed on that basis, frankly, that it's simply not open to you to reach any decision on the tilt of balance because the evidence isn't there. So that's that will be our position. And just to confirm that is the Mr. Okay. Mr. Marks's evidence. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. White. That that's very helpful. Could I just raise an issue? The core docs in going through and uh, turning up the docs, it isn't a complete list. Um, particularly, I can't remember. I think it's the 18 series. I, I can't quite remember. Yes, it is the 18 series. Quite a few of them are missing. Could somebody please go through and check that it's an up-to-date list? Uh, because uh, obviously for members of the public, for us, and indeed for my reporting, it, it's very important that it's, it's, it's completely up-to-date. Okay, um, I, thank you very much for uh, everybody sent through the documents that they wish us to turn up uh, during evidence today. Um, I've actually turned up uh, um, uh, Mr. White's, first of all. Um, there are a lot, so we'll all need time to turn up the documents uh, when we move on to uh, cross-examination. Okay, then, uh, any other matters we need to... Yes, Mark, can I, sorry, and it's a tiny matter, but it just might assist the free advocates in our closings. In I've got that yesterday was day 10, and on your inquiry timetable, yesterday was day nine. <laughs> and it's, oh. a, it's a small matter, but I just, I just wonder if, if you see, I, I, I've, what I have got, I think is, we it did... Is it day 10 or day 9? Well, that's the question. It depends what, how you consider. I think we did meet, albeit briefly, on the 4th of October, okay. which wasn't a CMC. So I had that down as day 9. We discussed the way forward, if you recall, okay. and housekeeping. So I put that as... It, I really don't care, but I just... Obviously, you don't want Mr Harwood or Mr Beard or I referring to day 9, and you've got a different day to what's referred to in the closing. So I just wondered... Uh, 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 the simple question is if we take the approach in your timetable, which is to exclude the 4th of October as a formal sitting day, because it was just admin, and then therefore this is day 10. If we include the 4th of October, it's day 11. OK, should we stick to that? What's on my timetable? Fine, perfect. Mr. Howard, Mr Beard? Yeah, OK, that, that's absolutely fine. I will be asking at the end of today, I'll just be asking for um a time estimate for closing so that we know where we are on on friday so just bear that in mind any other matters Madam, just uh, if i may just about today in terms of um how we use our time i've um I, i've been liaising right through the inquiry with mr harwood to ensure that we avoid as best possible um, as best we can, uh, duplication of effort. I think that's all the more important today, given the uh, the subject matter that we've got to get through and the and the time estimate. Might I just indicate that, like my learned friend Mr. White yesterday, my cross examination is arranged in two halves, as you would expect it uh, generally to be. Madam, I think given this, given given the risk of duplication, and make sure that Mr. Marks um, has a proper opportunity to endure the day. Madam, I will be aiming to ask you to have the full lunch between my two halves, if that makes sense, because there's going to be a lot that's discussed during examination in chief. And I want to be able to, I want to ensure that I have the opportunity to take instructions over lunchtime um, uh, to ensure that I cover everything. All of my team are remote from where I am and remote to each other. So I, I just flagged that up and I hope that's helpful um, uh, in terms of managing the day. Well, that means, sorry, I'm just looking at the timetable, Mr. Beard. We've got about tops an hour and a half this morning. We'll have a mid-morning break. Um, now, I mentioned it. I mentioned it. Uh, the reason I mentioned it in, in that way is that obviously I don't know uh, what, what my learned friend is going to uh, cover in detail during the examination in chief or Mr. Uh, uh, what Mr. Marks is going to say. My only concern is this, is that because the evidence has been heard 
a while ago and because uh, i am not in the in in the same room as um my team and as mr callum uh, was not available uh, was not involved previously my only concern is that i ensure that there are proper opportunities for me to take instructions during the day and, uh, and the only reason I, I, I i'm i'm keen to do that is to ensure that i don't waste time um, cross-examining on things okay. that i don't need to yeah no i i understand mr bid no i i understand we'll do everything we can to to accommodate that um and thank you for that okay uh, Mr. White, please can I invite you to uh, introduce your planning witness to the inquiry, please? Yes, Mum, and just to help you, I think in terms, let me just get the time to, yes, my estimate of Mr. Marks is in chief. I gave an estimate of an hour, an hour and a half. In the interest of time, we'll try and keep to an hour. Frankly, things have shortened in the light of yesterday's cross-examination. So, Mr. Marks, can we take up your proof of evidence, please? Yes. Um, and can I introduce you, please, to the inquiry? You're a partner in the firm of Montague Evans, aren't you? I am. And if anyone doubts it, we can see your backdrop. <laughs> I'm fully branded. Yeah, fully branded. Not as not as nice as Mr. Beard's, but um, fully <laughs> branded. Um, and you've been a partner at Montague Evans since 2015, and you've been employed by that firm since 2006. Is that correct? That's correct. Prior to that, you worked at Newham, London Borough for four years between 02 and 06 as a planning officer. And in total, you now have 20 years experience. That's correct. You also list at 1.5 various other developments principally, well, all actually within London. Uh, and the inspector can see the characteristics of those, those matters. Now, the next point I wanted to ask, it's just worth identifying please in relation to your involvement in the project when were you first instructed by ghl please uh, i was instructed in 2014 uh, and um i've acted as a lead partner in the preparation um of the the three uh submissions applications um the first in in 2015 uh, the second in 2017 and then the amendments to the 2017 application um, which were lodged in 2021. Great thank you. Now can I just ask you let's just before we delve into the respective matters I just want in the light you've obviously had time to reflect on Mr Callum's evidence and Mr Hodgson's evidence bringing everything together can you summarize please the, the your overview of the decision before that lies before this inquiry frankly in the light of their evidence yes um so in light of the evidence that i heard yesterday um fundamentally um uh, my conclusions haven't changed and i remain of the opinion uh that the scheme uh the application before this inquiry is wholly compliant with the development plan when read as a whole um Coming back a step, um, looking at the development plan, it's quite clear that that sets out uh, what the council's objectives and priorities are. And at, at a strategic level, um, the site, as we're aware and we've heard, is in the city fringe opportunity area and in the Wenlock priority um, office area. <clears throat> and within those areas, um, there's a target for 15,500 homes, uh, over 50,000 jobs. Um, and we know that there's a strategic need for um, over 100,000 square metres of office floor space by 2023 and the need to create um, around about 23,000 jobs. Um, so in my opinion, those are the objectives and uh, the policies associated with those objectives that should be afforded the greatest weight. Um, clearly, in addition to that, the site's in a, a highly accessible location um and the reuse of previously developed land um represents sustainable development which is compliant with numerous policies of the development plan um which you ran through with uh, mr callum yesterday so i won't repeat those now um and in light of uh in light of that as i've said before my opinion is that the the uh the, the scheme is compliant with the development plan para 11c must therefore be um engaged and the scheme which represents sustainable development should be approved without delay. 
Thank you very much. Right. Can we then please move on to the reasons of refusal? And the first thing I want to ask you about, you've now obviously heard the evidence from the Rule 6 party, you've heard the council's evidence, and you've also heard your, your fellow witnesses on behalf of the appellant. And I just wanted to ask you, what is your judgment looking at your proof of evidence at 2.3? You've got the reasons of refusal from the 8th of April. And I first of all want to ask you, what is your view as to whether the proposal um, will breach HC5 and LP10 or not? What's your overall judgment, please? My overall judgment is that the, the scheme does not breach um, either HC5 or LP10. Uh, and why why do you reach that for you, please? Uh, well, if, if we go through um, each policy in turn, uh, actually, sorry, um, uh, Mr. White, I think I should say but before I get there, um, We've obviously been, been through quite an, an extensive process with this application previously. Um, it's had <coughs> uh, numerous pre-applications, been subject to numerous pre-application meetings, design review panels. We've had three planning committees, um, two of which um, the, the scheme was approved, three planning officer reports as well, uh, all of which have reached the same conclusion on, on the majority of these points. Uh, and hence, hence, you know, that, that has clearly uh, influenced my uh, conclusion uh, uh, on this matter. Um, in, in particular, with, with respect to policy um, HC5, um, it's clear that um, that policy supports the growth and evolution of, of London's cultural um, offer. Um, the onus is on the LPA uh, to protect venues, uses and facilities, uh, but importantly, where appropriate. Um, and I think it's clear, um, and I don't believe um, uh, any of the witnesses to date or, or advocates have put um, evidence to the contrary, um, that the purpose of the policy is to protect the use, not the user. Um, and I think that that point is explored in, in a bit more detail um, in the London Plan um, EIP report. Um, which mum is uh, CD 15.1, um, paragraph um, 337. Um, and I won't read that out in detail, but it's, it's summarized in my proof. So, so you can read that. Um, and then on to policy LP10, because um, clearly these policies must be read in, in conjunction. Um, my view, uh, my interpretation of the policy is that if the facility, um, which um, uh, is reprovided in accordance, and this is important, in accordance with other policy requirements, there cannot be a, a conflict with that policy. Um, now, reference to other policy objectives, in my opinion, must mean that there's, there's a balance to be struck. For example, uh, the priority office area policies, uh, housing policies, um, et cetera. Um, and that clearly is the approach that was taken in uh, the previous uh, planning committee reports, but most recently um, in, uh, if you take up CD 2.2 um, and paragraphs 5.3.13 uh, and 14, um, the officer's interpretation there clearly aligns um, with that view that it's, it's use, not user, uh, that is to be protected. Um, it's also worth pointing out, Mum, that um, Justice Dove, um, in his decision, uh, reached a, a similar conclusion, um, and that's core document 11.4. Um, uh, and again, um, that, that uh, decision is also referred to um, in the 2022 committee report, the paragraphs that I referred to earlier. Well, let's just be let's just be fair, Mr. Marks. Obviously, Mr. Justice Dove was opining about the previous policy. Correct. Yes. Just that, to make that absolutely yeah. clear. Yeah. It is of note, as you said, is it that Para 5.3.13 in March 22 still make reference to the Dove decision in the context of the, the Hackney local plan policy? Correct, correct. I think the, the point to raise here um, uh, is that fundamentally uh, the, the primary objectives of the policy, whilst the wording has changed, has evolved, 
um, the, the objectives of the policy were primarily the same. So hence the relevance in, in quoting that, that decision. Thank you. So then, um, basically, let's just look at the, in the light of the evidence as well, what do you say? Uh, let's just deal with this point about reprovision. Um, and I just fundamentally want to ask you, what do you say about the proposal that sits before this appeal and whether it amounts to reprovision or not in your judgment? Yes. Uh, so in my judgment, um, based upon the evidence that, that we've heard, um, I, I believe it's reasonable to conclude that the um, cultural use um, has been reprovided. Um, if we go to uh, Mr. Stevenson's um, evidence, um, that, um, in my opinion, clearly set out uh, again that the the space could be uh, utilised for uh, both film and photography use, but also um, other cultural and creative uses. That's also been um, backed up by, uh, and I hope I pronounce her name correctly, uh, Miss. Uh, uh, Avaranitakis um, and similarly uh, the planning application originally Mum was also supported by a uh, an employment viability report which was produced by Stretton's um, and if you need the CD number for that I can give that to you as well uh, bear with me apologies uh the employment viability report is cd 1.44 mum no um, sorry, no, sorry mr white no go on mr marks you i didn't realize you hadn't finished carry no. on um so uh mr uh mr stevenson's evidence um also clearly set out that in his in his opinion uh one which i share and and uh planning officers previously have shared um, that the the appeal scheme not only reprovides space for cultural creative uses, but but is far superior in terms of uh, layout and overarching quality, um, and um, that uh, in terms of supply of existing floor space, uh, and this comes to I suppose harm in terms of uh, the perceived loss. Um, if, if that is an eventuality of holding studios the business uh, rather than the use, um, there is a very good supply of existing floor space um, which could be suitable <coughs> for holding studios um, in just three other London boroughs um, that, that Mr Stevenson's evidence looks at. And I believe we concluded that there was somewhere in the region of about 1.1 million square foot of office space and about 83,000 square foot of industrial floor space. So about 1.2 million square foot of floor space that exists in the surrounding area in total. And in addition to that, there is also a very, very good supply of uh, film and photography studios uh, within five miles of the site <coughs> uh, and 10 miles of the site. And um, in uh, the appendix to Mr. Stevenson's evidence that's clearly set out in terms of availability of studios and types of studios within the immediate area. Um, and as a summary, just to remind everyone, because it was a while ago, uh, I think we concluded that there are around 15 sites within five miles, <clears throat> 64 studios, of which four have drive in facilities, uh, and then within a 10 mile radius 21 sites and about 87 studios six with driving um and then just finally on this point um the there is um hopefully as we've now confirmed through uh id 17 mom uh and clarification around floor space comparison of existing to proposed there there will be an uplift in floor space as a result of the proposed development which ultimately I've concluded will make a positive contribution to the Wenlock priority area, priority office area, apologies. Thank you. So um, overall, in the, in the light of bringing all those factors together, is it your view that there is a breach, frankly, of HC5 and LP10 or not? 
No, I don't believe there is at all. Thank you. Let's move on to the next issue, main issue I want to talk to you about is heritage. And again, can I just ask you, in the light of the evidence you've now heard from Dr. Mele and the council's witness on, on heritage, what, what is your view as to whether the allegation reason of refusal free is made out or not, please? Uh, again, Mr. White, I, I don't believe um, that this particular reason for refusal and the policies that are referenced are um, justified. Um, I've worked with Dr. Mealy for a number of years. Uh, I certainly won't be arguing against him. Um, and um, I remain of the opinion, uh, leaning on uh, Dr. Mealy's evidence, that in summary, um, the, the harm to the non-designated uh, heritage asset from demolition um, is offset, in his opinion, by uh, the benefit of retaining significant parts of um, the existing buildings, including the chimney um, and the Victorian warehouse range, um, and that the long-term protection added to landscape and setting in enhancements are a benefit. Um, and then any perceived harm is clearly less than substantial um, and the loss is limited solely in, in Dr. Media's opinion um, to the internal features that were to be removed. Then taken as a whole, um, the important um, features of the site um, clearly are preserved um, and their contribution to the conservation area um, uh, uh, is uh, offset, uh, offsets the demolition um, by those benefits plus the overarching design of the scheme, which is considered a positive contribution, which includes the proposed use. Um, so in Dr. Mealy's opinion, the, the proposals as a whole um, enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. And in his view, that benefit outweighed the harm and delivered a net benefit. And that be heritage benefit is weighted under Section 72 of the Act and para New Para 205, I believe, ma'am. Hopefully I've got that correct. Um, so uh, that, that's Dr. Mealy's position, Mr. White. So, okay, thank you. Then can we then, but let's, let's that was Dr. Mealy's. Can I ask you just, and we'll come back to benefits in a moment, but let's imagine the external balance required in 208. Yes. And if the inspector doesn't accept Dr. Mealy's evidence and thinks there is harm, whether it be under 208 or 209, what do you mm -hmm. say as to whether the benefits that are encapsulated in this proposal do or do not outweigh the harm in that situation? What's your planning judgment? Yeah, uh, my judgment on this particular point is that there um, are significant benefits that, that outweigh that harm. Um, I've clearly listed those benefits, Mom, which we'll go through um, in detail later on. Um, in section six of my proof. Mm. Uh, and sorry, Mr. White, and, and I suppose the, the other observation to make is that, that that judgment, again, is clearly consistent with three previous decisions. Most recent, again, of which um, is uh, uh, the committee report at CD 2.2, um, and specifically paragraph reference 5.4.14. But that, let's just make that clear. Did in the March 2022, did the council conclude in the, on the basis of the internal balancing exercise, i.e. the overall heritage harm, w w did not effectively engage what was then 202 and 203, or was the conclusion that the public benefits outweighed the harm that the council had? Sorry, Mr. White, no apologies. Um, yeah, the, the, the conclusion at that stage was that, the, that there were, that, that there were uh, there was uh, less than substantial harm, but the planning benefits outweighed that harm. Thank you. Right, then can we move on to the next reason of refusal two, and that relates to the allegation that the proposed accommodation is unsatisfactory for three factors. Effectively, the, the aspect, single aspect, the predominance of single aspect, the thing 54%, the yep. provision of open space, um, effectively, uh, and the children's play area. Let me just ask you, first of all, can we deal with the, the issue of the um, single aspect, frankly, and what you're, whether you think there is a breach or not of policy D6? Yes. So uh, in terms of uh, policy D6, um, my opinion is that uh, when you read the policy as a whole, 
um, there, there is no breach to that policy uh, and therefore in, t in turn uh, no conflict with policy uh, LP17 on the basis that that requires compliance with D6. Thank you. And then can I just let, can I just ask you this point about D6 because it is just worth um, I want to ask you about the approach. I put the yeah. approach to Mr. Callum yesterday that in considering residential amenity, the approach in the light of policy D6 is to look at various factors. Is that a judgment you agree or disagree with, please? Uh, absolutely agree with. Yeah. Uh, um, Oh, sorry, Mr. Whitecom. Uh, and then, can I ask you, in relation to those factors that are normally deployed to reach judgment on, on the acceptability of the proposed accommodation, is it your view that those factors demonstrate acceptable amenity or unacceptable amenity, please? Uh, acceptable amenity. Now, let me then, can we just deal, let's specifically deal with this point about dual aspect units mm -hmm. uh, and the the concern that there are 54% single aspect. What what do you say about that, please? Um, I think the first point to note, uh, Mum, is that the policy, the policy itself uh, is is not prohibitive, uh, prohibitive, and it and it is flexibly worded, and and it does take account uh, or requires development to take account of site specific purposes, uh, circumstances, uh, and you need to read that policy as a whole. But also taking account of um, policy D3, the, the site optimization uh, strand of that policy. Um, and when you take all those component parts together, um, it, it, it remains my view that the scheme overall is, is compliant with the policy. Yes, there are uh, single aspect units, but ultimately um, the provision of single aspect units uh, is not a necessarily uh, in conflict with policy as long as you can ultimately demonstrate that uh, a you've you uh, have optimized site capacity in accordance with part policy d3 part three um, and uh, on that particular point it is common ground with the council mom um, if you go to id 10 paragraph 8.32 um, that the the density of the scheme is acceptable um, and it's probably worthwhile um, just reiterating at that point again you know we we, we did not just arrive at this scheme uh, Mr Davies evidence clearly sets that out but it was rigorously tested through pre-app uh, uh, pre-application discussions through design review panel um, and and site-specific um, constraints were taken into account um, in arriving at the final design we then go to when, when you have single aspect units uh, as long as you can demonstrate that the quality of amenity in terms of privacy um, uh, orientation uh, overheating daylight sunlight etc is acceptable then ultimately you are determining that the overarching quality of amenity to, afforded to those units is therefore acceptable and on that basis, I think it's reasonable to conclude that, um, particularly in respect of Part C of Policy D6, uh, the scheme is compliant. Can I just ask you two other matters? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, can you tell me roughly your case file at the moment? How many projects are you juggling, Mr. Marks? Uh, Thirty odd projects. Mm. What, what, in your judgment, would have been the reaction of a client? that where well let, let me first of all ask this question during your experience of this application did the council raise a concern about the number of single aspect units or not uh no not in express terms no so in the context we we know the members were obviously because the reason refusal raised an objection but i just want to ask in your professional experience what would be the reaction of a client who was asked to spend additional money to amend a scheme which didn't seem to raise at that time any issues on a on an item if you had gone to a client and said we now need to redesign the scheme because there might be a concern on on the proportion of single against double aspect units i suspect they would no longer be retained <laughs> they or you <laughs> me <laughs> so let me just can we then please just if, i mean can i also ask how relevant or not i had this debate with mr callum yesterday 
the approach taken at Sturt's Yard, and Mr. Davy gives the figures, which weren't challenged, and, uh, and there's no reason why they should, because they're factual. Yeah. But actually, the 61% of units being single aspect. Uh, mm. what, what do you say about whether Sturt's Yard is relevant or not for the inspector's consideration of this matter? Uh, I mean, in my opinion, it is highly relevant. Um, I, I do appreciate from Mr. Callum's perspective that you need to um, treat in treat each site on its individual merits but fundamentally the site has a very very similar uh, orientation spatial layout to this site what i would add is that uh, the appeal site has an additional constraint given the retention of existing buildings uh, i think it was alleged uh, i believe by mr hodgson yesterday that, that we have a kind of blank canvas on this site well that's not the case at all um, we've got ex existing buildings that are being retained. We have to respect our neighbours in terms of adjacencies and overlooking, etc. All of those um, factors have an influence in terms of the spatial layout and, and disposition of residential development. Um, the, the other thing I would just flag, and, and this is set out in Mr. Davies' evidence, um, is that we, the appeal scheme, Mum, is, is being judged on a on a higher bar because of the new found definition of what does and doesn't constitute a dual aspect unit um and if one were to apply that definition to the sturt's yard scheme actually you would increase the number of single aspect units to something like 68 percent so significantly more than is being proposed on this particular site given the added constraints and the, the final thing to note in respect of Sturt's Yard is, is fundamentally the uh, uh, this is a, a GLA policy and the GLA did not object to the Sturt's Yard scheme. Thank you. Can I then ask you to wrap that up? Overall, in the light of the evidence pulled by the council yesterday, is it your view that there is effectively a breach of the policy? And if there be, what weight do you give that in your overall planning balance, please? Yeah, so uh, I mean, in my opinion, that there, there is not a breach to policy D6 and therefore LP17, particularly when the policies are, are read as a whole. Um, in particular, I, I, I am of the opinion that part C and part D of D6 um, are complied with. Um, again, Mum, um, three previous officer reports um, all reached the same conclusion around residential quality. Um, and ultimately the standards have um, enhanced over time and, and the scheme remains a good quality scheme. Um, so I, uh, my ultimate conclusion is that this scheme will deliver um, overall high quality um, residential accommodation. Thank you. Next point, can we then deal with the open space? And there are two components, obviously, the communal open space and the children's. Can I just briefly ask you, what you say as to whether there be a breach in the failure to provide adequate open space or not? Uh, in my opinion, uh, there again, no breach to these particular policies. Again, uh, I think you, you uh, went through this with Mr. Callum yesterday. Um, the, the, the policies themselves are flexibly worded. They are not absolutes. Um, and there are ways in which one can um, through the policy itself, mitigate any uh, under provision against the targets that are set out within those policies. Uh, and can I just ask you, because it, it was an issue, LP48 identifies non-compliance in terms in the policy. Do you remember little c? Yes, correct. Where A and B cannot be fully achieved, to yep. must. To what extent is it your view that little c is or is not complied with by what's proposed in the application? In my opinion it's complied with and that's um clearly um uh supported again by uh, the previous um officers uh committee report um, we, sorry, go on. yeah so i, I believe mum if you turn to cd 2.2 um and um i believe it's paragraph 5.5.5 deals with this particular point uh, it's probably worthwhile also noting, Mom, that um, in addition, uh, and again, I concur with this officer's view, was that um, 
again the retention of the existing buildings were a constraint to uh, the quantum of uh, communal uh, space that could be provided uh, overall the conclusion was that the quality of space was extremely high um, and also you know added to the fact that that its aspect um, is onto the canal um, strengthens that next point then can we deal with children's play space and whether there be a breach or not of LP50, frankly. Yeah, So, uh, sorry, Mr. White, what, one final point, just in terms of consistency of decision-making again. Uh, I know we harp back to it, but but Sturt's yard mum, um, if you go to CD 12.7, paragraph 6.4.20, um, that scheme mitigated, that did have a shortfall. I think there was some uncertainty yesterday as to whether there was a Sturt shortfall on Sturt's yard that mitigated a short through short, shortfall through an open space contribution. Thank you. That I was moving on to children's play space and particularly policy LP fifty. And again, what do you say as to whether there be a breach of LP fifty or not in your judgment? No, no breach in my judgment. But but why not, please, Mr. Mark? Uh, fundamentally, because uh, the policy, again, is uh, flexibly worded, um, uh, the policy itself, and I think we went to the, actually the supporting text of that policy, clearly states that um, play space can be provided um, uh, in addition to open space, effectively meaning that those spaces can, can overlap. Uh, we heard Mr. Davies' evidence um, where it was confirmed that the the landscape, um, and this actually, Mum again came out of uh, evolution through design review panel meetings. That the play space, uh, because this scheme is primarily a, a commercial scheme, um, should should mainly have a, a commercial character. But that the landscape could be playable, which is a, a fairly common approach to mixed use um, developments that that have residential um, components, um, and that as long as uh, you know that that landscape can be playable so you don't have to have you know specific pieces of equipment mom as, as you may expect on on other schemes that are uh, residential led thank you now so can we bring those strands together and overall what's your overall view frankly well actually no we've got one more to finish haven't we let's let's add in the final element the family housing and the the 33 percent um, effectively, it's policy LP14 yeah. that we need to look at. Indeed. And the first question I want to ask you on LP14 is the point, well, I want to ask you about little c, as you can imagine. What do you say about little c, please? Uh, apologies, I'm just giving you policy. Page up. 94. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, the this policy is also um, flexibly worded. Um, part C of, of LP14 clearly sets out um, a range of circumstances uh, or characteristics that can be taken into account to allow for a variation from the housing mix target stated in the policy. Um, and just very quickly going through each of those in turn, uh, tenure is stated. Uh, I think it's, it's relevant to note in this context mom that the scheme is primarily market what well, is market housing uh, only um i uh, definitely within the planning application documents themselves um we do set out that um in our opinion there is less demand for family housing um in a in a market housing context um it's also common ground uh with the local planning authority um that on-site affordable isn't viable, um, and that mom set out at uh, ID 10, paragraph 8.35. Um, site location is also listed as a as a, a consideration, and again, as we've discussed, clearly this site's in a, a priority um, uh, office area, um, and uh, it's it's clear. Uh, again, within uh, the statement of common ground, uh, that employment is the priority use. And if you go to paragraph 8.33, that's clearly set out. 
Um, area characteristics, uh, this has also been discussed previously, but we know we're in an urban location. There's a policy requirement for us to optimize site capacity um, and that the surrounding developments clearly are predominantly flatted. Um, now, whilst that in itself doesn't mean that family housing cannot be provided, uh, it's certainly in my experience, Mom, um, more challenging to accommodate family housing um, and, and possibly less desirable. Um, added to, to that on this particular site, there are clearly design constraints because the scheme is, is employment led. And ultimately the only place to locate family housing is on the upper floors of the ski. Generally with residential development, it's, it's normally accepted that an ideal location for family housing would normally be on the ground floors or the lower floors because you've got direct access to play space and amenity space. Um, less of a problem lugging a buggy up um, you know, uh, through a lift, et cetera. Um, so again, we have that constraint on this site that, that officers had previously taken account of. Um, and viability, is, as we'd already discussed, again, um, it's clear from Little C that, that viability is a matter um, that can be factored into. Um, and Mr. Turner's evidence, Mom, if you remember that, um, his evidence clearly stated that um, ultimately um, in order to reach the balance of uses that we've arrived at for this scheme, uh, the scheme itself needed to maximise one and two beds over three beds um, in order to reach the, the, uh, the appeal scheme that's before you. Oh, you're on mute, Mr White. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was being considerate so people can image heaving papers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, there is there is one, one final point actually, and, and again, um looking looking to um uh sorry, no, that, that was my final point. Well let me let me ask you to bring together the allegations of reason of refusal to relating to single act aspect, the open space, both for children and general and Obviously, the issue we've just done housing mix. What, what, in your view, is the overall uh, assessment of the reason of refusal against policy, please, Mr. Mark? Uh, my, my overarching opinion is that the schemes wholly compliant with those policies, and and there is no breach. Right. Can we then move on to reason of refusal four? And can we take quickly? Uh, I'm conscious I'm aiming to finish in twelve minutes. So, can yeah. we just in the light of Mr. Callum's answers can i just say do you agree or disagree with the evidence he gave on policy in relation to effectively the breach the alleged breach of affordable housing uh, and the alleged breach of the 11.5 percent of affordable work base uh so I, my my understanding of mr callum's evidence was that he fundamentally concluded that there were no conflicts with those individual policies uh and therefore on that basis um I would concur with that and ultimately i don't see that the reason for refusal can be substantiated well let's just deal with the final limb and that is frankly let's just have a look at lp27 which is the final limb which i i think requires and that is of course the requirements in little c2 that that at least 60 percent of the overall new floor space on the site is b1 use class subject to viability it says well i just mm -hmm. ask you your view as to what you say about that non-compliance the 54 percent of the scheme as opposed to the policy aspiration of 60 percent yeah um firstly on that point and uh i hope i've recalled this correctly I, I believe that mr callum accepted that there was no breach with this particular strand of the policy um it is also common ground uh, with the with the LPA, Mom. Uh, if you go to paragraphs uh, 8.13, uh, 8.17, 8.19, and 8.34, um, that um, you know the scheme is employment led fundamentally, and, and that the viability um, is accepted. Um, Previous committee reports, officer reports, Marm had all accepted the balance of uses. And again, most recently, if we go back to CD 2.2, uh, paragraph 
that confirms uh, that officers had reached a, a similar judgment. Um, and another point that I think is is relevant, Ma'am, is um, I don't believe that the 60% um, requirement per se need be slavishly followed. And, and for this reason, one could end up with a scheme uh, smaller than this scheme um, and hit a 60%, hit the 60% requirement, but ultimately deliver less floor space overall. And I, I believe one has to come back to the ultimate um, objectives of the policies for uh, the opportunity area um, and, and the Wenlock priority office area, which is to increase floor space and, and increase jobs. Um, and ultimately, this scheme achieves those fundamental objectives. Can I just ask, Mr. Marks, you've obviously now heard all the evidence. What do you see, what do you identify, please, as the harm of the 54% as opposed to the 60%? If the inspector gives consent, what harm, if any, do you identify would arise to the Wenlock Priority Office area in your judgment? Uh, I, I, no harm uh, um, and ultimately a benefit because we are delivering an uplift in floor space. Thank you. OK, and putting those elements together, overall reason of refusal for what do you say about that then, please? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, as, as I said uh, uh, slightly earlier, um, my view is that um, the, the policies um, that are stated in the reason for refusal have all been complied with. And ultimately, um, my conclusion is that the particular reason for refusal, refusal cannot be substantiated. Thank you. Can we just deal with three final matters, please? There are a few responses to the Rule 6, deal with the development plan and then end on the planning balance. I think there are various miscellaneous points you just feel you sh should mention raised by the Rule 6 party. Can I ask you to be reasonably succinct? The first is about urban greening has not been considered. What do you say about that? Uh, yeah, urban greening has been considered. Um, if you go to paragraph 5.187 of my proof, ma'am, uh, clearly sets out that the scheme will, can achieve a, an urban greening factor of 0.32, which exceeds a policy target of 0.3. Uh, and that's also covered in the committee report, ma'am, uh, CD 2.2, paragraph 5.8.4. Sorry, sorry, uh, Mr. Marks, your your reference in your proof five. Uh, my my proof is paragraph five point one eight seven, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then the committee report. Uh, and the committee report. Uh, apologies, Mum. Uh, just checking my notes. Paragraph 5.8.4. Okay. Brilliant. Next point, please. Um, the circular economy and the WLC assessment. Hmm. What would what did you want to say about that, please? Uh so uh first point to note is because the application is not referable to the um, Greater London Authority, ma'am, it was agreed with officers um, that there was no requirement to prepare either a circular economy statement or a whole life carbon assessment. Uh, but if you go to paragraph 5.189 of my proof, um, that confirms that the planning authority at the time was satisfied that both circular economy and whole life carbon principles were dealt with by both the condition survey um, secured by the planning condition and the construction waste management plan, which was also um, controlled by conditions as well. But in any event for completeness, um, and it was appended to my proof, uh, we have prepared uh, both a whole life carbon assessment and a circular economy assessment. Thank you. Next point, please. General sustainability in energy, because there's an allegation in the Rule 6 that the scheme is not maximised 
in relation to those elements. What do you say about that? Yeah, I, I don't agree with that um, as an allegation. Um, the application was clearly supported by an energy statement, ma'am, which you can find at CD 1.45, and also a sustainability statement, which is at CD 1.49. Combined, both of those assessments clearly demonstrate compliance with the Mayor's energy hierarchy um, and explain the approach to renewables. Um, it's probably also worthwhile just pointing out very quickly that um, the Rule 6 parties' uh, evidence fails to acknowledge that the scheme will deliver air, air source heat pumps as a renewable form of energy as well as PV, um, and that we do maximise renewable technologies on that basis. And this is all covered again, Mom, in, in the committee report at CD 2.2, paragraphs 5.15 and 5.16 which ultimately confirmed that the those assessments were independently reviewed by the council's um, sustainability consultant. Thank you. Then penultimately on this issue, overheating, compliance or not, please? Uh, compliance overall. Um, I believe the Rule 6 um, in evidence have alleged that the scheme isn't compliant with um, SI4 of the London Plan and LP54 of um, the Hackney local plan um, due to um, the DSY2 and DSY3 scenarios, Mum. I'm not going to profess to be an expert on this particular point, uh, but ultimately um, in discussions with our uh, overheating expert, it's my understanding that those um, scenarios there is no mandatory requirement to comply with them um that they are purely uh, a guide to assist uh development in uh evolving the uh overheating cooling strategy uh, and and fundamentally the council sustainability consultant if you go again back to paragraph 5.16 of the committee report cd 2.2 confirms that there's no objection to overheating and indeed that's common ground mum with the council um paras 8.40 and 8.61 thank you mr marks and finally on this topic acoustic assessment the rule six party in their statement of case raised a concern that the acoustic assessment had not considered the impact of air source roof plants yep. in the residential amenity what mm. do you say on that topic please uh, uh, my opinion, Mum, that those uh, impacts are mitigated through planning conditions 33 and 34. Um, and it's also worthwhile just raising that um, it's common ground with, with the planning authority, Mum, that um, agent of change principles have been complied with um, and that there's no objection to air source heat pumps and you can find those references at paragraphs 8.43 and 8.16 of the Statement of Common Ground. Brilliant, thank you. <clears throat> right, can we then move on penultimately, please, to the development plan? Now, two points I want to ask you about. First of all, in, you will recall my cross-examination of Mr. Callum and Mr. Hodgson, in particular Mr. Hodgson, Mr. Harwood in the examination pointed out you hadn't um, referred to SD1, GG2 and GG4 in your evidence. I first of all want to ask you, it, your overall conclusion, does the proposal comply with the development plan or not? Yes. Do policies SD1, GG2 and GG4, are they consistent or not with your overall conclusion? I, do you think they're policies that support the grant of consent or oppose the grant of consent? They're clearly policies that support the grants of consent. Right. Thank you. And now, overall, can I just deal with this point about the development plan? And and first of all, what weight do you give to the policies in the development plan? Uh, full weight. Thank you. And as a result of the guidance in the MPPF, and in particular paragraph 11, what in the light of your conclusion on the development plan, what does the policy say the response of the decision maker should be when there is accordance with an up-to-date development plan, please? Yeah, as, as you're aware, Mum, in accordance with paragraph 11C, 
uh, which we believe is triggered that presumption in favour of sustainable development should be applied um, as the scheme is compliant with the development plan when read as a whole. Now, can we then finally please just deal with the benefits and can I take this in the interest of time as it's 11.30, um, we want to keep, so can I just briefly ask you, um, benefits, economic benefits. Now, frankly, what weight in the light of the new MPPF, what weight do you give to the benefits? And that includes an agreed position with the council that up to 529 jobs could be created if the proposal grants consent. What overall weight do you give to the economic benefits of the scheme, please? Uh, substantial or significant benefit to those. Thank you. Next point, please. The affordable workspace, um, the, the the commitment for the 11.5% of affordable workspace, what weight do you give to that, please? Uh, I give um, substantial weight to that. Uh, housing delivery, 50 units. Now, let's not, in the light of what I said at the beginning, let's not trouble ourselves with where the HLS is because we simply don't have the evidence. But... I wanted to ask you what weight you give in the light of what the government say in the new MPPF about significantly boosting the supply of housing and also the Gove letter to the mayor, which indicates a shortfall of provision in the past and a desire to change or reconsider the approach. What weight do you give to housing delivery, particularly in the context of London, please, Mr. Marks? Uh, substantial positive weight. Then there's also this issue about the flexibility of the floor space and the qualitative improvement of what is proposed, what weight do you give to that? Uh, give that a moderate weight. Thank you. Heritage benefits, in the light of Dr Miele's evidence and the benefits that he identifies, what weight do you give to those? Uh, cumulatively substantial weight. In, the, in terms of the proposal being a sustainable development, and the reuse of what currently sits there what do you say about that the substantial weight to the benefits as well in the light of mr davies evidence and the conclusions and and what is agreed to the extent with the council what weight do you give to the design of the proposal please a uh, substantial weight again and then we've got agreement on the bng of 100 percent. and uh, what weight do you give to that bearing in mind mr callum's point that actually it, the baseline's pretty low that that must affect the weight you give it. What do you say about that? I would still afford significant weight given uh, we significantly exceed um, the, the policy requirement. Then open space, what weight do you give to that? Uh, I'd give that um, a moderate weight. Thank you. Now, finally, cumulatively, therefore, what weight do you give to the benefits that you've identified if the inspector was minded to grant planning permission, please? Uh, substantial benefits and then in the light of your evidence frankly in relation to the four reasons of refusal what weight do you give the four impacts alleged by the council a limited weight on the basis of my evidence and therefore applying the flat balance of paragraph 11 what do you where do you say the planning balance lies uh, in in favor of the development can I just finally ask you this question, though? What do you say? There's obviously a difference of approach that we explored yesterday mm. and in relation to weighting of benefits and impacts. What do you say about the approach of when you're considering the benefits? You also must consider the, the impacts and that must have an influence on the weighting of the benefits. What do you say to that approach? Is it one you endorse or, or stay away from? What's your view on that, Mr. Marks, please? I would say the, well, the approach that I've taken is is um, we, we we weigh up the benefits and we and we look at um, the impacts of the harm and then one comes to an overall judgment. Uh, it seemed to to me that both um, Mr. Cullum and Mr. Hodgson had, in effect, double loaded um, the uh, uh, well, I suppose double double loaded in, in terms of the harm arising um, and ultimately suppressing the benefits of the scheme in reaching their conclusions. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Marks. Thank you, Mum. That's our examination in chief. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. White. OK, let's take a short break now. We'll take a short break for uh, 20 minutes and we'll come back. Um, 20 minutes. So what's that then? 
11 55. Thank you,
Good morning, everyone. The inquiry is now resumed. Mr. Beard, can I invite you to cross examine the witness, please? Yeah, thank you, Madam. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Marks. Can you hear me all right? I can. Good morning. Uh, you're just in a nice, I just about to have a moment to put you in a more. Um, in the crosshead. In a, in a less <laughs> um, difficult position to watch, to, to watch you, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, right, I have you. So. Uh, I apologise for that. Uh, Mr. Marks, um, the way I'm going to approach this cross-examination for your assistance and for the assistance of everybody else is that I'm going to attempt in the first part of the cross-examination to see if we can agree a number of principled ways for uh, the proper approach and some factual matters and uh, to, to, to identify as much common ground as we can through asking questions without referring to documents, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment that if you want to look at a document that we shouldn't or that I'm, I'm stopping you doing that. But the purpose uh, of the first part of my cross-examination, and Madam, might I just indicate that I, it's likely, the first part of my cross-examination is likely to take about an hour. Uh, so for my part, that, that looks like uh, going up to the luncheon adjournment. Um, the first part of my cross-examination is to, to identify whether and to what extent we have to look in detail at matters relating to the main issues, the reasons for refusal, in the second part of my cross-examination, um, where we'll look more closely at documents. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Marks? It does. Where I'm going. All right. uh, I do that because I know, Mr. Marks, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I do that because you've confirmed this morning that you've been involved, not only involved uh, with this, uh, the redevelopment of this uh, site um, uh, since the beginning, if I could put it like that, but you've also taken the lead role in terms of um, uh, your firm's involvement. In other words, you're the lead planner, uh, the, the lead planning expert. You're also the lead partner in terms of how the case has been progressed in the terms of a team effort um, at every stage. Would, would, that, would that be fair? Yes. Yeah, all right. All right. Uh, if, if at any stage um, in my cross-examination, I stray from um, areas in which you weren't the lead professional, if that makes sense, please feel free to explain that. And I say that because, uh, Mr. Marks, I cross-examined uh, Mr. Stevenson, you might remember, about his involvement. And he explained very helpfully that he didn't become involved uh, with uh, the project, if I can put it like that, until after the reasons for refusal and um, after uh, refusal of permission, but also um, prior to whether or not, uh, prior to or involved with making the decision about whether or not to appeal the decision. That's right. Yeah, that, that's your recollection, is it? Correct. Correct. Uh, were you involved in bringing Mr. Stevenson uh, on board, or was that a uh, was that a, a recommendation of yours, or, or something that the client did? Your client did. Uh, I would say it was a collaborative recommendation. Was it? Um, was Mr. Stevenson uh, just by? Perhaps it's my curiosity more than anything. Um, uh, was Mr. Um, Stevenson your recommendation to take on that role or not? Uh, ultimately, yes. Thank you very much. Um, that, that helps me in terms of making sure that I, I don't ask you questions that, that are unfair. Mm. Um, thinking about your involvement uh, from the beginning, it's fair to say that this, the scheme that is presented to this inquiry is, for all intents and purposes, the scheme that was um, designed or, or formulated uh, about 10 years ago. Is that right? Would that be fair? Uh, it's absolutely, well, it's involved in that period. And it's yes. Period. Yeah. Uh, but the, the broad principles, yes. Yes. And, and I explored, uh, this topic, if, if I can put it like that, this topic with Mr. Davey, uh, and Mr. Stevenson and, and Dr. Mealy in, in, in evidence. And you recall the nature of the way I put the case on behalf of the local planning authority was that in all, for all intents and purposes this scheme was designed a very long time ago and limited amount of um, evolution if i to use your word or your term 
the limited amount of evolution is taking place in terms of the, 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 the design strategy or the scheme strategy, the development strategy from the beginning. Would that be fair? Um, yes, to a degree, yes. I mean, this, as I said, the scheme has clearly evolved from the original submission, um, which, which, as you're aware, the, the 2015 application, MARM, was uh, that's it's fair to say a residential led development um and the scheme uh evolved from that point onwards and became what i would now term an, an employment led development um and again that was that was in collaboration uh and discussion with the local planning authority well that's very fair if i may say so and, and, and i don't take it any further than that in terms of the the generality of that point and we will descend um, um, to particulars in terms of the evolution, Mr. Mr. Marx. But just thinking about what the answer that you've um, just given, when we are speaking about what the local planning authority or the council has done, it's important, is it not, to identify the difference between formal decision making or determinations by the local planning authority and um, uh, collaborative work done together uh, with um, uh, with officers, whether it's pre-application discussions, whether it's the preparation of reports, whether it's negotiations or anything like that. It's important to recognize the difference between the formality of a local planning authority decision or determination and what we might describe as officers and the council uh, dealing with the outside world. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I mean, I concur. There's clearly a difference between uh, dealing with, with planning officers and a planning committee. If that's what's being suggested. I know it goes a little bit further than that, doesn't it? Because, um, because throughout your evidence, um, Mr. Marx, um, you speak about the council, the council, the council. Now, in the context of uh, a, a, a planning appeal such as this, the council only speaks by way of uh, sorry, the local planning authority only speaks by way of formal determinations. Uh, do you agree with that? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thinking about or, 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 or framing uh, framing everything uh, we discuss um, uh, uh, by that um, legal truth, but also for um, formal truth, um, it's right when the inspector comes to consider your evidence that when you speak about what the council has agreed, otherwise than um, otherwise than by way of formal determination by the local planning authority, what we're really talking about is the evolution of negotiations or discussions or, 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 or public statements by officers. Would you agree by, by, with that? Uh, in part, uh, what I would say is obviously we have two previous uh, determinations by the planning authority, yes, uh, using your terms. No, no, that's right. And and the final uh, scheme, uh, the the twenty twenty one scheme, uh, clearly was an officer recommendation on behalf of the council to its committee. Um, so yes, there is a distinction, I suppose, between those. I'm grateful for that, and it's an important distinction, isn't it? Because in terms of um, whether or not it's open to the local planning authority in this appeal to um, uh, to make its case or, or to defend a reason for refusal um, or, or to make any submission or, or, or lead any evidence, this local planning authority is limited by the reasons for refusal because it's a member overturn decision. You agree with that, don't you? Yes. And it's no part of your case, as I understand, or no part of your evidence, I I even this morning, to suggest that in any sense that the local planning authority's evidential case has stepped outside what is reasonably or appropriately or, or lawfully or whatever term you need uh, we, we, we use step outside the boundaries of what members decided by way of the reasons for refusal that's correct isn't it? C certainly not on the basis of what members decided were the reasons I'm for grateful for that I'm grateful for that because a lot of work was done was it not um, at the very early stages of, uh, of this appeal being made to ascertain uh, the division between what the local planning authority was entitled uh, to speak to in evidence and what it was not entitled to speak to, to evidence, and that is reflected in the statement of statements of common ground. Would you agree with that? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, and it comes down to this, does it not? That if members um, uh, uh, did not object to or depart from uh, the plan uh, uh, of the the analysis, uh, 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 the analysis of officers um, in the committee report, the planning analysis, or, or the facts that um, uh, the, 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 that are stated in the report, they can be assumed to have agreed with uh, what what, of, what officers have written. Um, so far as it's material to the main issues in this case, do you agree? Sorry, Mr. Bick, could you rephrase? Yes, I will. I will do that. <laughs> What I'm trying to what I'm trying to ascertain, what I'm trying to invite you to um, apply your mind to, is the fact that the inspector can be confident that the statement of common ground, statements of common ground, reflect all that is agreed between the local planning authority and the appellant, having regard to that which is was considered by members and not disputed. How about that? Do you agree with that? On the on the basis that um, planning, for example, planning policies referred to in a committee report, which are taken as uh, complied with, but not referred to in evidence because it, there's an agreement between us that they are complied with. Well, well, yes, I, yes, yes, that's, that, that is correct, and I don't take any, um, any point on that, but it goes a little bit further than that, doesn't it? Because the statement of common ground has been prepared, especially the main statement of common ground, to reflect the fact that a very substantial amount of uh, the material considerations, the relevant uh, evidence in this case, has, is agreed between uh, the local planning authority and uh, the appellant because it wasn't disputed by members when they made their decision uh, to refuse planning permission. That's right, isn't it? I'm not sure that I can agree to that because that that um, suggests that members have fully considered all of the policies in the round which ultimately I don't believe they had done in reaching their decision. All right. Well, well, well we can't. I can't second guess the um, members, nor nor can you. And of course, when when I'm advising, I have been advising my client, or the local planning authority. Uh, my advice, um, as you would expect, has been to strictly pr pr produce evidence to 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 justify uh, uh, the reasons for a feudal. And and yeah. that's why. Uh, and you appreciated that, didn't you? That's why. Yeah. Every witness, including Mr. Uh, Mr. Callan, has said that, that the, the, the evidence produced by every professional witness in this case mm. has been restricted to justifying the reasons for refusal because we can't read members' minds and members had the opportunity uh, to refuse the scheme on the basis, on other bases, and they did not do that. Agreed? We can't read their mind. Well, clearly we can't read their minds no. that's right so the purpose of the statements of common ground is for the local planning authority to agree the ambit of matters that are actually in issue in this case hmm. including all of the material planning considerations to which the inspector must have regard when determining this appeal that are not an issue between the uh, local planning authority uh, and the appellant agreed. Yeah, right. That's very helpful. I'm very grateful to you for, for, for that clarity. Because then, when we go to when we come on to look at the extent to which um, precedent decisions are relevant, and I am here referring to um, not only um, what members have agreed in the past by way of granting planning permission. But also the common ground that was reached in the, in between officers and um, and the applicant at the time, in terms of the March, have I got that right? March twenty twenty two decision. You understand that, don't you? Mm. Yes. All right. Uh, and that's important in respect of your evidence because, uh, to be fair to you. And I, it's only right that I give you the opportunity to acknowledge that 
members were at liberty to disagree with past their own past decisions, forward determinations of the local planning authority, their predecessors, but also anything in the uh, anything in the uh, in the officer's analysis within the uh, committee report that we see at CD two point two. That's right, isn't it? Uh, of course, it's uh, absolutely at their liberty to whether whether they breach the right decision or not. It's a different matter. <laughs> well, of course, there is no right and wrong in planning, is there? Because it's all a matter of judgment, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's precisely why I'm asking these these questions, um, uh, uh, Mr. Marx, because I'm concerned that when you use absolute terms like right or wrong. Those aren't appropriate in, in a case such as this because those, those kind of that kind of decision making, just as Mister uh, uh, White put to Mister Hodgson yesterday, is not what is not is not the approach for planning, is it? No, that's, fair. Now, that's fair. Multiple correct. No, right is the wrong term to use. I I'm not, I'm not criticising you. I'm seeking to agree <laughs> a way forward so that to say that I I I I can make submissions fairly based upon the case that I've put um, yeah. to the appellant's witnesses. All right. Now, thinking about your involvement and your lead role in, on behalf of the appellant, um, it's right, isn't it, then, that you've at all times been responsible for the, uh, the, the, the application and the statements of case and the manner in which uh, negotiations have been led and agreed upon with the local planning authority. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, absolutely, as part of a wider team, yes. Yes, and uh, you very uh, very sensibly acknowledge that if you had uh, given your client that poor advice, uh, you, you would have to carry the cat. That's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not, uh, you're not, um, as I understand your your evidence, you don't consider yourself at risk of carrying any cans because, um, because there are at large main issues upon which all parties agree the inspector must come to her own conclusions. Agreed? Mm -hmm. All right. Thinking about that, uh, and in terms of um, uh, the evolution of the applicant come appellant's case uh, and approach to the redevelopment of this site, I'd like to just go back. Um, I'd like to just agree certain points with you that that it is absolutely right, isn't it, that applicants are entitled to rely to some extent upon agreements in pre-application discussions and indications from officers through the evolution and the negotiation of uh, a, of a scheme of development especially a scheme of redevelopment in, in a location such as this would you agree with that yes but the caveat to that is, is extremely important because nobody ever knows what the outcome of a planning application uh, is going to be unless and until uh, members or, or, or an authorised decision maker has reached a formal determination. We're agreed on that, aren't we? Yes. And that's true, isn't it, even where planning permission um, uh, has been granted, for example, subject to the conclusion of, a, uh, uh, of, an, of an appropriate uh, planning obligation. Agreed with, do you agree with that? Sorry, sorry, Mr. Beard. And that's that. true. That, that, that is true. Uh, in the context of circumstances where planning permission is granted, subject to the uh, conclusion of a of a planning obligation, yes. uh, what, I, what I'm trying to focus your mind upon is, is that until the determination, i.e., the, the decision letter or the decision notice has been issued, we simply don't know whether or not whether or not uh, members will be satisfied with, or the authorised decision maker will be satisfied with. Uh, any proposal that's right isn't it indeed yes right all right so so when we are uh, looking back at the planning history we have to keep in mind that every time the committee the decision making committee came to consider uh, uh, the uh, the application before them or the revised application before them in march 2022 it was incumbent upon that committee to have regard to all material considerations under section 70 subsection 2 of the 1990 planning act um when considering the application that's right isn't it 
Yes, that's what they should do. Yes. And that's entirely true um, as of now as well, in terms mm -hmm. of the inspector's decision. And we know that's true because all parties in this case, in this appeal, I beg your pardon, have um, had to adapt their evidence to a certain extent, given the longevity of, of the appeal process. Yes. We all thought this would be done and dusted um, a year ago. <laughs> by the end of the inquiry back in February of last year. That's yeah. Right. And that's very important, isn't it? <clears throat> because the inspector has allowed the appellant um, to enlarge. I'm going to put it in that way. And when I use the word enlarge, it is in no way critical. Enlarge their evidence to address the evidential case that was uh, submitted by the local planning authority and the rule six party in uh december and january because we were late that's right isn't it uh, enlarge no, i don't agree with enlarge no <laughs> all right all right well um, well the, the, the need for the august 2023 um consolidated proof submitted by the appellant and, and this marks might i make absolutely clear here i'm not going to take a point as to whether or not anybody was entitled to lead, lead evidence the inspector has decided that point and we've progressed to this final stage of the examination of the evidence on the basis of the evidence that's before the inspector so let me just make clear that you understand what i mean by enlarge enlarge means in this context that the appellant has been given every opportunity to submit additional evidence after its original evidence to address the evidence submitted by the local planning authority in, in uh, January of um, uh, last year, a year ago, but also in light of changes in circumstances uh, that are material to the inspectors, uh, not material, in other words, that the inspector must have regard to when determining the appeal. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, as have the, uh, the the council and the Rule 6 party. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, would it be fair to say, though, uh, would it be fair to say that um, the appellant has enlarged its evidence in that respect? So, in other words, been given the opportunity to uh, introduce new evidence in, in circumstances uh, uh, that the appellant hadn't considered certain topics. And I'm in particular speaking to the uh, reason for refusal one relating to the cultural facility issue. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't know that I can, Mr. Beard. It's a very general question. I don't know whether you could be more specific, perhaps. All, all I'm asking you to, 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 to acknowledge is that the appellant did not, for example, in evidence, address the evidence or the topics in evidence that Ms. Masawi, for example, uh, spoke to, which necessitated uh, the the um, submission of additional evidence, which the inspector ha has has considered uh, to be rebuttal evidence, essentially. That's right, isn't it? Uh, I'm unsure. It's the bit. Okay. Uh, let, let, let's not do that now. I can come to I can come to that in, in okay. more detail. More detail. But what you would agree um, mm. is this: I'm sure that the appellant has been given every opportunity in this uh, appeal process uh, uh, to lead the evidence that it considers to be necessary so as to address all of the all of the material considerations that the inspector must have regard which the inspector must have regard as i said before mr beard as have the, the council and the all six we've all been given equal opportunity yes all right well i i've I, I understand that to be a yes, um, with the qualification you've given. The reason I ask that, that, that question in that way, um, Mr. Marx, is not to criticise anybody about what they have and haven't done in the past. What I'm, uh, the reason for asking that question is to ensure that, the, that, that you accept that the, that the, that the, that the uh, inspector must have regard to matters all, all uh, material planning considerations as they exist now, not back in January, not back in August, not back in October or December, but as they exist now. Agreed? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's extremely important, is it not, when we come to examine the extent to which members were entitled to take a different view to officers in March of 2022. Do you agree? Um, yes. All right. Uh, and what uh, that, uh, in light of that fair, fair, fair uh, very fair um, uh, answer, mm -hmm. is that when material planning considerations change, mm -hmm. it is necessary for an applicant or an appellant uh, to have regard to those changed circumstances uh, in, in terms of the the application that has or, or the appeal that has already been that, that, has, that has been pursued. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now, and that is what um, has happened in this case um, on two occasions that the application stated or when i say no, let me let me start that again that is what has happened in this project in, in terms of redeveloping um uh, this uh, this appeal sort of on two occasions at the application stage and what i mean by that following two uh, judicial uh, reviews um, that cost uh, the decision of the local planning authority that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Right. Um, after the first, um, after the first decision quashing um, the the the, the uh, judicial decision uh, quashing the first iteration. Uh, let me stop. Getting tongue tied. Mm -hmm. After the first um, um, decision by uh, the High Court quashing the first planning permission on this site. Mm. Um, the appellant decided to submit a new application, correct? That's correct, yes. All right. And you were responsible for leading the professional team um, mm -hmm. in making that decision, yes? Yes, correct. That is not what happened in the in the aftermath of the um, decision by Mr. Justice Dove uh, to quash the planning permission uh, 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 that was uh, wanting for different reasons, found wanting for different re reasons. Agreed. Correct. Yes. Right. Now that was that was a decision that was the appellants to the appellants to make, and then applicant to make, mm. and the, the decision it seems to me was taken on the basis that on on professional advice, the appellant believed. The planning permission should be granted because there were no or very insubstantial criticisms uh, by the judge, by the court, by the uh, by the ruling party in its reason, in its grounds of, of challenge that should prevent the local planning authority coming to a different conclusion. In other words, granting planning permission. That's right, isn't it? Uh, sorry, Mr. B. Could you? Yes, Pose that question again. Yes, of course. Let me make it a little more simple. The decision was taken by the applicant, now appellant, on yes. professional advice led uh, from a team led by you, that it was not necessary to submit a new application for planning permission following uh, the second uh, uh, High Court decision to quash uh, the second planning permission because there were not substantial reasons for refusing uh, or there were not substantial risks um, of, of an adverse decision to grant planning permission uh, on the planning application do you agree um that so that that decision uh was that was jointly discussed with the local planning authority as well mr beard officers um, thereof officers thereof pardon Officers of the local yeah, 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 if you want me to qualify that, yes, officers of, um, and um, the, the the basis for that, and uh, perhaps this might be one for Mr. White in time, but my, my understanding is that once uh, once a decision is quashed, there is not necessarily a requirement to withdraw that application. Oh, that it effectively becomes live again. Um, and as with any application that uh, is lodged with a, a local planning authority, one can uh, provide additional information, make yes. amendments up to the point of determination. 
and yes. it was agreed with the authority that that was the appropriate um sorry officers of the authority um to to adopt that approach yes very good now mr sure. mr mark I i'm not going to uh, um, in any sense invite you to qualify <laughs> when you speak to the council because we both know and we yeah. both agreed that yeah. there's a difference between the formal application and uh, formal determination uh, and i'm not going to take that point ever again in, in my cross-examination and i don't want you to worry about that because i will never take a point in closing about your answers given in cross-examination under cross-examination on that point so please feel free to use the word council i will not quarrel okay Thinking about the answer that you've just given in, in those circumstances, in the circumstances um, that, in the circumstances that followed, the quashing of the second, uh, uh, the second grant of planning permission, as you quite rightly say, um, the, the nature of a quashing of a decision, uh, a determination to, to 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 grant planning permission, is that it doesn't exist. The determination doesn't exist, and therefore, uh, the uh, the local planning authority is is not fault to the video. In other words, there is work to be done that the, the, the local planning authority must do, and that is determine the application, right? Uh, understanding that we both understand the situation correctly and are agreed upon that, it is nevertheless always, always the sole responsibility and always the sole decision for the sole decision of the applicant uh, uh, to determine whether or not to risk pursuing um, uh, uh, to, to, to secure planning permission on that application or resubmit that's true isn't it yes right and that the same is true uh, for a, 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 an applicant who is aggrieved by a a, a determination to refuse planning permission yes in other words do you go around again and apply again or do you appeal to the um uh, to the secretary of state yes but, but yeah that's the decision that any applicant can make and, yeah. and it, it's necessarily the case that 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 decision making process is is never without risk let's start that never without risk Yes, absolutely agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that. <laughs> so, what I'm really getting to um, uh, here, and I, I hope we can uh, agree with this, um, it, it being just a framework understanding of how we're proceeding uh, in this cross examination, but also how the inspector should uh, think about your evidence and, and the evidence presented to the inquiry generally. Mm. It's always what has happened in this inquiry. What has happened in this appeal and what happened at the application stage was always to a very large extent at the your client's own risk. Agreed? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. It's a fair, well, that's, may I say that is exceptionally fair. And, and I'm grateful to you for that because I know as well as you do that you have been working on this um, project for a very long time and will be personally as a professional concerned about the advice that you have given your client all the way through because you have always sought to advise your client well so the client can manage the risks that are always at his door at their door agreed mm -hmm. yes that's agreed yeah and thinking about that in the context of the application first, please. It was always open to members to come to a different conclusion than their than their the previous uh, uh, planning committee, planning sub subcommittee, and officers, because substantial changes uh, occur in terms of the material planning considerations between the first decision that was quashed and the second decision. Agreed. Mm, uh, no, I'm afraid we don't agree. Why, why do you say that? Because I'm going to. Uh, I, I wouldn't agree with that, Mr. Beard, on two bases. One, um, the, uh, in my opinion, there has not been a substantial change. That there, there has been absolutely a an evolution of policy, um, 
but I suppose the core tenants or policy will come onto those later, no doubt, yep. um, uh, have fundamentally remained the same. Um, so no, I, I, I don't believe that there has been a substantial change. And, well, on, and on that and on that basis, uh, if there had been such a substantive change, um, the officer that dealt with, let's call it the second application and the planning officer that dealt with the third application um, could have reached completely different conclusions, could they not? Um, but they did not. They reached the same conclusion. Yes, the same conclusions, um, Mr. Marks, on substantially different circumstances, not least of which was the viability of evidence and the viability uh, considerations that substantially, substantially uh, uh, reduced the, for example, the um, the affordable housing um, financial contribution. Yes. It yes, it did reduce it, but um, the substantially was my question. Substantially. The, well, but you, you can't, uh, you're, you're looking simply just at one element. You need to consider all aspects of the scheme in the round. Um, and there are also changes to the uh, amount of affordable workspace and the depth of discount and length of discount, um, which had a bearing on uh, fundamentally the amount of affordable housing uh, and changes in market conditions, etc. Um, so yes, there, there clearly was a change. Um, I would not argue it was substantive. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to quarrel with with with, with differences of opinion as to how to articulate uh, what happened. Um, but the, the 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 point is this: in terms of the balance of considerations that members were required to 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 take account of when they, to, to consider as a matter of law. It's not correct to say, is it, that the same, the, 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 the same development scheme, the development proposal, brought to, would would deliver the same outcomes in terms of, uh, in terms of planning in the public interest. It's not the same. Is that's not correct? Is it? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but clearly in this case we have demonstrated that, that that could be the eventuality all right let's just speak let, let's just um, speak to the uh, part of your earlier answer changing market conditions yes mm -hmm. and that's what you um very fairly mentioned um, which is no doubt um linked to uh, uh the the answer you've given earlier that um uh, the progress of this uh, of the application of the appeal has always been at the appellant's own risk. Yes, mm -hmm. market conditions. When we're speaking about market conditions, we are speaking about not just viability, but also, but also the extent to which um, there is a a market, a, a demand for the floor space and the the type of development that is being offered. Yes, agreed. That, that would apply even post grant the planning permission of yes course, of course. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful to you for that because really um the, the extent to which there were physical changes or or or, or uh, rather than um consequential changes if i, if I can put it like that hmm. physical changes to the scheme of development that was designed um roughly speaking, generally speaking, about a decade ago, mm. the degree to which there were physical changes um, uh, to, to, to the, proposed, the proposed development was limited. Agreed? We're talking about, for example, uh, and I don't want to get bogged down in detail here, but the re any redesign or, 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 or alterations uh, to the scheme as shown on the plans rather than uh, what was uh, to be secured by way of uh, planning obligation or conditions mm. on the plans was limited to cycle parking in particular. Agreed? There were there, there were some changes in light of yeah cycle parking, uh, energy and sustainability policies as well, meaning there was additional plants. But yes, the, the physical manifestation of the buildings, if that's what you're referring to, Mr Beard, 
they have fundamentally remained very very similar if not the same um what i suppose i'm concerned at is that you're alleging that that's a that's a negative no, 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 I'm not doing that at all. I'm just um, getting you to agree the framework that I'm going to ask additional questions. And please, okay. that, that, that's very fair of you. To, uh, that's very fair of you to to, uh, to indicate that your concern that I'm uh, I'm asking you to draw negative con uh, connotation to my uh, to what I might say. I'm not doing that. I will do that later. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if, if in fact, if in fact. Um, I am doing it, and you don't spot it. Uh, me doing it, or, or, or something, uh, it doesn't concern you. Mr. White will follow up. If I ask you, let, uh, you know, might, might I just compliment you? And I mean that most sincerely. That you'll be extraordinarily co cooperative. Um, uh, if I ask an unfair question, no doubt, Mr. Uh, Mr. White will intervene. Until he does, let's proceed on the basis that. Um, I'm, I'm attempting to be scrupulously fair as, as you are. Yeah. All right. Keeping keeping uh, on track in terms of where we were and what might have happened and what did happen uh, before the committee, it's right to take into account the fact that the, the balance of considerations between uh, the, 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 the that were required to be uh, considered by the committee on two occasions having uh, in the context of the application of the subject of this appeal it would be fair to say would it not that a an adverse change to the viability of the proposal over time between the two decisions uh, resulted in there being less available Deve development profit so as to fund uh, affordable housing in particular i i would have to defer to mr turner to be honest on 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 the physical numbers but my recollection and this is qualified based on uh as i say i i think this is probably more should have been more of a question for mr turner but uh let's call it the pie the pie actually between the two applications was was not that dissimilar. Um, actually, it was the the change in policy that meant the way the pie was divvied up yep. um, changed, rather than uh, the, the a significant change in market conditions. Yes, there was a change in market conditions, but that didn't substantively have an impact on. Let's take the the, the affordable housing contribution. Yes. Uh, more, more a question of swings and roundabouts uh, yeah. than, 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 than the playground itself. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to take any issue about or, or go into any detail about the viability analysis because we we we, we were agreed. We have been agreed uh, in terms of uh, what members or the context in which members the context in which members uh, took their decision, which was the viability evidence that was agreed. Now, let's be absolutely clear here, absolutely clear, agreed between officers and the applicant. That's right. Um, members didn't agree it. They, 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 that was a material consideration they had to take into account. Yes. Officers on behalf of the council. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All right, uh, and that's going to be important. And there's no secret about this. That's going to be important when we come on to discuss the balance of this year's point. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we will do that. I promise you, we will do that after lunch because I'm not going to do it in detail uh, yet. But the important thing is, it was up to members to decide, adopting a holistic approach as to whether, having regard to their particular concerns about the loss of the cultural facility and in fact uh, the um the living conditions issue which was new uh, members raised that to decide holistically as to whether or not there were proper grounds for refusing uh, the uh, ref refusing planning permission for the scheme as it was presented to them in march of 2022 agreed it was at their liberty to do so yes yeah yeah 
And although you disagree with it, as I understand matters, having regard to the progress of this appeal over time, it's no part of the appellant's case to say that any of the reasons for refusal uh, were uh, uh, amounted to unreasonable conduct on behalf of the local planning authority uh, 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 that, that ought to that ought to um, uh, uh, have consequences in costs at the appeal stage. That's right, isn't it? I wonder if that's perhaps a question for Mr. White to. Okay, no, no, it's a question for you. Let, let, let me put it another way: Your client does not allege that the inspector, uh, that the the, the, the 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 local planning authority's case is in any sense unarguable. Um, I would say perhaps through um through the evidence particularly that we heard yesterday um, from Mr. Callum, that there certainly are now a number of policies referred to in the reasons for refusal um, that are now considered to have been complied with. So on that basis, potentially. Right, let's, let's be absolutely clear, um, Mr. Marks. You know as well as I do that every time Mr. Um, uh, Callum was asked a question about the sub parts of the reasons for refusal. And I'm thinking about in particular reason for refusal um, four, but also the, the, the reason for refusal, I get the numbers wrong. Is it reason for refusal two regarding yeah. living conditions? Yes. I always get mixed up between two and three. Um, living conditions and balance of, balance of uses. Mm -hmm. Do you know as well as I do, that Mr. Callum's evidence was absolutely clear to the extent that he said, yes, if you take things in isolation, which you should not do um, when, to, when, um, on, when coming to a conclusion on, on a planning application or an appeal, if you take things exclusively in isolation, yes, he agreed with the points being put to him. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, that, that is what Mr. Callum said, yes. Yes. All right. So. So when we talk about whether or not there is compliance with policy, um, uh, development plan policy, uh, what you're really saying is that Mr. Callum felt um, uh, quite properly, as, as did um, uh, Ms. Blade in the context of her written evidence and her uh, answers given examination chief, because of the flexibility required in development plan policy, pertaining to, um, uh, uh, pertaining to the uh, uh application and appeal because of the need for flexibility it can be said that taken in isolation certain certain um policies can be argued to be complied with but not necessarily together is that right do you agree with that i i personally struggle with that as an approach mr beard i don't understand how you can comply with a policy, comply with a policy, comply with a policy, put them together, and then suddenly you don't. Right. I understand that you've got um, the, you've got difficulty with it, um, but, but nevertheless, it is going to be a matter for the inspector to have regard uh, to the decision of the local planning authority, which uh, reflected in the reasons for refusal, that in turn are reflected in the main issues before uh upon which the parties are, are, are giving evidence agreed yes that is agreed yes. and the purpose of, of, of the proofs of evidence and let's be absolutely clear about this in terms of any potential criticism that may be made about what any witness has or hasn't said at any stage in their written evidence the purpose of the proofs of evidence is to address the matters that remain in issue between the local planning authority and uh the um, appellant as identified in the statement of common statements of common ground, agreed. Mm -hmm. yes. And that is why I am not going to criticise you, for example, for not addressing policy SD at one of the London plan. I mean, you didn't need to do it because it wasn't an issue, and it's addressed in the statement of common ground. Agreed. Uh, yes, there's also reference in my proof of evidence to. Uh, the planning committee report and all of those policies that are listed within. So yes, I don't think in my evidence it was necessary per se for 
all of those policies to be listed. Yeah. All right, and that, that's very, very, very helpful. And it takes us to um, the proper approach uh, to uh, the determination of this appeal having regard to everything that's been agreed. And I wonder if we can just deal with maybe with the last in the remaining 15 minutes um, that take us up to at or about uh, one o'clock. Um, if we can just agree to the proper approach that the inspector must adopt uh, when determining uh, this appeal. First and foremost, the inspector must have regard to all material planning considerations um, um, because section 70, subsection 2, is a legal duty that must be complied with. Agreed? Yeah. One of those uh, material considerations, um, and the most important of those material considerations, is the development plan so far as it's material to the application uh, or appeal. Yes? Yes. Right. And that means, does it not, that the inspector must have regard to all um, material policies uh, that are identified between uh, the local planning authority and the uh, appellant in the statement of common ground. Main mm -hmm. statement of common ground, agreed? Yeah. In so far as all parties, as, uh, I'll speak when I say all parties, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, I don't tread on the um, on the case of the, 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 the Rule 6 party at all by doing this. In case of all parties agree, that the policies that are material to the determination of this appeal, when I say policy, the de development plan policies that are material to the determination of these, these appeal are up to date and should be given full weight as, as development plan policies. Agreed? Yes, we're not arguing to the contrary, yes. Nobody is arguing to the contrary, as I, as I understand. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important, is, is it not, for us to focus upon in, in the evidence those policies that apply uh, to the main issues, no development plan policies that apply to the main issues uh, uh, that are identified by the inspector, having regard only to the matters that remain not in agreement uh, between the local planning authority and the appellant. Agreed? No. <laughs> Tell me why. And, and the reason for that, Mr. Beard, I would say is um, when when one is alleging harm or impact. Um, in my opinion, you need to clearly uh, and, and robustly assess uh, the benefits as well. Oh yes, yes. Um, and and the starting point in in my proof um, is that uh, the the appeal proposals are compliant with the development plan when read as a whole. So I don't think it was necessary for me to. Um, expressly list all of the policies that the scheme is uh compliant with and, and attach weight to those i agree uh, i've listed I agree. that's not my point and no, identified no. the harm um I, I, as, as you've heard from uh mr white's examination of, of mr callum and indeed mr hodgson um there there is a i suppose a question as to whether the 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 benefits have been afforded do wait. Yes, and that, of course, is is a matter ultimately for the inspectors. Yes, right. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 yeah. and it's not going to be any part of my cross examination. Okay. To, to go to the detail of whether or not you're right, I'm wrong, somebody yes. else. Is right. It's just okay. not really just the inspector. So, no. um, but, but but the important thing uh, to, to to for us to focus upon is it not is that the other part of the, the most important part of the proper approach is the statutory duty uh, to determine the appeal in accordance with the development plan taken as a whole so far as material to the uh, to the appeal um, um unless material considerations indicate otherwise correct yes now i'm not in any way inviting you um to think about this in in, in a mechanistic way because the inspector must make the decision in a holistic sense agreed yeah. yeah. So, in other words, um, the inspector must come to a conclusion globally as to whether or not the proposals do or do not accord with the development plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
there are there are disputes of, of professional that might be described as prof, disputes of professional opinion about that issue and the inspector must resolve that issue for herself great indeed indeed yes and when we come to the um uh, when we come to uh, when we come when, when the event comes to that the important point is that if if the inspector resolves uh, that um, that part of the decision making in favor of the appellant there is actually no need i'm not suggesting that she should ignore anything there's actually no need to rely upon planning benefits uh, or, or, or uh, alleged or, or other material considerations that are not relevant that are not relevant to whether or not the proposal uh, accords with the development plan do you agree if the scheme is considered compliant with the development plan when read as a whole yes yeah absolutely absolutely which is why you quite rightly maintain uh, that the that the proper approach to the application of the of the uh, presumption in favor of uh, sustainable development is paragraph 11 uh, c which is to grant planning permission, up-to-date local plan, in accordance with the local plan, grant planning permission without delay. Yes? Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. But if you are wrong about that, mm. no, that's that's not fair. If the inspector disagrees <laughs> with you... there was no right and wrong, Mr. Quite Beaver. so, quite so. <laughs> I caught myself, I caught myself out. Um, thank you for that. Um, if the inspector disagrees um, with the appellant's um, contention that mm. the proposal um, uh, accords with the development plan taken as a whole, then paragraph 11c does not apply, does it? Uh, well, unless material considerations. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. It doesn't apply because the presumption is that the development is not sustainable for the purposes of what the presumption of sustainable development means in paragraph 11. Agreed? Run that past me again, Mr. Beard. Sure, that's, that's, that's fair enough. If the inspector comes to the conclusion that the proposal is not in accordance with the development plan taken as a whole, the inspector comes to the conclusion, therefore, that there is no presumption uh, to grant planning permission because, uh, with, without delay, because the development is not sustainable development. Agreed? No, no, I don't believe I do agree with that. It doesn't necessarily mean the development is not sustainable development. Well, it, it does mean it's not it's not sustainable development for the purposes of the presumption in paragraph 11. Do you agree? The presumption in paragraph 11. Um, Bear with me one second, Mr. Take your time, please, please, please. It's very, very important. Indeed. Uh, let me just refresh myself. Actually, will you bear with me one second, Mr. Please take your time. I'll get a copy of the MPPF up. <laughs> please take your time. Please take your time. Uh, apologies right, let's walk through this together um so 11c the decision making proving development process that are called not delayed should we make it in stages yeah um, all right so the only alternatives under national planning policy have, uh, that, that relates solely to whether or not there is a presumption in favour of sustainable development are either some paragraph C or some paragraph D. Mm -hmm. We have both agreed, both parties agreed, all main parties agree, that paragraph D does not apply in this case. Correct, yes. Right. So the only the only paragraph that some paragraph that can can apply is paragraph C because yeah. it is agreed 
Yes, we've agreed that. Yes. The, 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 the policies, um, the policies that the, to, to which the inspector must have regard in mm -hmm. you know, the development plan are up to date. Yes. Yeah. yeah, correct. And the planning permission should be granted without delay if the proposals accord with uh, the development plan taken as a whole. Right? Mm -hmm. If the inspector comes to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan in this case, which I'm going to put to you, is a threshold issue that she should come to before turning to what should she should do um, thereafter. If it's the threshold issue of determining whether or not the proposal accords with the development plan taken as a whole, mm. if she doesn't agree, that it, if she comes to the conclusion that it doesn't, accord with the development plan, the presumption in favour of a grant of planning permission does not apply under paragraph 11. Presumption wouldn't, but then there are obviously uh, the 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 benefits that can be weighed in the balance, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that, that quite rightly, that's because, the, that's because as the uh, courts, the Supreme Court has made clear on a number of occasions, as is the Court of Appeal, that national planning policy is but one of the material considerations to which every decision maker uh, determining a planning application or appeal must have regard. Mm -hmm. It does not. Uh, it does not, in any sense, uh, subvert or, or supplant uh, the uh, the primacy of the development plan. Agreed. Sorry, Mr. Beard. It doesn't, in any sense, subvert, uh, supplant, replace. Or, or even, um, or even, or, or in any way, displace the primacy of the development plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's what uh, the importance about making sure that uh, your case is properly under your client's case is properly understood, because the presumption in favour of sustainable development will not apply if the inspector concludes that the proposal does not take it to, to, to not accord with the development plan taken as a whole mm -hmm. do you agree yes yeah it's very very fair and to, to be to to to, to take that uh, further if in that case then the inspector uh, did not uh, agree uh, with your client's contention that the proposal accords with development plan we are then in the territory of having to have regard to other material considerations that yeah, indicate yeah. indicate and uh, may indicate mm -hmm. that, that, that planning permission should nevertheless be, be, be granted on on appeal correct right? yes okay and the importance of that uh, in the context of this appeal is because we are not dealing here with the secretary of state um being entitled to ignore development plans what we are dealing here with, ensuring that development plans are up to date for the purposes of decision making uh, uh, in all circumstances. Agreed? Mm -hmm. And because we are agreed uh, on that point that it is, then the inspector will only have to consider the planning benefits in the sense, uh, in, this, in that sense, that they are relied upon by the appellant as indicating that planning permission should nevertheless be granted if the inspector comes to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan taken as a whole. Mm -hmm. Agreed? Yes. Yeah. All right. And I think that's probably a very good time because I think that ends um, uh, the, the, the part of my development, part of my cross examination uh, that, that I indicated was. Um, not going to require to go, go into specifics. I'm, I'm in your hands. I, I'm happy to con continue, but now would be a suitable time for me. And I can't hear you. Sorry, you're on mute. No, I was on mute. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Let's um, break for lunch. If we come back at two o'clock and uh, we'll um, continue uh, Mr. Beard's cross examination of Mr. Marks. Okay. Thank you Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's now two o'clock and the inquiry is resumed. Um, the, the, the matter that Mr. White, just a few housekeeping things, the matter that Mr. White raised with regard to condition 41, I've actually got some things I wanted to raise with parties on conditions as well. We'll deal with that at the end of today's session. Um, also, um, I'll, I'll take estimates for timings at the same time. Also, somebody from the council, I want to make sure that the link for Friday is working. I'd like to do a test um, on that. And if um, somebody is available, if convenient with you, I'd like to do that straight after um, today's session. So if that could be arranged, please, that would be very helpful. It, It'll only take two minutes. I, I, I see uh, Mrs. Stevenson, my instructing solicitor, is on the line. No doubt she will um, um, uh, lead on that and make sure that we have um, uh, the, the, the necessary technical people arranging that for you. Um, through the course okay. of the afternoon. Thank you. I mean, if it should, you know, if uh, proceeding should be such that we have to, to rearrange that, that that's, that's fine. But I'll get to it. it seems as if. We, we should be able to do that. Okay, then. Could I please um, invite uh, Mr. Beard to continue his cross examination, please? Thank you, Madam. Um, uh, before I uh, before I do, I just like to indicate that I'm hoping to contain this part of my cross examination to about forty five minutes to an hour, um, um, given that which has already been addressed and agreed um, to date. I, I'm not going to ask this witness to. Um, give answers um, on questions that have been dealt with by other witnesses in the past. So I'll be putting my case in that way. Hello again, Mr. Um, Mr. Marks. You understand what I mean by that? Um, a lot of evidence has been heard in this inquiry. Um, and I just want to clarify um, the, the, the basis upon which you're giving evidence. You, you cover this in your proof of evidence. Hold on a minute. I think I'm a bit skewed because my camera's up there. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I thought I, I thought I was listing uh, listing to port. Um, your evidence, as you say in your proof, and as one would expect in your in the, in, the, in all circumstances of a planning witness, where there are multiple issues um, uh, upon which um, uh, expert evidence is given, your evidence works like this, both in writing and today, that you give the planning evidence on behalf of uh, the appellant having regard to the expert evidence that is both um, uh, produced in writing and produced orally at the inquiry. And you don't seek to go behind that or uh, behind that expert evidence that is beyond your expertise uh, for the purposes of giving evidence today. That's fair, isn't it? That's fair, yes. Yeah, all right. Um, uh, and the reason why I put it that way is because we could, co we, we, we could, um, uh, conduct um, the examination of your evidence by referring to what people said and didn't say and change their position. I'm not going to do that. My purpose is to put the local planning authority's case, uh, evidential case, um, and to you being the, the, the final um, uh, appellant witness, insofar as it hasn't been put to date. You understand that? Yep. So I won't be asking you questions. And I've already asked Mr. Stevenson, for example, I'll be asking you about the policy side of things in so far as that the, there are issues be between us. Mm -hmm. So when I'm asking questions, the first questions that I'll be asking in all circumstances when I change topics will be to identify the extent to which there are outstanding planning related issues between the parties. So that's what I'm always going to hope to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. So uh, having agreed upon that, uh, you don't quarrel at all. You don't disagree. You don't seek uh, to to avoid any of the oral evidence given by um, the appellant's witnesses to date. That's right, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. All right. When we're thinking about the, the relevance of that for the purposes of this, um, uh, this appeal and the determination of the appeal, it appears to me that there is no dispute between uh, the appellant and the local planning authority as to the materiality of any consideration that's before the inspector addressed in evidence. Do you agree? We, we don't disagree as to, for example, we don't disagree as to whether or not the inspector should be 
having regard to anything. Uh, we're, we're, there is complete agreement as to what the inspector should be and must look at, must consider when determining the appeal. And that is covered in both the statements of common ground and the proofs of evidence, yes? But thus far, yes. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That's very fair. Um, and it's right to say with all material considerations, um, keeping in mind that we've already agreed that the plan is up to date and relevant policies of the plan should be given full weight because they are uh, that they are out of date and consistent with national policy. That uh, leaving that aside, questions of weight are, are always uh, for the, uh, the the decision maker, be that the the committee in this case or or the inspector in this appeal. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. So, for example, in the context of this particular development or redevelopment of this particular parcel of land, it's going to be relevant for the, the inspector to have regard to the fact of the weight that was attached by previous decision maker, the, 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 the council, the weight that was attached um, uh, to, to various material considerations by officers recommending um, um, a grant of permission, and the weight that's been attached to expert witnesses uh, when they were preparing their uh, to, weight to attach to material considerations when they were preparing their evidence. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And that's not that's not in any way a trap. I just want to make sure that, that you understand um, that that I will be making submissions based upon the weight to be attached to the evidence that has been given at this inquiry uh, uh, only, and that's given at this inquiry. And um, and that is relevant in so far as it appears in the core documents, in the inquiry documents, um, before the inspector. Yes. Okay. All right. When we're thinking about that in, in the context of um, po planning policies requiring flexibility, uh, and that's true at national policy. But, but, but that's true at um, the national level, um, the uh, strategic level, and at the local level. Flexibility is required because planning decisions always involve a multiplicity of considerations. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's nothing magic about a policy saying that flexibility should be, um, uh, sh 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 should, uh, the policy should be applied flexibly. But in the context of this appeal, flexibility is mentioned in a number of, um, uh, of local plan policies because of the competing priorities that exist in a heavily heavily developed uh, environment such as the London Borough of Hackney. Agreed? Yes, one caveat to that okay. is, is you've said <clears throat> there's nothing magic about uh, uh, policies uh, being flexible. There are obviously circumstances where policies are absolute in terms of uh, you know one must Oh, yes. for yeah. example or yeah so so uh flexibility is not necessarily always inferred in the policy Agreed. itself Agreed. Yeah. you know no, no, that's 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 a very fair that's a very fair caveat and that that's very helpful in terms of um national policy because in another case if um paragraph some paragraph d uh, of uh, paragraph 11 of the presumption in favor of sustainable development did apply the tilt of balance is applied in a different way, or not at all, having regard to uh, uh, the, the, the policies in the uh, framework that are ident identified as being um, uh, as being necessary or potentially overriding any out of dateness of local policy. And what I have in mind in particular in this case is heritage policies, yes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's a fair that's, that's a fair yeah. analysis, you know. Yeah. So when yeah. we're thinking about the degree of flexibility that a decision maker has, that's always going to be constrained by legal duties and the extent to which policy imperatives uh, should be applied. Agreed? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's very, very fair indeed. So in this case, um the inspector and uh, Mr. White very helpfully um, dealt with uh, Mr. Um, Callum's proof uh, cross examination in, in this way that apart from the section 38.6 test that, that's I'm going to say overriding um, when we come to when when we come to 
a policy test we, uh, in the context of the heritage um, uh, uh, issue, in this case, the inspector had the subparagraph D of 11, uh, paragraph 11 applied, would have to deal with the balance um, required by national policy to be struck um, in regards to the designated heritage asset and in regards to the non designated heritage asset in this case. Agreed? Uh, y yes, agreed. Although I think it's been made clear that we're not running a, an 11D. No, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But, 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 but when we come, in terms of the flexibility of the for the decision maker, mm. uh, for example, had that been the case, before the inspector could come to the conclusion uh, that planning permission should be granted because the benefits are not clearly, clearly outweighed or, or clearly and possibly outweighed by um, um, uh, um, harm, my point is this, my point is this, the inspector has to necessarily apply the policy or legal uh, tests, uh, policy and partly legal test to heritage before she can come to a conclusion on whether the proposal um, accords with the development plan and whether or not the proposal, uh, or, uh, uh, and if not, uh, whether or not, um, whether or not the, uh, the the balances to be struck under heritage under heritage policy in the framework um i've, I've lost track of the numbers of, 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 the, of the paragraph numbers as regards to weighing benefits public benefits uh, against um the the less than substantial harm or weighing public benefits against the harm uh, to, to to a non-designated heritage asset do you, you agree don't you I it's a long question, I believe. It was a very long question. <laughs> well, um, what I'm driving at here. There was, one, there was one part, Mr. Bid, just before perhaps he rephrased the question. I think he suggested that the inspector would need to consider the heritage impacts first. I don't necessarily agree. Well, when she's dealing with that main issue. With that issue, absolutely. But obviously, as we know, that there are a basket of issues to be considered. Um, and uh, all of those are to be considered in turn. Yes. And then the balancing exercise is done. Agreed. Well, yeah. and that's right. And my point is this, that when we're dealing with flexibility or the degree to which there is flexibility, the inspector is guided by national policy and um, because it guides the development plan, uh, it divides, uh, it guides um, all decision making and plan, plan making. Mm -hmm. And in the context of the heritage, a heritage issue, if, for example, not this case now, but if, for example, it was, uh, it, 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 this was a case where the tilt of balance did apply subject to um, the requirements of national policy in paragraph, subparagraph D, the inspector could refuse planning permission, for example, if she came to the conclusion that heritage, uh, that the heritage, um, uh, the, 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 the public benefits did not weigh outweigh did not outweigh the less than substantial harm uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, designated heritage asset and no other material considerations indicated that planning permission should be granted that's right isn't it um yes yes in part um i, I think there's perhaps slight conflation of the issues as my understanding of, of the exercise that one one goes through mr beard would be compliance with development plan policies in the first instance yep. uh, then it's the planning balance then it's the tilted balance so i think there's an exercise that's gone through before getting to the tilted balance yes no i fully accept that and i i don't think it's helpful for us to to go into the minutiae of that because different things would happen according to different conditions. Right. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I fully accept that. But in the context of the present case, mm. um, the inspector is not constrained by, is not constrained by the presumption uh, in favour of sustainable development if she comes to the conclusion that um, the proposals do not accord with the development plan. Agreed? Um unless material consideration no, that, that's that, that's the next stage yes yeah. yeah yeah all right um, there, there's nothing in paragraph 11 that speaks to the situation with the when 
an up-to-date development plan is in place and that uh, the, the inspector comes to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan taken as a whole. Agreed? Not in 11C. Uh, obviously, you then go to paragraph. Not in 11D? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. yeah. Right. Okay. That, that being the case, it's right in this particular case, isn't it, that when it comes to weighing the balance between um, the extent to which a proposal is, ex uh, well, the extent to which the development plan, um, uh, sorry, a proposal according to the development plan, it is important to differentiate between uh, the second and a third reason for refusal, the heritage reason for refusal, because if the inspector comes to the conclusion um, that the uh, that the proposal doesn't accord with the development plan, it will in relation to that issue. It will be because it will be because she has come to the conclusion that the public benefits relied upon by the appellant do not outweigh uh, the the harm uh, uh, the less than substantial harm uh, to the heritage asset. Agreed. Um, I don't know that I do fully agree, no, Mr. Beard. I, I would say, uh, first and foremost, one considers uh, under 11C, you have to consider the development plan as a whole, I agree. not not just heritage issues per se, in isolation. So, as part of that exercise, the inspector could find that even with heritage harm, um, the, the scheme is compliant with the development plan when read as a whole. Yes, all right. Um, it, it it may well be that the inspector doesn't conclude that and then you do the the, the balancing exercises yes. we discussed yeah for the purposes of my questions let's 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 refer to what you have just mentioned as being the overall planning balance and you and i both know we've been doing this for, for long enough to know how the structure of um appeal decisions um uh, is is always reflected in decision making it being it, 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 it being the proper approach um, uh, to reporting and or uh, um, determining appeals. Mm. Let's leave overall planning balance to the very end. None mm. of my questions uh, for the moment mm -hmm. um, in any way suggest that the inspector should not carry out an overall planning balance at the end of her decision, mm -hmm. as you have in your proof of evidence, as, as um, Ms. Slade does in hers. But the point I'm driving at here is that the public benefits that you rely upon in respect, your client relies upon in respect of the overall planning balance are the same public benefits or the same planning benefits, doesn't matter what you call them, the same benefits that your client invites the inspector to have regard to when deciding whether or not, I mean, regard to national policy, the less than substantial harm is outweighed by the benefits relied upon. Agreed? They're the same benefits. Um, not in, no, not in whole, no. Uh, right, well, where have I gone wrong, please? Uh, so, um, uh, in, in respect of Dr. Mealy's evidence, I know you suggested don't, uh, we're, we're not going to agree with others. You're, you're at liberty to say whatever you want. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's quite clear that there are um, heritage benefits in isolation that he has um, weighed against uh the the identified or perceived harm not if all of the planning benefits no i i, I fully accept that but those yeah. the, 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 those are a sub part of the planning benefits upon which your your client relies uh for the overall planning balance aren't they in in part yeah yeah, yeah, in yeah, part, yeah. But that's, that's the point so in other words well, 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 well there it is that's the point. If the inspector comes to the conclusion that the public benefits, i.e. the heritage-related public benefits, uh, do not outweigh the harm, do not outweigh the, the harm as the inspector might find, less than the partial harm that the inspector uh, may conclude uh, will result if she grants planning permission, yeah. then frankly, then frankly, that is, uh, that indicates, does it not, that it is unlikely, all things considered, 
that the proposal could accord with the development plan as a whole? No, I don't agree with that. Right. Why not? Uh, as I said, um, there are there are other planning benefits beyond the heritage benefits that that Dr. Mealy identified. Agree. Really? That um, in my proof, I have then suggested are able to outweigh the less than substantial harm if that's the conclusion that's reached. Okay, um, let's be absolutely clear about what we're talking about um, in, in the course of, of, of this part of my questions. The inspector, to come to the conclusion that this proposal does or does not accord with the development plan, the inspector must consider the four main issue, five main issues reflected in the four reasons for refusal um, uh, that the parties are agreed are relevant for her consideration that she must decide. In other words, mm -hmm. she must come to a conclusion on each of those issues and then carry out the overall planning balance. Mm -hmm. If the inspector comes to the conclusion in the, in the context of this case, that the proposal would amount to less than substantial harm, would cause less than substantial harm that was not outweighed by the heritage benefits, then she will come to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan, subject first, subject to her further conclusions on the other main issues. Agreed? You mean to the other material considerations? No, the other main issues as uh, as to whether or not, having regard to those main issues, yeah. the proposal accords with the development plan, right? Y yes, I believe so. I it think. would be most unlikely in all the circumstances, wouldn't it? And I'm not sure that I have ever seen a an appeal decision where an inspector comes to the conclusion that a proposal um, involving the demolition of uh, the demolition of, of, of buildings uh, that together make a positive contribution to the character and appearance of a conservation area a designated heritage asset constitutes less than substantial harm that is not outweighed by public uh, pub public um, heritage benefits having regard to the duty uh, under the um, under the list of building acts under section 72 and then come to the conclusion that the proposal does not uh, accord with the development plan at all I've, I've never seen a I've never seen a case uh, with an outcome like that. Have you? Sorry, Mr. Beard. A long question again. Do you, yeah. would you mind re rephrasing? Yeah. If an inspector comes to the conclusion yeah. that in well that in a in the context of, of this case, as officers recommend uh, came to the conclusion when recommending um, uh, that planning permission be granted, mm. that the proposal does not accord with the development plan because of a breach to the heritage policies that are up to date mm. and then come to the conclusion that nevertheless the proposal does accord with the development plan is just it's just fanciful isn't it uh don't know that that's necessarily the case Mr. Oh, do you say do you say that this inspector can come to the conclusion on the main issue relating to heritage that the, the, the proposal does not accord with the development plan in relation to the development policies on heritage but nevertheless comes to the may come may lawfully come to the conclusion uh, that the that the that the development is nevertheless nevertheless accords with the development plan is, is that your case it's not my case but potentially when read as a when read as a whole because of the uh the provisions of the mppf and the act theoretically i suppose that 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 could occur all right let's not bother with theory in the context of this case and i've read your evidence and and i know you're a fair witness and i know that we um we are agreed that this <laughs> that we must get this done in the context of this case, it is no part of your evidence, no part of your client's case to say that if the inspector comes to the conclusion, contrary to Mr. Mealy, Dr. Mealy's um, uh, um, uh, contentions, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the proposals would result in less than substantial harm that is not outweighed by heritage benefits, mm -hmm 
that nevertheless the proposal accords with the development plan. No part of your case, agreed? No, yeah, the case that we've put across is that then right. the, the, the benefits, public benefits outweigh that. Yes. Why the public benefits come? Yes, from. correct. Correct. All right. So that is the very most important issue. The inspector can record for the purposes of, of, of your evidence that you accept that if she comes to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan on the heritage issue, then it does not accord with the development plan. It's diff that that Mr. Beard is difficult for me to answer no, because, because it's, it's, it's the because it's not, Well, no, because it's it's not my case. <laughs> I know it's not your case. That's the point. It's no part of the appellant's well, case. He says we're not dealing in in theory, Mr. Beard. That, no, that it's is, not theory. It's not theory. It is it's the determination of this appeal. The inspector. Well, as, as I said before, Mr. Beard, it's possible. I think potentially for the inspector to reach a conclusion that if there is less than substantial harm identified when you read the policies of the development plan taken as a whole she potentially could come to the conclusion that the the proposals are in accordance with the development plan yes but, but my question was not that my question was predicated on the different presence prayer was very specifically put yeah my question was put on the basis that the inspector finds against dr mealy and finds against dr mealy alone in other words that he yeah he is the only witness in yeah. this case yeah that contends yeah that there is no less than substantial harm and contends that insofar as there may be less than substantial harm it is outweighed by heritage benefits alone he's yeah. the only witness agreed. correct no that's correct yes if the right. inspector disagrees with that mr marx mm -hmm. she will come to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan on she, she can do yes yes she can it do. is no part of the appellant's case to dissuade her to then come to the conclusion hang in regard to any other material consideration mm -hmm. that the proposal nevertheless accords with development plan mm -hmm. that's right isn't it that has not been set out in my right, it's not your client's case yeah agreed mm -hmm. thank you let's now go back please uh, to the question of viability in the context of flexibility because the two always go together viability is a material planning consideration it was a material planning consideration in this case during the application stage both when the um both when the um planning subcommittee uh, determined to grant planning permission and determined to 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 refuse it and it's a material consideration in the uh, determination of this appeal that's correct isn't it viability sorry yes viability it's yeah. always been a material consideration absolutely yeah we spoke earlier about how the available pie of um uh, uh, of resources that mm -hmm. could be put to the benefit of the public interest mm -hmm. in, the, in the widest possible sense mm -hmm. has been the division of that was changed at the application stage between the two decisions mm -hmm. and necessarily we don't know in the context of this appeal whether it's changed because we rely upon the viability evidence as it existed in march of 2022 2022 correct C correct yes right. so insofar as it was lawful for the local planning authority subcommittee to come to its own decision on weight on the material planning consideration of viability it is also lawful and necessary for the inspector to come to her own conclusion on the question of weight to be attached to viability as an issue in this appeal do you agree um yes but on the basis that clearly the vi the viability is agreed between the parties absolutely yeah. right yeah but let me make absolutely clear here and this goes back to uh, what i said right at the beginning of, uh, of my cross-examination the appellants of the local planning authority's case in, in this appeal is put on the basis that it is demonstrates or justifies by the submission of, uh, uh, of substantial evidence 
of the decision that was made. No evidence is given by the local planning authority on the question of viability, and essentially no evidence is given by the uh, no new evidence is given by uh, the appellant on the issue of the viability um, as compared to, in other words, so the issue of viability hmm. is the same in March 22 and is the same as it is now on the evidence. Do you agree? On the evidence, yes. Yeah. So it is right, isn't it, that the inspector may come to her own conclusion on the degree to weight to be attached to viability uh, as a material planning consideration, whatever you may say, whatever I may say. Agreed? Um, potentially, but as, as I say again, that the viability I, is my understanding, Mr Beard, is, is not contended between the parties. Absolutely right. And the local planning authority, in so far as its evidential case, justifies the decision that was made in March 22, March, uh, 20, 19, March 2022, does not give evidence about the question of weight for the inspector and, uh, on the appeal. It's no part of the local planning authority's case because we're not entitled to give evidence on that. Right? Do you understand that? You would, you would have, you would be the first person to criticise uh, my witnesses, the local planning authority's witnesses, if we attempted to speak for the local planning authority uh, without securing, without securing some sort of instruction from the committee. Agreed? Um, yes. Right. Well, that can't be done because the local planning authority uh, no longer has a role in, in the determination. Uh, 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 in the determination of the application, so it's not a question to, to pay back to the committee. You've never asked or demanded the, the local planning authority do that, have you? I don't know that we need to, Mr. Beard. Of course, we don't need to, because we're agreed that the, this appeal should be determined on the basis of the available evidence on viability that was available to the local planning authority decision-making committee in March. That's, a, yes, that's, that's the long and the short of it, isn't it? I agree, I agree with that, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And the inspector must have regard to the passage of time and the change the, the change in material planning considerations when she comes to, comes to her own decision on the degree of weight to be attached to viability as material planning consideration. Agreed? Um, I don't know, Mr Beard, how the inspector can do that on the basis that the viability evidence is before her. It's agreed between the parties. Are you suggesting that it should be diminished? No. Because no, of the period of time that's passed. No, my point is this, that the inspector must come to her own conclusion on the question of viability as one of the factors that is relevant for the purposes of making the decision as a whole. Agreed? I, I do agree, yeah, but I come back to the fact that there is common ground between the parties that the viability is agreed. Was agreed back back in March of 2022. Is, is, still, is still agreed, Mr. Beard. It is agreed that the viability evidence that was before the committee continues to be before the committee and before this inspector. It hasn't been updated, is the yeah. point. Yes? That's correct, yes. It hasn't been updated in the same way that there isn't housing land supply um, uh, evidence before the committee and the both parties the, the 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 appellant and the local planning authority are content for the inspector to determine the appeal on the basis of of what's before Absolutely. What's before. yes, yes we we'll agree on that yeah that's the most important thing isn't it but just because matters were agreed by the just because matters aren't in issue because they were agreed doesn't mean that the inspector must follow what was agreed by any of the parties at any stage. Agreed? Uh, obviously, there, there, the, there, there are matters for the uh, decision maker to take account of them and weigh up ultimately. Um, but I would say by the same token, if there is agreement between parties, one would perhaps suggest that there's greater weight that can be attached to those elements. Why? Because they're not in dispute. just mean that they're not an issue? They're not in dispute. Yes, so, so but that, that means they're not in dispute, not that greater weight should be attached to them. 
Well, but com the, conversely, Mr. Bead, you're suggesting that that the inspector could attach less weight to something because of the passage of time that's passed. Let, 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 let me make absolutely clear. Don't put words in my mouth, please. I want to be absolutely fair to you and the appellant because I am not saying that at all. What I am saying, and this is a very important point because the you have already agreed that at all stages, the pursuit of this appeal, just like the application, was at the appellant's own risk. Very important. The inspector is at liberty to come to a different conclusion on the degree of weight because she is the decision maker and must come to her own consider her, her own decision on the question of weight of in respect of all material planning considerations. That's that must be right. Do you agree? I, I agree, yes. Right. Yeah. So the point is simply this that the appellant has made its own decisions at different stages to delay the making of the appeal to the Secretary of State and circumstances have occurred that the appellant has accepted that it is appropriate in the circumstances um, that matters to do with the prosecution of this appeal or that the conduct of this appeal uh, should be de de delayed and at every stage the appellant has done so cognizant that it does so at its own risk. Agreed? Uh, um yes i uh, yes i think you, you disagree with that right yeah and that that is relevant for the purposes of looking at what has changed over time we've used the word sorry Mr. Bitt, I, one, one second i think there, there was a suggestion that we we've delayed the no, no 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 there has been no. delay right. circumstances have caused delay yeah necessitated delay yeah that the appellant has accepted that we sh the delay should be had and let's face it let's be quite clear about this um uh, the appeal the determination of the appeal inquiry or the appeal has been delayed because of the uh, unavailability of uh, of the appellant's advocate uh during uh during summer of last year i'm not suggesting that there's any point turns on that it's just a matter of fact that nobody has objected to the course of this inquiry proceeding as it has because the appellant knows it's taking a risk at all stages agreed i mean well firstly mr Beard, i don't see that there's any merit in a tit for tat around uh, what, what, what's caused delay or what hasn't caused delay there, there's been delay on on all sides okay listen listen that, that was my point and i don't think we need to deal with this any further there has been delay it's unfortunate the delay doesn't go to whether or not the inspector uh, um whether or not the inspector should uh, should or should not apply weight in one one way or another the delay has been the delay uh, but the inspector must nevertheless determine the planning application the planning appeal on the basis of the material considerations as they exist after friday yeah, and indeed. Yeah, indeed, and the evidence before her. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Let's just speak then of the evolution that has occurred <laughs> material to the main issues. And and most importantly in that is, is the changes associated with the development plan policies that were relevant during the course of the application. And I'm here referring to, in particular, the, uh, the publication of the... Um, I don't think it's called publication. I don't know what it's called. The issue of the of the new London plan in twenty twenty one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, White very, very um, fairly earlier on made the point that Mr. Justice Dove back in twenty nineteen or twenty twenty I can't remember what it was was opining upon a policy matrix, uh, a development plan policy matrix that has been superseded. Yes, mm -hmm. that's that's a fair way for the inspector to consider it. This case. Uh, yeah yes there is a new plan in place yes yeah so when we're coming to when we're considering uh, the appellant's evidence generally on what the what was what was reasonable or otherwise for the uh, decision making committee to do 
Uh, we have to take account of the fact that the new London plan was in place um, for uh, for a year before the matter uh, went to the committee. That's, that's about right, isn't it? Uh, yes, it was around about a year, absolutely. Um, I think the, the point to make, Mr. Veer, the caveat to that is, is we've clearly identified uh, in my proof uh, and in evidence in chief um, historical matters, uh, particularly where the principal or the, the core objectives are largely similar. And yeah. I would say that they are material considerations for the inspector to take account of. Well, the inspector must take account of the fact uh, the fact that things have changed. The I inspector see. must come to her own conclusion, having regard to the evidence, as yeah. to the materiality of any change that's occurred, agreed? Agreed, yeah. Okay. And in so far as that there is any dispute between the parties, uh, there, there is no dispute um, on the question uh, of the fact that there was a, 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 the, the London plan was a new strategic policy um, environment that didn't exist prior to when, when uh, didn't exist when the members made the determination to grant planning permission if that, that was ultimately quashed. Agreed? Um, it well, it was not adopted. That's that's for certain. Um, it was evolving, um, I believe, at a, at a similar-ish sort of yes. time. But yes. the, the words, right, let's, let's be absolutely fair and, and, and open about this and assist the inspector as best we can. Yeah. The, the, the um, intention to publish, and uh, frankly, we, we ought to be a little bit careful here because we are in the presence of one of the EIE inspectors, uh, EIP inspectors. So I, um, I'd like us to deal with that, uh, our question, in the context of this inspector has a great deal of experience Indeed. With, the, with, with, with the London plan. Um, I, I hope that's an appropriate thing to say. Um, I want to be absolutely clear about this. It's right to say that the intention to publish version of the London plan was certainly, was certainly in place well before March of, of 2022, because we know that the Secretary of State took a very long time. Um, um, to, to, to come to a decision on uh, whether or not he would um, agree to its publication, whatever it is. Yes, yeah? correct, correct. Right. correct. And that, that, that's, the inspector knows about that, and nobody nobody takes any point on, on that reality. Yeah. But when we think about how that's relevant to, 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 to the policies um, within uh, the development plan, that it, the, the, the adopted development plan as they exist today, I think there are two um, two broad, uh, uh, two broad, well, one broad issue um, that 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 we can possibly speak to for the purposes of uh, of this of this appeal, and that is perhaps the introduction of the good growth, the good growth uh, uh, strategy, strategic approach uh, in the London plan that did not exist previously. Is that fair? Um, it um, it probably did not in uh, the terminology that's used, that, that's for sure. But I think some of the core principles um, certainly did, Mr. Bates. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to defer to the inspector's expertise on the oh, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> on these matters. And, and, and I fully accept that there are differences of opinion between the planning witnesses. So yeah. I, I don't I don't want to uh, get bogged down in that. What I'm saying to you is this, that the part of the good growth strategy in the London plan mm. is is a change, a material change in emphasis, if nothing else, a material change in emphasis, if nothing else, on the priorities, the strategic priorities for all development, planning and decision making in London. Agreed? Um. I have to be honest, Mr. Bid, I, I have I'm not having a copy of the previous version of the London plan. Let's not do it right now. Analysis as to right. whether, yeah. Where, let's where get let's get let's get to the nuts and bolts of it. Yep. Um the Hackney local plan was adopted before uh before the uh, London plan was was published, yes? Correct. And insofar as it was prepared with an eye on. Or a view to, or in in the context of the direction of travel, um, at, at the strategic level, 
Mm. It's not correct to say, is it, that any of the relevant policies um, um, in the reasons for refusal um, have been updated to have regard to the published version of the um, current London plan. Agreed? They haven't been updated, but uh, I direct you to um, paragraph uh, if you take up the, the Hackney local plan uh, paragraph 2.5 on page 6 excuse me now could you give that reference again please you... yes yeah, paragraph 2.5 yes uh, on page 6 it's on the challenges and opportunities section yeah and and there it's very very clear mr beard if you go to the second sentence which says lp33 has been produced alongside the new london plan to ensure shared evidence is used with hackney helping to shape strategic elements of the new absolutely. london plan absolutely as one would expect so uh, I, I would argue that um potentially one wouldn't even need to update uh the policies of the hackney local plan because there was a there was a very long period between as you said um the examination in public of the london plan and its adoption sure that's yeah. absolutely right yeah uh, but, look, but, um, that's a sweeping statement for me to make clearly no, no, I, I fully accept that no, I, I take but to I suggest take. to suggest that uh, sorry mr beard just, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. to suggest that um in any context the the hackney local plan is is out of date because of the L new london plan being adopted I, I, I don't agree with. All right, thank you for that. Um, I don't think that's any part of of anybody's case. Um, save to say that um, the appellant, the appellant, has. Uh, well, let's go to let's go to the issue um, of policy HC five as part of the good growth strategy um in, in the in the london plan mm. and as both uh ms masawi and ms slade have made absolutely clear constituted a very significant change in development plan policy that the appellant has not properly had regard to and that officers and in the march 2022 uh, uh, report failed properly uh, to apply that's, you understand the you understand the point I'm making, don't you? I, I do, but I fundamentally disagree with it. Yes, I'm sure you do, because yeah. your uh, your client's case, your client's statement of case, was that policy HC five and policy LP ten don't apply. Sorry, they no, they they clearly that's not our case. Well, I, we can go to your statement of case if you if you like. They, they do the, they do apply. Our case is that we satisfy those policies. Well, 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 let's just wait. Have wait one minute, moment. Moment. Uh, at the at the uh, at the planning um, at the planning committee stage. Yeah. It was the applicants, the applicants' uh, position, as it's always been, that those policies were not relevant in the particular case in this particular case, because mm -hmm. those policies do not protect the user. That's, that was your client's case, right? So, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it, well, let, let's firstly let's go to uh, the committee report. No, let's you answer the question that I ask. My well, question is this: it's been your, it's been your client's, it. it's been your client's case <laughs> at the application stage. No, that's not correct. Of, that's not let's correct. Go to your statement of case. Let's go to your statement of case. Uh, Mr. Beard, I do think it'd be fair to let him try and answer it. Frank. Uh, yeah, that's a fair. That's a fair observation. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Mark. Say what you want to say. Well, no, let, let's. Uh, you, you take me to the statement of case, um, and then we'll work from there, Mr. Beard. Just give me a moment. I, I just let me pull up the reference. No right. Um, it's CD five point one. Yeah. And it's paragraph, oh, forgive me. I had this open a moment ago and I just closed <laughs> it. Uh, right, it, it goes to the question of 
at the loss of the existing cultural use and you start uh you start that reference you start i say you because i know that you're in charge um uh, your client uh, the statement of case begins to address the point uh, at 5.5 yeah you with me yep you have that uh, 5.5 just let me pull up a reference that i've just yeah i mean okay so working that through mr bid you go to 5.6 we're not suggesting that the policy doesn't apply uh -huh. we're, we're we're suggesting that assessing the the scheme has been incorrectly assessed against yes. the policy they're different things yes but you don't you don't say that now at all do you i mean the, you don't actually answer the the appellants uh, the, the local planning authorities case having regard to ms masawi's evidence about cultural uh, about we, the application of policy hc5 we, we do mr beers well, you uh, do now because you do now but you didn't until Ms. Masawi's evidence was produced. I don't believe that's correct. I don't, oh, I, I don't believe that's correct. And and the other point I'd make, Mr. Beard, is that Ms. Masawi's evidence only considers London Plan Policy HC5. Oh, There's really? no analysis against LP10 whatsoever. That is because she is not a planning witness. Indeed. And we that absolutely clear. Indeed. Now Indeed. let's just let's just deal with this in in. in in principle and then we'll look at uh, any detail if we cannot agree upon the principles yeah it is the local planning authorities case based upon ms masawi's evidence and we say ms masawi has expertise that no other witness um, um can claim in this appeal it is the local planning authorities case that policy hc5 was not applied correctly by officers in uh, uh, in the uh, committee report and has not been applied properly by the appellant at any stage you understand that don't you yes i do understand yes, yes. and that is because uh, the, on the local planning authorities case uh, the appellant has first of all not properly taken account of the protection uh, that uh, the broad protection that policy HD5 um, uh, uh, introduces that hadn't, uh, for, for cultural facilities, cultural uses, cultural infrastructure that didn't exist before that policy, that, that policy uh, became part of the development plan um, when the London plan was published. Agreed? I, I don't agree. We, uh, we, we did take account of it. It's, it's referenced in the committee report and um let's go back one stage to plan evolution mr beers if if you go to um id 19 mom uh which was the 2016 version of the local plan uh, sorry of the london plan uh i think we got a printout of the inquiry so mine's a bit faded IQ uh, 19. <laughs> but the version i've got in front of me um uh so excuse me i'm just turning that up very much uh it was in particular page uh 158 and it's policy 4.6 i've got that thank you uh and if you go to part c um part c talks about preparing uh lds um, and under the little a, it says enhance and protect creative work, performance spaces and related spaces in particular in areas of defined need. Under C, it then says um, that the local plan should designate and develop cultural quarters. Um, and part D, it says promote and develop existing and new cultural visitor attractions, etc. Now, this policy was in place at the time LP33 was evolving and it was absolutely in the local authorities gift at that time um and indeed holden studios as an entity to make representations to that plan to um further heighten the significance or importance of holden studios as a creative and cultural facility 
Um, it could have had its own designation as, as other parts uh, of Hackney do, but, but it doesn't. Um, so I think that's that's a relevant point to consider, Mr. Beard. Um, yeah, which we did at the time, and, and it's clear from here, I appreciate that this is in the context of plan preparation, but again, the tend to suggest that uh, HC5 radically introduces a new principle, I don't think is correct. Um, because the principle of enhancing and protecting creative cultural uses is is you know clear in policy four point six at the time. No, yes, it didn't I, exist. I, acknowledge, I acknowledge it's it's the the premise is then developed further under HC five, um, but the principle existed. So um, I believe we took account of it at the time in t in terms of the earlier applications, now, yes. and then in respect of the application that's before you, I still contend that we absolutely did take account of, of this particular policy. And indeed, whether whether or not we believe that policy has been interpreted correctly, it's clear that within the officer's report to committee that that policy was indeed considered. Right, just before you say any more, could you please clarify what policy, to, what policy you're referring to? HC5. Apologies. Right. Okay. Um, you, took us, you took us to policy 4.6 for what purpose, please? Uh, to, to, it was your suggestion that we had not taken account of creative and cultural policy. No, no, no that wasn't my assertion. Was, that wasn't my assertion at all. My assertion, my contention, the local planning, planning authority's case, is that the appellant, formerly applicant, Let's do, does not, did not, have regard to the substantial change in, in uh, strategic policy implemented by HC5 as compared to, or in contrast to, policy, the former policy 4.6. That's the point. And that is correct, isn't it? Because the appellant has at no time taken into account the application of policy HC5 protection for cultural uh, uh, cultural facilities, let's have a look, uh, culture and creative industries, that, yeah. is, that is spoken to or is addressed in subparagraph A, A of policy HC5. One, it didn't exist uh, before it was published, and two, uh, it, it it is a matter to which um, the applicant has never had a regard, save save when it become uh, save when it became obvious to the appellant that it had not taken account of the approach advocated by the local planning authority in its evidence to this inquiry. That's correct, isn't it? No, I don't believe it is correct, Mr. Beard. I don't know whether we're going to reach agreement on this particular. No, 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 I'm sure we're not. But let's let's go back to where I started with this, um, uh, with this part of my cross examination. Was the policy HC five introduce a higher level of protection for a broader uh, set of circumstances of protecting cultural and creative industries in London? True. Culture and creative industries in London. Um, a higher level it, of protection. It, it, it's, it expressly starts to speak about protection, yes, whereas 4.6 didn't. That's, that's yeah, that, that's right. for sure. Yeah. Well, in so far as, in so far as policy LP10. Yeah. Albeit, sorry, just, just oh, to I beg your pardon, I've interrupted you. I've <laughs> just to qualify that, which is why I took you back there to Marm again to policy 4.6. Um, in terms of local plan preparation, not decision making, but plan preparation, it is clear that the term protection is a principle that was established at that stage. All right. But it was a principle that was established under policy, uh, well, the, the preparation of policy 11, uh, sorry, LP 10 was was in the context of strategic policy, London plan policy 
4.6 and that's the basis upon which the plan uh, the hackney local plan was found to be sound and adopted agreed um well, y yes and no taking you again back to the paragraph that i referred to earlier in lp 33 which talks about that being produced alongside the so new apart local from plan. that apart from that uh, apart from that paragraph i'm correct am i not that the the, the, the local plan was adopted was adopted on the basis that it was found to be sound and legally compliant in the context of the published local plan, London plan, being the now superseded London plan. Agreed? As it would have taken account of the emerging London plan as well, no doubt. Of course it would have done. But the most important thing um, uh, to emphasize is just what you have said, uh, just what you have said that the protection that is afforded by policy hc5 mm. is is global in that well global global for london global mm. in the sense that, that that it protects culture and creative industry broadly irrespective of whether local plans uh, uh, uh in, in irrespective of whether or not local plans in london provide the same degree of protection that the, that the, that the London plan policy does. Well, right. that, uh, well, again, this is not an absolute, is it? If you read the policy... We're not, there yet. We're, not, <laughs> we're not there at the detail, please. We're talking about whether or not something exists or whether it's something... Well, no, Mr Beard, you said it's an absolute protection. And oh, no, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. Let me make, let me make absolutely clear about this. The inspector is right, would be right to record that the London plan policies introduce a new level of protection for culture and creative industries by the by a policy HC5 that did not apply previously. I, I would suggest that um, in terms of decision making, there is now express reference to protection, which there wasn't before, Mr. Beard. But as I've explained, in the plan preparation, there was. So, yeah. That's very, 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 very fair. That's, <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I, I was, was trying to get to, which was quite sensibly, quite sensibly, uh, the inspector, sorry, quite sensibly, the appellant does address policy hc5 in its evidence does address policy hc5 as to the level of protection that applies at the, de at the, at the decision making stage or, or in respect of determinations right it before it may it, it has addressed before the appellant has addressed prior to the appellant addressing uh, that policy protection that to which you have just acknowledged in your proofs of evidence, in the appellant's proofs of evidence, it had not addressed that policy protection in the same way previously. Agreed? No, I, d I don't agree with that. Well, first of all, it couldn't have done uh, 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 at the stage uh, uh, at the stage of making the application, the subject of this appeal. um well that that's not the case because uh the previous iterations mr beers had uh film and photography and no, no, space for, for other people no stop please stop okay. please stop i'm asking you a specific question about policy hc5 that well, did not exist for the purpose well, the of HC5 didn't exist. yeah i agree i agree with you yes right. yeah yeah we're talking about the development plan and the evolution of the development plan here prior to the publication of the London plan, I think it was in March or February, March of 2021. Yeah, it was no. part of the applicant's case on submission or a determination of the, the application before 2021 that the that that the, the policy H5 could have existed or that there existed in development plan policy a level of protection at the application for the purposes of decision making. Agreed? It just didn't exist. It, well, it wasn't adopted. I mean, it existed on the basis that the London plan was in circulation as a draft version and people were aware of it as an emerging policy. That yes. is, 
that 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 was the case before the application was submitted. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a short way around this, uh, and I'm getting concerned about getting bogged down in, in time. Yeah. You recall, you recall, um, you recall, um, Ms. Um, Slade spoke to this in her examination in chief and confirmed for the inspector's um, assistance the policy 4.6 4, 4 wasn't actually taken into account previously because nobody saw it as being relevant in the context of this development. That, that, that's correct as a matter of fact, isn't it? Uh, I do recall her saying that, yes. yes. And you don't contend otherwise? Uh, need to just as a matter of fact as a matter of fact you don't suggest you don't you don't contradict uh there's no evidence before the inspector that as a matter of fact the the, the committee the, the, that that in the previous decision making by the committee that led to grants of planning permission the policy policy 4.6 um was not a mature consideration because I hope you mentioned it and it wasn't thought to be material you don't you don't disagree that do you uh i'm just double checking where we were previously mr beard if you wait for one yep. second uh again the policy isn't expressly no i mean the, <clears throat> it's fair to say the policy is not expressly referred to uh in the committee report but cultural use cultural issues are considered in the 2019 committee report right let's could we just could we just be really really straightforward about this please as a matter of fact policy 4.6 of the uh, of the london plan was not referred to in the first two um committee reports leading to grants of permission because it was not a material planning consideration in the in the view of officers or the applicant agreed uh yeah because it, did, it, 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 didn't, it didn't have uh yes it didn't have the the decision making strand it um, wasn't a yeah. material planning consideration mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. yeah it became cultural um, in a superseding policy policy hc5 became a material planning consideration uh, in 2022 and at this appeal because it introduced the protection in uh, 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 that you've already conceded exists uh, 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 par uh, uh, subsection sorry paragraph 8 a of policy hc5 it introduced that agreed in express terms yes yes it does yes and the appellant position whether it's changed or not over time is that that's part of the policy is not relevant for the purposes of this appeal because it doesn't protect in so far as it doesn't protect users rather than users that's right isn't it no, no i don't no, I don't believe that's right. The, the last part is right, but I'm, we're not suggesting that the policy doesn't apply. Clearly, I'm the policy applies. What, what we are suggesting is that the policy, the purpose of the policy, um, I think as Mr. White um, set out in his openings, is not, is not to protect users, it's, it's to protect use. Well, we agree. We absolutely yeah. agree. Well, we agree in so far as you don't protect the users as, as in the uh, as in the those who have control of the land in a property sense um in, in the sense that cultural facilities are for the protection of the users uh, 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 of the facilities in london they do protect the users but maybe not the resident user businesses do you agree that was uh a long-winded way it does not protect the, bit, the individual businesses this is about use absolutely right exactly. yeah it's about more That's than use sorry, sorry please mr mr marks could you finish what you're Apologies, saying um 
yes, it, the policy clearly says protect existing cultural venues, facilities, and uses. Then the, the strand that's of relevance as well is where appropriate. That's what the policy says. It doesn't say individual businesses. Um, so on that basis, I think it's reasonable for us to conclude, and I think we agree, Mr. Beard, that we're talking about use, not users per se. And in users, I mean businesses. Well, well yes, you mean users as in resident or, or occupying businesses, don't you? Yeah. Yes. So can we just make absolutely clear, this policy protects um, existing cultural facilities in the sense that it is broader protection than purely planning protection in other words in other words when we speak of users in this policy it goes beyond what might be strictly described as use classes or or so generous uses for the purposes of planning decisions alone agreed Um, well, it must do because it protects facility. Uh, it yeah. protects on the on the basis of the word facility. Yeah, because clearly, use. If let, let's, for argument's sake, we were to say film and photography use, and there's just an open piece of land, and we say that's for film and photography use, that that may that's not right. necessarily satisfy the policy. So, yes, yes in terms of facilities. You know, I, I don't need to go into the, the definition of what facility means. Well, that's right. That's yeah. right. And yeah. in so far as in so far as it was the appellant's case at the uh, at the um, uh, after uh, or the aftermath of the um, the committee decision, the adverse committee decision that the committee had misapplied policy HC five um, because it uh, alleged by the uh, because allegedly uh, the local planning authorities committee was attempting to protect the users rather than the use or the mm -hmm. facilities mm -hmm. because of that position nothing has changed at all in terms of the proposal before the um, inspector agreed um nothing's changed in the design nothing has changed in terms of uh, the offer uh, in terms of the floor space nothing has changed in terms of the level of agreement between the local planning authority Agreed. and the appellant in so far as the flexibility of the floor space uh, it being available uh, potentially uh, it being appropriate no. used by creative industries nothing has changed agreed? matters of flexibility were a consideration previously which was why we had to submit the the um the employment viability report so that's that's always been a consideration yeah um absolutely uh, it's uh, not gonna not gonna argue with you mr beard quite clearly the scheme did not change exactly so. the policy being adopted absolutely exactly so that's correct but so on the scheme... basis, mr beard that we believe that the scheme complies with the policy otherwise we would have looked to have amended the scheme yes but not because the local planning authority misapplies the uh, policy as being as of uh, as uh, introducing broad protection at the development management stage you, you the, the appellant's position has evolved hasn't it i don't i, I don't believe it has evolved All right, thank you very much that that's let's let's move on um let's now please um speak to the position regarding the change in material considerations regarding um policy uh, dp6 and uh, the introduction or the publication of the uh, of the uh, london planning guidance relating to design which goes to the question of uh, which goes to the question of um living conditions yes uh, the, the issue of living conditions i yeah, just want sorry, to the, i do like, that's sorry, what i'm turning to i haven't asked you a question yet okay you said in chief and you've you've, you've mentioned uh, 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 generally that there has been a change to the proper approach in which um, the existing policy dp6 ought to be applied um, uh, ought to be applied having regard to the publication uh, in, in the summer of 2023 of the mayoral uh, 
London planning guidance regarding design, and that's spoken to by um, by all the witnesses uh, uh, regarding um, the second uh, the second region refusal. Agreed. Uh, perhaps uh, contended it necessitated the proper, the it proper approach point, um, but but beyond that, that, that yes, that absolutely guidance has been published. I'd say that the main emphasis, Mr. Beard, is um, there are there are qualitative indicators within the LPG, um, and also um, the definition of uh, what constitutes dual aspect quite clearly has changed from um, the the uh, the text that was the supporting text uh, to D six, which was quite vague um potentially um so yes but, which resulted in, clearly, but clearly Mr. Beard, it, it is guidance it's not which policy. resulted in which resulted in uh, the appellant changing its position in evidence as recorded in the um section 106 oh, well, come on Mark. statement of common ground um <laughs> um, um so to, to, to the point that the yeah. appellant now accepts mm -hmm. that there are a majority of the units are single aspect um, well, because the the, the uh, housing design, uh, the LPG, the design standards are very, very clear on what a dual aspect unit is and isn't, yes. uh, which didn't exist before. So, yes, yes. absolutely. And quite absolutely. reasonably, it would be very difficult for me to argue to the contrary. So that necessarily changes, that necessarily changes the approach that this inspector must adopt to the determination of this appeal as but as as compared to when the appeal was submitted and now agreed um it may well influence it absolutely um well, the parties it, agreed that it should don't you agree well um i agree that it's a matter to for, for the inspector to take account of uh absolutely the the degree of influence it has is is a matter for the decision making exactly right exactly yeah. right but my point is this that nothing has changed in respect of the layout or the design of the proposal over time and certainly not since the appeal was granted well the oh, so sorry the appeal was submitted <laughs> <laughs> have you got a crystal ball mr uh -huh. um <laughs> Uh, um well the the the, uh, the timing of of the adoption uh of the lpg makes it quite difficult for us potentially to have changed the city well, but that's exactly the point that's exactly the point a more stringent approach is required to the application of policy dp6 having regard to the london planning items I, that have been subject to policy right? I, I, no i don't agree that there's there's no suggestion that a more stringent approach is applied there's just it, 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 further, it, 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 further, further guidance on how d6 should or could be applied okay. um, as, I, use that term, I use that term or stringent yeah. approach because you use that term in your evidence in chief when you're referring to sturt's yard that's yeah. the reason why i referred to it yeah. now whatever we call it a yeah. different approach is required that results in the inspector being required as a matter of law to have regard to the fact that a majority of the proposed uh, residential units are single aspect in the context of the London plan, uh, the London plan policy of DP6. That's right, isn't it? Uh, yes, they are. There are now more single aspect units because the definition has changed. Yep. But that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that the development is unacceptable or indeed contrary to policy D6. To be fair, that's not something I put to you, was it? No, no, it wasn't. Let's try and, let's try and focus, uh, focus our um, attention on um, the questions I ask. I will do my best to uh, ask comprehensible questions. May I just have a moment while I open up a, a, another document? I'd like now to just um, uh, cover a few, a few uh, general points in terms of the uh, materiality of uh, previous decisions, decisions on other sites, uh, because it's a matter upon which the appellant relies heavily. The extent to which previous planning decisions or 
planning decisions in relation to neighboring sites or the like are relevant depend upon the information available to uh, the inspector uh, to judge the extent to which they are materially the same. Do you agree? Uh, yes, yes. And when we come to the question, and let's just use uh, Dirt Yard decision, make, uh, decision for the purposes of making this point, the extent to which the inspector um, may consider, well, let's first of all agree that nobody disagrees that the, the evidence before uh, the inquiry is in any sense not material. So you've invited uh, the inspectors to have regard to a number of previous appeal decisions, mm -hmm. a number of uh, appeal uh, application uh, planning permissions. So nobody is suggesting that they're not material. So when the inspector looks at those, considers those, uh, 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 considers those um, decisions, and what the appellant says about it, mm -hmm. and says about them, the appellants first of all, and the inspector must first of all ascertain the extent to which they are comparable in the broader sense so as to imp whether or not um, they they should be given weight in any weight at all or the degree of weight to be given to them in the in in, in the decision that the inspector will take that's right isn't it yeah, well in, indeed and it's why we've uh highlighted them because we believe they are comparable yeah but of <laughs> course you, you'll accept will you not i uh, just want mr uh what mr um Callum said yesterday on the question of um of the relevance of Sturt's yard, which it's a demonstrably different scheme um with demonstrably different um uh, priorities having regard to the nature of the development. For example, it was a build to rent scheme. Yes. Um I don't see that that makes it demonstrably different. Um well, it's, well, it's it, relevantly it, no, no, Mr. 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 Big, can I, could I answer the question? Um, I, I, um, I would argue that it's it's a very comparable scheme. It's a mixed use scheme. It has a large employment component to it as well. It may well be built to rent, but that really, to my mind, only goes to potentially the design and layout of uh, the residential accommodation. In fact, in, in Miss Slade's proof of evidence, Mr. Beard, there's a fundamental lack of understanding about uh, what build to rent is. And, and it's almost defined as affordable housing, which it may or may not be. Well, you, uh, you, 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 pause, please. Can you say that now? But that well, that was never put to Miss Slade. It can't be put to Miss Slade. It certainly wasn't put uh, to Mr. Callum yesterday. So just be careful, please. Um, I'm asking you only about um, uh, the materiality and the weight to be given to or other decisions uh, or decisions taken in respect of uh, other developments. And my yeah. only point is this, that the inspector has the planning permission, has the, has the appeal decisions, and must come to her own conclusion as to the extent to which, the extent to which similarities are material yeah. and if material should yeah. be given any or any yeah. significant weight agreed absolutely and um if if i may mr b just to, to clarify that again further it remains my opinion that that is a material uh decision for the inspector to take account of not okay. not least because of um the uh, uses that we've discussed but also the the site it is literally next door and the site constraints pretty much in terms of orientation in terms of um uh plot plot size pretty much um as i said in in my evidence in chief the the the, the uh the main uh benefit that that site has that that, that perhaps our site uh, does not is the added constraint of um the locally listed building um well, i wasn't and, asking you about the detail of it was i yeah well you were asking me about the the relevance no, i was asking you about the proper approach for the inspector uh, uh, uh to 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 apply uh, to all decisions i wasn't asking about sturt's yard in particular was i 
think you were asking me about stats yard in particular. Right, you're wrong about that. But let's <laughs> move on. Mr. Okay. Beard, sorry, Mr. Beard, how long are are you going to be now? Well, I, I'm, I, I'm about to move on. I'm about to move on uh, to. I'm going to be about a half an hour. Uh, I'll be honest, because um, I've covered issues in principle that I'm now going to put to Mr. And I, I'm now going to put to Mr. Um, Mr. Marks in respect of the main issues. It won't take. We won't be dealing with them at length. We'll be dealing with them um, uh, it, to, the, to, to the extent that Mr. Marks has, was dealt with them in chief. Um, so I think I'll be subject to answers given. Of course, I'll be another half an hour. So I know, Madam, you'll be considering um, the approach that you want to uh, when, when to take a break. I think now would be if there's going to be a break before I finish. No, no, no. I, I, I don't think we'll take. Mister, sorry, could I just ask, Mister Harwood, what's your estimate? Have you got it in light of what you've heard? Um, I think I'm, I'm about an hour. An hour. Okay, bear that in, in mind, yep. uh, Mr. Bird, because we do need to finish the evidence today. Sorry. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, we can sit for longer um, if necessary, but please carry on and bear that in mind, Mr. Bird. Uh, thank you very much, madam. I, I'm grateful for that. Uh, let's then, then turn, please. I think, let me just check my note if we do, because. Turning now, please, if we could, please, to the um, uh, to the main issues and thinking about um, thinking about them in the context of the local planning authority's case defending the reasons reasons for refusal on the cultural facilities case. It's correct, isn't it, that um, uh, the, that the appellant has adopted a narrower narrower approach. First of all. Uh, to the application of, of policy H5 in terms of it being a cultural facility uh, in, in use for creative uses, creative industries, a narrower approach than the lo local planning authority. Do you agree with that? Uh, Mr. Beard, are, are you able to embellish upon what, what I, you mean? I've answered that question. If you can't answer, you can say so. The, 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 the local planning authority's case is clear. That the that the appellant has adopted a too narrow approach uh, to uh, the to the application of policy HC five, having regard to its broad protection for cultural facilities. That's correct, isn't it? Mm, I, I don't believe that to be the case, Mr. Beard. No. Okay. Now. I put it that way because I've already asked Mr. Stevenson about that approach, and that was me putting my case. I'm not going to take you to the detail that I put to Mr. Uh, put, put to Mr. Um, Stevenson, and that is why I don't want to get bogged down in the detail. I am putting my, my client's case to you, and the, the case is simply put that you understand that Ms. Masawi's evidence was clear and Ms. Slade's evidence was clear that the appellant had adopted a narrower approach that was in uh, was was consistent with the officer's approach in the committee that was the wrong approach to the consideration and application of policy HC5. You understand that to be the case, don't you? Uh, well, back back to right and wrong, Mr. Beard. Um, I thought nobody could be wrong. There's, there's the clearly two policy can be right or wrong. <laughs> to, I, I believe, uh, as is our case, that the approach taken both in the committee report and in our evidence is the correct approach. As you said earlier on, uh, Mr. Beard, Ms. Masawi is not a planning expert. Uh, Ms. Masawi has given evidence on the basis of her experience of working with creative and cultural industries. Um, she says in her evidence that she has liaised with her policy colleagues 
but we actually haven't got any definitive evidence of that and how the GLA would have, would have actually, the policy team would have approached this. Um, so I come back to, I, 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 in my in my opinion, the approach taken in the committee report and in our evidence is is correct. It, it's right, isn't it, that the policy uh, HC5 is intended to protect existing premises that are in use for the purpose of creative industries, potentially the same as those, uh, potentially including premises include the of the nature of this appeal site as it exists do you agree um uh, perhaps i'm uh going a step beyond are you suggesting that the basis of the policy i protect existing cultural venues or facilities well, it could <coughs> be tough, it? no no, no. Uh, mr beard i haven't finished yet um means that the site itself cannot be redeveloped no sir. well did i i didn't put that question to you to you did i no but that but that's what's being inferred no it's not being inferred at all please just answer the question i ask you it it, it it it's simply the case and as i understand it your client does not disagree that policy hc5a applies to this case because it can be because the existing premises and the operation of those premises not necessarily by the user that, that it currently occupies can be regarded as a facility in use of for creative industries that's right isn't it uh sorry mr big could you repeat the question yeah. Your client does not agree, and it's no part of the. You don't disagree in your evidence that the appeal site, as it presently exists, can be considered to be a facility, a cultural facility, in use by creative industry. That's correct. We we haven't argued that it that it's not a, a cultural facility. And how could you? Because because you, you your your case is that is that the uh, the, the the appeal scheme reprovides. Indeed. Right. Well, the extent to which it does reprovide the cultural facility in use of creative industries is a question for the decision maker having regard to the uh, uh, having regard to the. Um, evidence that what we can what the inspector can come to the conclusion is what is going to be lost is the agglomeration of buildings as they are presently used have been used for 30 years and are used for creative industries that's agreed isn't it? at the very least it's going to be lost temporarily until the reprovision comes along Agreed. yes so those buildings will be lost but if the facility is reprovided then i'd argue that the protection of that facility has been achieved yes it's been no part it's no part of the appellant's case um to say that any consideration has ever been given to deal with the interim period between demolition and building in terms of compliance with policy hc5 agreed uh, well, we've clearly, uh, Mr. Beard, as we've as we've covered, looked at all of the policies of the development plan, which go to your good growth agenda. Um, so, oh, minus the mayors. Yes, sorry, sorry, the mayors. Um, so, again, we have considered policy in in the round um, yeah. when when reaching a, a decision on the most appropriate way to redevelop the site. Right nothing in the section 106 nothing in the conditions makes any provision for the interim period between clearing the site demolition and rebuilding having regard to the existing creator uh, existing cultural facility nothing has been nothing has been secured in that respect has it um that's correct but i would a point out that there's nothing in policy that requires that 
to occur. Uh, we heard the evidence from uh, Mr. McCartney that, that suggested that the uh, business is in, in good financial health and could relocate as well. Um, and uh, the local planning authority had never asked for such provisions to be made. But that's because that's because on the local planning authority's case before this inquiry is because is because um, the local planning authority has given evidence in this case to say that officers misapplied policy HC five. That's why. That is why nothing has been required. But the same is true that the appellant has never secured. Uh, the future for those who use the facility and benefit from the facility, not Hope and Studios Limited, those who use and benefit from the facility as as a as an asset, as as a piece of infrastructure for the purposes of um, policy HC five. That's correct, isn't it? Well, policy HC five doesn't require us to do that, Mister Beard. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I have your evidence on that. Um, turning to the question. Um, uh, turning to the issue of, uh, of heritage, we don't need um, to go over uh, this again because we've already spoken to um, the proper approach to the inspector. Um, but it's right, isn't it, that it's open to the inspector on the basis of the evidence that's concluded to come to the condition, uh, conclusion, first of all, that, that the proposals result in, uh, uh, result in less than substantial harm uh, to the designation designated heritage asset, it being the character of the prince of the conservation area. Open to the inspector to do that, yes? Yes, yeah. And it's also open to the inspector to come to the conclusion uh, that, 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 that that harm is not, on the evidence, it is not outweighed by the heritage benefits relied upon by Mr. Dr. Mealy. Agreed? Uh, absolutely, as decision maker, yes. Uh, thank you very much. And that is that is a matter uh, that for the judgment of the inspector based upon the, the, the competing positions in, in evidence on heritage. Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, in respect of uh, the living conditions um, uh, reason for refusal, um, there are a balance of considerations that are raised in the, in the um, reason for refusal. Mm. And those include um, the single aspect dwelling, um, um, uh, the, the single aspect dwellings that the inspector must determine in a different way than has been determined before, because of what we have said about the relevance of the new policy. Agreed? Uh, the new guidance. Agreed? Um, as we discussed before, Mr. Beard, I, I don't necessarily believe that. Um, it needs to be determined differently. Yes, yes, I acknowledge, as I've said, that there is a different definition of what single aspect and what dual aspect means. Um, but that's no the, the the methodology for assessment actually hasn't fundamentally changed in terms of residential quality. Uh, thank you very much uh, in terms of uh, quality. Um, but it's right, isn't it? That the <laughs> It's right, and I don't want to get I, I don't want to get bogged bogged down here because Mr. Mr. Davy has already accepted when I cross examined him mm. uh, that the that the that the approach that the inspector must adopt is a different approach because the design of the development was designed a long time ago and no adaptation has been made or can be made or is suggested to be made. Uh, and that is a material consideration for the inspector to which the inspector must have a guard. That's right, isn't it? As I said, I feel like I'm repeating myself, Mr. Beard. I don't, I don't think that there is a different approach that needs to be taken. The Quite clearly, the number of single aspect units has increased as a result of the LPG. Uh, thank you very much. And therefore, uh, on the on the basis of the uh, the change in position recorded in this in, this, in, in the statement of common ground, mm. the inspector must come to a conclusion as to whether or not um, uh, whether or not the the proposal the proposal complies with D, uh, policy D6, having regard to, I'm going to suggest the more stringent approach, the more strategic, 
stringent approach uh, to uh, 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 to ensuring that to ensuring that single aspect dwellings are only permitted in 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 the exceptional circumstances as is described in the London Plan. Um, sorry, the London Plan as properly construed now, having regard to the design planning guidance, London planning guidance, which is a new consideration for the inspector to consider. Yes? I, I agree. Yeah, the LPG is a new uh, consideration for the inspector. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Uh, turning, then, um, to, turning then to the living conditions issue, the inspector will also have regard to the adequacy of the uh, uh, the, the the other considerations, the the open space and the play space, having regard to the quality of the accommodation um, uh, uh, included within the uh, within the uh, proposal that now includes by agreement fifty four percent fifty four percent of single aspect dwellings. True. Um, well, they're 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 different matters. Um, there's there is housing housing quality and standards policy D six, which fundamentally deals with um, the residential dwellings themselves. Yes. And then there's a separate matter to consider, which is um, the uh, external amenity that those uh, residents have access to. Yes, that's exactly um, that's, that's exactly my point. And the yeah. balance the balance of considerations will be different. Um, having regard to having regard to um, the acknowledgement by both parties that the majority of the of the proposals are single aspect dwelling as number of units are single aspect uh, units as as was contained as was contended by the local planning authority from the outset I, well, I don't agree with that part mr beard on the basis that just just because a dwelling is single aspect doesn't mean it's a poor uh, quality of accommodation, which Did is what you, suggested. you can have dual aspect units that are terribly designed, where privacy is incredibly poor, where overheating is poor. So the, point, the point is to look at to look at this matter in the round, Mr. B. I agree. That's my that's exactly my point. That's yeah. exactly my point. And the reason for refusal number two is the local planning authority's position back in march based upon based upon um, uh, the conclusion that the number of single aspect dwellings was un unacceptable and that is they are unacceptable having regard to uh, the the uh, having regard to the priorities of the london plan that say that single aspect uh, dwellings should only be permitted in exceptional circumstances that's the point isn't it well, um, we we went through this with with uh, Mr. Callum's evidence and and Mr. White's cross examination, where the only matter that potentially could be raised around concern uh, of the the number of single aspect units was flexibility. Beyond that, there was there was nothing else suggested as to why they were unacceptable. The occupants of the single aspect units will be also the occupant will also be the users of the facilities the open space on the uh, on the site uh, and some of those will be families with children agreed uh, potentially yes absolutely exactly. but then, so but this then... inspector must have regard to whether or not uh, the planning permission uh, whether or not the living conditions will be acceptable having regard to um the uh, the majority of the problem majority of the, the the dwellings being single aspect units in circumstances where the local planning authority maintain uh, that the uh, that the open space and the play space requirements do not uh, do not meet the aims and objectives of the policy and, 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 and our case mr beard is that, that those policies are satisfied uh, thank you very much, and, and that's the difference between us on on that. Yeah. The the, the the issue of family housing goes to that issue, doesn't it? Um, uh, but of course, the, the position is 
the, the position is nuanced insofar as the policy must be applied flexibly and the inspector must have regard to that as one of the contributing issues as to whether or not this proposal is acceptable. Agreed? Agreed. So when we, when we, when we put all of that together, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Marks, it comes to this, that the inspector comes to the conclusion that the aims and objectives of development plan policy have not been, have not been um, met as a matter of her judgment in respect of, in respect of each of the main issues. It's open to her to come to the conclusion that the proposals do not accord with the development plan um, taken as a whole, having regard to those four or five main issues. Agreed? If, if the inspector concludes that they haven't been satisfied, indeed, yeah. Okay. If, 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 you, as, as far as I understand your case, your case uh, in evidence does not suggest that the, if the inspector comes to the conclusion that the proposals are not in accordance with the development plan on the, any more than one of the issues, main issues, on any more than one of the main issues, that, uh, that, that the public benefits, the planning benefits upon which you rely, um, should lead uh, to grant a planning commission. That's not your case, is it? Uh, well, we've we've we haven't expressly set that out, Mr. Bidge. Sorry. But say it's sorry, it's it's open to the inspector to to reach that conclusion. We've we've gone a step beyond yes. um, and assume that there there isn't uh, compliance. That's right. And if there isn't compliance, then in our opinion, uh, in the planning balance, those benefits outweigh any potential harm. So yes. it may well be, for example, uh, that the inspector might conclude that. The number of single aspect units is unacceptable but everything else is acceptable uh and it may be that um that in itself could be sufficient to warrant refusal of the permission yes. and then you could engage the, the benefits so the, ins the inspector can record though mr marx yes. is that your evidence does not address the position in which the inspector comes to the conclusion that the that that the proposal does not accord with the development plan on the basis of the aims and objectives of uh, cultural facilities policies, um, heritage policies, living conditions, uh, and uh, let's leave it at living conditions. If the inspector comes to the conclusion, comes to the conclusion that the proposal does not accord with the development plan in respect of those three issues, you don't give evidence to say that the planning benefits outweigh uh, outweigh um, or, or, or sufficient. To grant planning permission that's not your case is it uh well as i said before mr Bid, not not those issues specifically because in order to do that we'd have to look at every possible permutation of uh ish reasons for refusal and then weigh the benefits individually up against each of those scenarios which uh might be quite an extensive task what well as i said what we've done is gone beyond that actually and yes. and looked at the benefits as a whole um, and if, as we've said, if there is non-compliance with the plan, it's it's for the decision maker to take those into account in reaching the decision. And that's where I'd like to to end. Oh, I think you've hit the mute button, Mr. Beard. <laughs> and that's where I'd like to um, uh, finish, please. On the, 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 the last um, issue, reason for refusal for was precisely that scenario where the local planning authorities committee came to the conclusion that having regard to all the other material considerations including its position on the question of um, cultural loss of cultural facilities heritage um impact and um and the living conditions that the balance of uses did not meet the aims and objectives of the policies as mentioned in, in reasonable refusal form and it's open to the inspector to come to the same conclusion. As we've said before, yes, it's open for the inspector to to reach that conclusion. Yes. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you, madam. I'm sorry for taking longer than I intended. Okay, great. Thank you. It's now ten to four. Let's have a short break. Um, and we'll come back at ten past four um for Mr. Harwood's cross examination. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's now 10 past four. Um, Mr. Harwood, thank you very much. I've got the documents you've asked us to turn up. Please um, uh, proceed with your cross-examination of Mr. Marks. Right. Um, thank you, Madam and uh, Mr. Marks. Uh, can I start with um, policy HC5 in the London plan, uh, which is at CD 8.1? Yeah, and that's page two, page two nine eight, paper mm -hmm. and PDF. Yeah, yeah, um, and in, in the introductory, uh, so second line, development plans and development proposals should. So this is a development management policy as, as well as a plan making policy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, paragraph one, um, protect existing cultural venues, facilities and uses. Um, the Eagle Wharf site is a cultural facility, isn't it? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so that should be protected in the policy? Uh, well, it goes on to say, Mr. Harwood, where, where appropriate. Okay, right. Are you suggesting that it is not appropriate to protect this cultural facility? Uh, we haven't made that case, no. Right, uh, so it, so you accept it is appropriate to protect this cultural facility, so the policy to protect the cultural facility applies to the studios? Uh, yes, in, in this instance, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the the only way you would protect that facility given that uh most of the site is being demolished is if uh the facility is reprovided on the site isn't it um yes yes in order to protect the facility if you are redeveloping the site you would need to reprovide the facility yes yeah um and for facility, you, you recognise in uh, Mr. Questions from Mr. Beard that it's more than simply the existence of a particular use in planning terms. It is the the, the facility, the building, the, the 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 structure, the ability to operate in a certain way. That's that, that's what's being protected, isn't it? Um, in yes, in part, yes, yes. Yeah. So. Um, you wouldn't be protecting uh, a facility of, say, the Colosseum, which is used by English National, National Opera, um, by uh, redeveloping that site and being left with a small venue which some amateur musicians might use, but which professional music musicians would not enter the door would you um well you might be because that may be appropriate based on the wording of the policy sorry you're suggesting you're suggesting that um, i'm not suggesting it is but uh, but an unequivocal, well, yeah well i'm asking i'm asking, asking for your evidence your, your evidence that the mayor's policy protecting london's cultural facilities often of international renown is it can be replaced by something which is only going to be used by um, four seven-year-olds playing recorders. What well, fundamentally depends whether, if that's the only element of that uh, scheme, then perhaps that would be the case. But um, well, there, there may well be more to it. Who knows? You know, well, not 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 in the example I put to you. Um, it, it's it's, it's it be protecting cultural facilities involves protecting the quality of the provision in London, isn't it? Sorry, Mr. Harwood, could you repeat that, please? So protecting the cultural facilities involves protecting the quality of the provision in London um, um, on their sites. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily say that in in the policy, Mr. Harwood. No. Um, I, I I get where you're going. Um, well, um, let's answer the question, please. That's easier. Um, yeah. I, no. I, I I don't. I don't believe that it, it unequivocally says uh the quality needs to be protected that's not what the policy says so is your your case that well what what, what is your is your your client's case not not 
uh, is, is it that um, you're not protecting the quality of the facility on the site, but it doesn't matter um, under HC5, or is your client's case that you are protecting the quality of the facility on the site? Uh, in our opinion, we are we are protecting the quality of the facility, um, indeed. Now, what what the policy doesn't say, um, Mr. Howard, is is that there is a need to reprovide like for like. That's not what the policy says. Um, it just simply talks about protecting existing cultural venues and facilities. There actually isn't. There is no qualitative element necessarily to that. Right. Uh, in terms of the quality of the re reprovision, that's not something which you yourself are giving expert evidence on, is it? I'm reliant on others. No, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, as a matter of the inspector, take a view as to who she's heard from, who has expertise and and, and who doesn't. Uh, so um, we've obviously had Mr. Stevenson uh, mm. and uh, we've also got the supplementary proof from uh, Miss uh, uh, Avarin Tarkis um, and you've also heard, I hope I've pronounced her name correctly again, um, uh, Miss Musawi um, and uh, the uh, McCartney family. Yeah, and Mr Ling as well. And Mr Ling, apologies. Yeah. apologies. Yes. Okay. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, if, if the inspector concludes that you haven't protected cultural facilities in accordance with HC5. That's such a fundamental point that the appeal should be dismissed, isn't it? Um, no, not in my opinion, no. Re it is really your opinion that you can fail to protect the cultural facilities on this site, um, but the scheme should still be allowed to proceed? Uh, it, well, firstly, I would say it it depends upon which uh, one interprets the term uh, protection. Um, uh, as you know, our case is we are reproviding the facility. I think we acknowledge and you, and you heard from Mr. Davey that there is not a complete like for like reprovision, but there are substantial elements that are very, very comparable. You've also heard from Mr. Stevenson as well um around the the relative qualities of what we're proposing uh its suitability flexibility uh and the supplementary proof of uh miss um uh uh van tarkis as well um so I, I, you know i believe that well that that effectively is our case the mm. the, the, the second strand sorry to that uh, mr harwood is if that, that case that, isn't accepted was quite, quite, yeah and quite clearly if uh, that there are other policies of the development plan that the um, inspector right, rightly would take into account. And clearly there needs to, again, be a balancing exercise as to how substantive um, or how much weight one attaches to the cultural and creative policies in the context of the other policies that have been set out around housing delivery, employment floor space provision, um, given the site's location, um in the opportunity area and priority office area right well, you, so you say there's a thing to consider you, you're not putting forward a positive case are you the a fa a failure to comply with hc5 is something that can be excused by some other benefits of the scheme well uh, it's a very similar question to mr yeah but, so, so i'm so what you you've identified um, you, you've not, identified you've, well, sorry you, you've you, you've said that there's matters to be considered fine Hmm. I'm asking, I'm putting what I'm putting to you. You say the things that you have to consider. What you haven't put forward is any positive case that if you fail to comply with HC5, planning permission should still be granted. Now, um, what we're seeking to establish is you're not putting forward that positive case, are you? Well, we've put forward a case that, in our opinion, we're compliant with HC5. So I don't see why we need to present the case, as I discussed with Mr. Beard, on the basis that, that we don't um, satisfy that policy. I don't think that we should look at that in isolation. Um, as discussed, there's a there are a range of policies that are um, material to the consideration of this appeal, and to consider every single one in isolation and then weigh the benefits up against that would be 
quite a substantive exercise, which I, I don't believe we need to do. We went a step beyond that, um, as I set out to Mr. Beard, and have identified all of the planning benefits that we believe, if the scheme is not um, considered in accordance with policy, would outweigh that harm. Now, we're all agreed, aren't we, that um, what this policy is concerned with is about the use rather than the individual user. So right. Hoban Studios rather than Hoban Studios Limited. I think we explored that yeah. to great detail, yes. Yeah. Um, so the need is to reprovide in terms of protect cultural, well, protect cultural facilities on the site. And you have to do that even if it could be possible for Hoban Studios Limited to relocate to somewhere else. Um, yeah, the, the requirement of policy, uh, as you said, is, is to protect the facilities. And if you go to LP10, there is, in fact, the reprovision um, strand to that. Uh, the other leg to this, obviously, is, is LP10 uh, has another strand where it talks about the loss of facilities and allows for a contribution um, in that context. Um, so that's oh, that potentially a, an approach one could take. Right. Well, let's let's turn to uh, LP10. We find that at CD 8.2. Um, it's PDF page 99, um, paper version page 85 in the, in the, yep. in the local plan. Yep. Yeah. So L LP10. And we're concerned with paragraph D. Um, right. Uh, let's just, just look through that. Um, firstly, development involving the loss of arts, culture and entertainment facilities will be resisted. Mm -hmm. um, so development involving the loss of uh, the studios on this site will be resisted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can agree. So, agree OK, so we then go on, uh, don't we? Unless we provide it. Yeah. Obligation to reprovide. Yeah. Uh, whether that's done in this case will depend on the the evidence of others about the adequacy of the the basement, won't it? Uh, well, it's it's not just the basement. I'd say it's it's the commercial uses as a whole because they could be occupied by uh, cultural um, uh, and creative industries, as has been set out in the evidence. Well, you, you've not put forward any element of design, have you, about the office use as being suitable for creative industries? It's or, yeah. I, I believe we have, Mr. Harwood. Yeah, it's 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 in Mr. Stevenson's evidence. Uh, Mr. Davy spoke to it as well, um, particularly around um, even for film and photography use at at ground floor level um, in terms of the daylight studio, if I remember rightly, as well. So. It does go beyond the basement. Yeah, well, they, they, these are simply conventional offices, aren't they? That, that that's the application you put forward. Well, as, as uh, I think we discussed earlier on, that there is the opportunity for um, cultural and creative uses to occupy uh, some of these spaces. Um, very very similar to. The existing conditions on site, Mr. Harwood, where you have got spaces that aren't, um, you know, necessarily um, used for film and photography use, but they are for other creative and cultural industries, and some of them are not even creative and cultural industries, potentially. Um, so well, yes, I, I believe, um, and this is our case, and it's it's set out in evidence that. Um, the commercial floor space could be occupied by a range of creative and cultural occupiers. Well, the policy, let's turn to the policy. The loss of arts facilities will be resisted unless we provide it. So it's a reprovision of the facility, the well, protection, resisting the loss of particular facilities um, unless they are, those facilities are reprovided. In, in accordance. In accordance with other policy requirements, right? Well, come. On, I'll come on to that in in a moment. Um, it's it's not a it's not a policy to say, oh well, you can lose a cultural facility um, as long as you have 
some office space which is designed like any other office space but might be used by a cultural or art related um organization is it um well firstly we're, we're not suggesting that there is a loss so uh we don't believe that 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 is the case in this instance because you're relying on the basement that's your case isn't it the basement no not just the basement mr harwood I've, I've said that um there are quite clearly the basement has been designed for um film and photography use i know that there is contention uh, amongst the witnesses around the relative suitability of that and we're not going to go into that as you said um but in addition to that our evidence um is quite clear that there are beyond film and photography use as as per parts of holding studios at the moment there are other creative and cultural businesses and that those businesses could quite easily locate in uh the commercial floor space that's being proposed by this scheme well the the only bias towards any creative industries uh in the scheme is a preference for part of the affordable workspace without saying how much of the affordable workspace uh having a bias towards creative industries but not actually a requirement that that's the only person to let it out to your your, your scheme uh in almost its entirety can be let out from the start to anyone who wants an office use can't it um it's it's true that there are no uh, controls necessarily in place but equally um the, the floor space could absolutely be occupied by creative and cultural industries and on that basis there you you, you cannot allege that there is a loss at this point in time is it really your evidence that where you have a cultural facility an applicant can make an application for an office use and say well look anyone a, a cultural use might come into the office use so uh there's no breach of lp10 because there might be a cultural occupier even if the occupiers turn out to be some accountants or planning well, consultants <laughs> now, is that really your evidence Mister? No, well well well, well we, we've also got to balance this requirement against the other requirements of the plan and given that we're in the can you answer the question when, please when when lock priority office area we have to ensure that the space is flexible for both office use and the potential for the site to be used for creative and cultural uses as well and we've got evidence from mr stevenson and prior to that um as i explained before uh the applications accompanied by a uh employment viability report prepared by stretton's that clearly sets out that the space is appropriate and flexible and indeed that's common ground with the council now uh, it's not um meeting in, in accordance with other policy requirements are you suggesting there are any policy requirements which say that um there shouldn't be reprovision you're not suggesting no one's suggesting that are they um well i i my interpretation of that part of the policy is that there's a there's that's been inserted as there's potentially a balance to be applied as as in this case where you have a creative and cultural facility but you also are located within a priority office area and an opportunity area so it's it's allowing one to take a balanced approach um the policy goes on to accept that facilities can be lost as well so it's it's not an absolute well let's just stick with what we're asking about at the moment um you suggest there should be some balanced approach how what you haven't yet articulated is how that balance is some change to the requirement to reprovide what you suggest this balance is that's different from reproviding my, my our case mr Howard, is that we are reproviding the facility yeah um but clearly in terms of uh developing uh the profile of the commercial space we've obviously had to have regard to the fact that this is the priority office area as well 
Um, so that that's the balance that's being applied. Mm. So in my opinion, we we are satisfying this policy, and we're also satisfying the priority office area policies as well. Okay, next sentence. Um, where loss of facility is necessary, and it goes on to say um, contributions should be made in accordance with the planning contributions SPD. Uh, yep. Firstly, it's not your case that the loss of the facility is necessary to secure a development which will deliver wider planning benefits for the community, is it? Well, we haven't said that because we're reproviding yep. the facility. Yep. Okay. Uh, and you're not making a contribution in, towards cultural, public art or creative projects in accordance with the planning contributions SPD? Uh, right. We aren't because the local planning authority hasn't requested that we should do, um, but were that considered necessary? um that could be that could be an additional uh contribution potentially right? well it's a bit late um the, the the second sentence of d we can um disregard for the purposes of the termination of the appeal can't we because uh it's simply no part of your case um that 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 is second sentence is to be applied is it um i don't know that it can be uh disregarded mr harwood because um the, the inspector has to has to read the policy as a whole um it's it's our case that we are reproviding the facility it may be that the inspector decides that we aren't reproviding the facility um and therefore um in reaching a decision um the inspector can um take account of other policy requirements well, Mr. Marks, as you've explained, this scheme has been going on for nearly 10 years. Um, we can't, at the end of an inquiry, which one would have, we, we all hoped would have been finished nearly a year ago, um, <laughs> be sort of flapping around, and I do use that word expression deliberately, flapping around for other tests and other approaches that could be applied, which haven't actually been laid out in the evidence. Can't well, can't yeah, we really? It hasn't been laid out, Mr. Harwood, because yeah. as you say, it's it's not our case. Um, in our opinion, we have reprovided the facility. Okay. Now, can I turn briefly to um, Mr. Justice Dove's decision? And um, perhaps I'll summarise it. We turn it up if we need to. But um, the policy issue he was looking at. Yeah. was about the old employment policies not about uh, the cultural policies we now have um or about the employment policies we now have mm -hmm. isn't it yeah that's, that's correct yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um right. and also what he said was that well as a as a matter of the, the, the loss of the uh, home and studios use as relevant to employment matters, the ma matter of planning merits that the balance might have been struck in a different way to granting permission, which is what the committee had done at that stage. Um, but they hadn't acted unlawfully at that time. That's all he's saying at paragraph 89, isn't it? Sorry, you sorry. If you want could, to. Could, could you repeat the question as well, please? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, let, let's um, let, let's turn it up if so we see the point um it's um cd 11.4 so hogan studios number two uh that's a judgment yeah and at page 53 of the pdf um judges Coming, coming to his conclusions. Oh, well, oh, I'm, I'm just guessing there. I said, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what paragraph is it? Um, it's paragraph 89. Which, Thank you. Which it, yeah. So pa page 53 of the PDF. And um, so the judge is saying in terms of the policies, he's quote refers to CS17, CS18, and DM16, which are all employment, not policies, in the old local plan. Um, and he then, in the middle of that um, paragraph, is recorded in Paragraph 6.5, 
conclusion reached that the officers measured against the policy set out as a benefits in terms of employment, weigh against the loss of the claimant's use, yeah, yeah, and yeah. identification or balance acceptable. Uh, yeah. That was a conclusion which was reached based upon the correct interpretation of policies. There was no policy requirement to attain the specific type of use operating required by the claimant, specific type of use, that's how the case is always put, um, but that nonetheless the loss of the claimant's use was relevant to the considerations comprised in the policies related more generally to employment activity. Yeah, Whilst absolutely. there's a matter of planning merit, the balance might be struck in different ways. So um, what the judge is saying, those employment policies didn't uh, protect the particular use the loss of the particular use, the studio use, mm. was relevant for the, the high quality studio use in that particular case. Um, matter of planning merit, the balance could have been struck in a different way. The committee could, in the judge's view, the committee could have refused on that, on the reason for the loss of the, the high quality studio use. Could, that's what the judge is saying, isn't it? Yeah, he, but I mean, he also said that it wasn't unlawful in the way that they. Yeah, did. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. A, the, the, the distinction, of course, is the court yeah. is not concerned with the planning merits. Yeah. Uh, it's concerned with the lawfulness of the decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This exercise is concerned with the planning merits. Um, yeah. So, simply on the policies as it stood back in in 2019, when this was originally determined, mm -hmm. so at the same time it was determined. Um, the, the judge's views and the merits could have justified the loss, justified refusal. But it was a matter for the decision maker whether they did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can put the judgment away. Can I just turn to another point on office use? And it doesn't involve picking up another document, please, which is um, can you go, please? Um, I'm afraid I think this one probably wasn't on the list. Um, to CD 2.5. Uh, yeah. oh. Apologies. Uh, it's the um, it's the letter from ICNI yeah. to the committee members. Yeah. Just before the March 2022 decision. Yeah. So, Adam, do you have that? Yes, sorry. Yes, I do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and if we go, go please to the bottom of page two, which is under the heading of loss of cultural use. Yeah. And the final paragraph, mm. um, where it's it's said by Mr. Hodgson, the third line, is talk, talking about the sort of reoccupation of space. Yeah. Um, he says, firstly, the application proposal specifically for employment floor space within use class EGI. Mm -hmm. This use class is speculative office space and not studio space, which is a different use within class E. So um, this point's been, been not knocking around for a while. Um, now, a few suggestions have come from your side about uses. Let's take an easy one. Experimental kitchen isn't an office use, is it? um i have to check check the use classes order mr Howard. um po possi possibly not no Does, doesn't sound uh, like uh, not. Doesn't well, sound you, just in in falling under egi e egi because uh if you bear with me um is there benefit in sorry if i can just check the order um because the definitions now mr harwood are you'll appreciate you know e, e can encompass a lot of uses yes well, <laughs> well this is an application for egi yeah. well, an office to carry out any operational or administrative functions yeah. being yeah. used which can be carried out in residential area without detriment to the amenity of that area by reason of noise vibration smell feed smoke soot ash dust or grit Experimental kitchen's not an office to carry out any operational or administrative functions, is it? Um, it would uh, potentially not be, no. no. Yeah. Yeah. Artist studios, I'm just thinking painters or sculptures, you know, sort of banging banging bits of marble around and painting things. 
It's not, um, a, it's not um, an office use, is it? It, it? it may well be. I mean, the, some of these uses do not neatly fall within uh, any particular one of these, these mm. classes. Um, they are they are very flexible. There's a lot of public facing elements that are very comparable to offices, and hence why we we had a, a discussion with the planning authority about the correct use class, and that's why in common ground we've got agreement that EGI was the appropriate use um, and allows for film and photography and a range of other cultural and creative uses. And as Mr. White explained um, earlier on today, um, if there is concern around that, then perhaps we can uh, amend the condition to, to broaden those uses. Well, I wonder about your application. Okay, let's photographic studio. Is that really an office use? You, you've, you've, you've been around Hoban Studios, haven't you? You whilst it's been operating. Yes. Big studios aren't offices, are they? Well, I mean, there, there, as, as I explained before, there's there's a very significant kind of public facing element to Holborn Studios. Yes, there's there's space that's used for film and photography use. Um, I think potentially it could fall within within that use class. Um, I, I don't think it's quite quite as binary with these sorts of uses. Uh, as I say, they are very very flexible in their nature. Well, can we just understand? The flexibility. Can we turn up, please? Um, uh, ID twenty three, which are the conditions in the the latest yeah. uh, version of those. Yeah. Um, having said that, have you? Yeah. Finger on those. Um, and condition forty one is the right. one that deals with uses. Indeed um there may uh, there probably is a drafting point i don't want to spend too long i want to understand um yeah. because i thought that the conditions are agreed between the appellant and the, and the local authority understand at least what the what you think the conditions intent you want the condition to, to do um so condition 41 if if we have that um and if anyone's if it's about page page 15 bottom page 15 i think yeah um so the parts of the vote here by approval in part g of class e um yeah. shall only operate within that use class mm -hmm. and then the reason which is given mm -hmm. is to ensure that the development that 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 the employment is floor space within the development yeah. remains in office use yeah. as per the objects of the development plan policy just in terms of what the condition is seeking to achieve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is to confine those parts of the development to remain in in egi use so in office use mm -hmm. rather than those parts of the development being able to then change to any Class E use, that's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's restrictions to keep to EGI office that's, use. That's drafted at the moment. Yes. You know, it's the, the, the only operate within that use class is not 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 totally good bit of drafting, but it is you're so you're confined to EGI. Mm. Yeah. And of course that's what you've applied for. So the initial use of that space has to be EGI, doesn't it? Uh in part, yeah, not necessarily the whole. Yeah. Well, the um, EGI bit. If you're yeah. planning permission for a particular use, yeah, then general principle, you have to start that particular use. Yeah. You may be able to change to another use, which is either not a material, which is either not a material change for use, yeah. or it's within the same use class, unless you're restricted by condition. You have to start with the use you applied for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the purpose of this condition is to keep you within that use, so within an, on, an office use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any wider cultural uses uh i don't to go back into the debate over what is or isn't uh a, an office use any wider cultural uses which aren't office uses yeah um, not only can't you start that use but the effect of the condition will be you can't change to that use within yeah. that space. that's right yeah uh, as drafted at the moment but as uh, mr white raised earlier today um 
there are potential amendments that one could make to that condition um, to deal with both the um, creative and cultural use point, uh, which could be added to the reason um, and allow any additional flexibility that, that we think may be required to facilitate that. Well, that goes, only goes beyond the condition, because the condition only, the condition bites to any, respect of any later changes. <laughs> um, well, it does based on it's, the... It's suggesting that the initial use should be something wider than EGI in the description of development. That, sorry, are you, sorry, is that a question to me, Mr. That's a question to you. Are you suggesting yeah. that the description of development um, in respect of this part of the site, the commercial uses, let's leave, leave aside the cafe, the yeah. commercial uses that at the moment, which is an application for EGI office, yeah. that that actually should be for something different. It, it could be potentially expanded that condition to, to allow for other use in, in class E, or we could remove the element potentially that deals with um, the uh, change of use um and you take you know removing the provisions around permitted development i put to you was are you suggesting that the description of development so what you're applying for planning permission for for that use should change from egi office to something wider no mr Howard, i object he get answered he said uh, no um, no, 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 he, has, no, Mr. no. Wright, he hasn't answered the question. He did answer. He said he was dealing with the conditions. I'm sorry. He said he I'm, I'm did not... Just let me finish, Mr. Harwood. It's unfair when he answered it. He said he's not suggesting a change. He's dealing with the condition. And, Mum, I frankly, this, I, I think this is far better explored, frankly, in condition, because we're in a problem here, because we're caught between the Rule 6 and the, the Council have imposed Condition 41. As Mr Harwood knows, there's no restriction on changing between the same use class. The Council have imposed Condition 41, and now Mr Harwood's seeking through my witness to identify a problem with the consent, because the Council is seeking to restrict it within Class E, frankly. And I think it, it, it's unfair for Mr. Harwood to make hay on this point, because what could we say? We refuse to accept Condition 41 when the Council are seeking it. OK, thank you, Mr. White. I, I actually didn't hear Mr. Marx's response, so... Well, I, I, I say I, I, didn't, I didn't hear a response from Mr. Marx saying that he didn't want to change the description of development. That was the okay. point I was... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not the, suggesting a change to the description of development. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's move on. Heritage. Um, you're, you're not giving expert evidence on either heritage harms or heritage benefits, are you? No, I'm not. Yep. Easy. Take that one off. Right. Let's move on to some of the living conditions related. Um, matters and first of all single aspect flats um can we um please go back to the london plan so core document uh, 8.1 and within that page 125 um which is policy D6. Yeah. Um, and we're concerned with D6C. Housing development should maximize the provision of dual aspect dwellings and normally avoid the provision of single aspect dwellings. Mm -hmm. um, so on its face, a scheme that is um has uh, even as you first thought um nearly half single aspect and as we now agree more than half single aspect do doesn't comply with uh that requirement to maximize dual and normally avoid single aspect dwellings does it just on that sentence yeah yes it does because the provision is to, to maximize if if the wording of the condition was that the majority should be, then you'd you'd potentially be right. But it says maximise and normally avoid the provision of single aspect units. 
and as we've been through i went through with mr beard um and we've been through with mr davy in evidence as well um we believe we have evidence that we have maximized the provision of dual aspect units so a largely new build scheme in london where the majority of the flats a single aspect complies with a policy to maximize dual aspect and to normally avoid single aspect is that that can't well, be right can it well it can be and you're only reading parts of the policy mr harwood as well as, as i went through again with mr beard um i feel like we're going over old ground a bit but um it, it then goes on to say a single aspect dwelling should only be provided where it's considered a more appropriate design solution um, we have illustrated that given the site constraints, um, the opportunities um, that we have reached an appropriate design solution, and that's been tested, set out in the design and access statement. We've been through a design review panel. Um, we have common ground with the council that we've optimised the site capacity. So there's no suggestion that this scheme represents overdevelopment mm -hmm. at all. Um, in our opinion, we have reached a, an appropriate design solution, and therefore, in that context, we've maximised the provision of dual aspect dwellings. You accepted in response to Mr Beard that the new London plan guidance is, is relevant to decision making, and uh, you, you, you said re relevant to applying policy D6, yeah? Correct. So yes. just have a look at that. Yep. Um, it's CD 15.12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the relevant uh, requirement is CD 4.1, which is at page 26 of the PDF. Oh, have you, I've got the hard copy. Uh, is it the okay, same? Uh, page 23 of the hard copy. 23. Sorry. Oh. Working on no, <laughs> <laughs> okay so C C cd 4.1 Ma madam do you have yeah do you have them? thank um, yes, thank, thank, you. thank you um and that tells us that new homes should be dual aspect unless exceptional circumstances mm -hmm. make this practical or undesirable and gives an example of excessive noise or outside air pollution on one side mm -hmm. of a dwelling where single aspect dwellings proposed by exception should be restricted to homes with one or two bed spaces, not face north, and then demonstrate passive ventilation, daylight and privacy, and so on. I, you're not suggesting that there are exceptional circumstances for any of these flats, let alone a majority of the flats, to be single aspect, are you? Yes, no, I think I think we are, um, Mr. Harwood. So um, let me just turn up, if you bear with me one second. Um, as I said, because of the site constraints, its orientation, uh, layout, retention of heritage buildings, um, we have uh, reached a, as I said, an appropriate design solution um, that, um, that maximises, um, going back to the policy, maximises um, the number of dual aspect units. So I think the exceptional circumstances are the design solution that we've reached, which which means um, which, which has been developed in response to the site constraints, um, which means that we are at the number of single and dual aspect units that the scheme proposes. Well, there's, there's nothing exceptional about the site, is there? You've got a, a one point a point three nine hectare site, so just under an acre in old language. Um, it's open on one boundary, it's got a road on uh, another boundary, it's got development on the other two boundaries, nothing unusual about that. Um, and most of the buildings on the site are being cleared, and a lot of the buildings are higher than um, what remains. Now, that's, there's not, that's not an exceptional site that justifies any single aspect dwellings let alone a majority of your dwellings being single aspect is it I, I disagree i think that the site constraints as mr davy explained um and the approach that 
we've reached in terms of uh, the siting layout footprint of the development um, are a set of exceptional circumstances, which mean that we have the number of dual aspect and single aspect homes um, that we've achieved. Uh, the other point I'd note that this is just one element of a much larger document. Mm. Um, again, um, I would say one attaches less weight to this than the policy itself, because it is only guidance. Um, and therefore, you know, when, again, this document read as a whole and the policy read as a whole, we believe we're compliant. Now, you were explaining earlier that you were told that um, um, the, the, the overheating calculations of DSY2, DSY3, not mandatory, but um, a, a guide. So that th those are matters relevant to the inspectors. Um, conclusion on the consequence and significance of the, the, the large number of single aspect dwellings, aren't they? I, I don't believe they are, having spoken to our, and again, I'm not a technical expert, but they are guiding only as to how yeah. they may approach um, uh, calling where it's, where it's necessary or um, design, um, but th there is no requirement to to comply with those standards. Um, well, Mr. Marks, you're just agreeing with the, the question I put to you, aren't you? I didn't say it was a requirement. Yeah. Um, I, re I repeated what you'd what you'd said in uh, in, in your your earlier answer, and you yeah. You, yeah. you you said the same thing in slightly different in a slightly different way, but to the same effect. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's fine. Um, let's move on to uh, look at open space, please. And um, can we just pull up, first of all, so we've got the, the, the standard to hand, uh, the local plan, so CD 8.2 um, and it's LP48, yeah. which um, is... Um, PDF 173 or hard copy 159. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've got those standards. I just wanted to, um, first of all, understand the figures you're working to. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we take up your proof of evidence, please. Yeah. Um, and page twenty-nine mm -hmm. starts at um, paragraph five ninety, mm -hmm. and you're you're identifying some short shortfalls. Um, I just want to sort of follow the follow where, where the figure comes from yeah so um first of all identify a shortfall of 851 square meters for the employment uses mm -hmm. um this on the basis that the open space provision you're making is 1265 square meters um and the requirement is therefore 851 plus 1265 square meters which is 2116 square so 2116 square meters um yeah 2116 square meters is yeah. well. yes correct yeah. right. and that's on, on the basis of 529 employees yes that's yeah. correct yeah okay um and then the identified shortfall in your next bullet point of 779 mm -hmm. square meters is taking again the 1265 square meters and added to that gets you 2044 square meters and that's your calculation of what the requirement would be for residents based on provided you're correct 14 yeah. square meters per resident yeah yeah 
there's if I could add sorry, John, just, yeah. if I could add just one point um, yeah. because I did ask Mr. Davy to clarify this as well. There is actually an additional um, 273 square meters, um, which is the space that's kind of sandwiched between uh, the pontoon and uh, the main site. Um, so which is one of the courtyards effectively. Um, and uh, at that that space hasn't been added to in added to this calculation. So you could add that as well which takes the total on-site provision to, I think, 1,538 square metres. That's, um, do, no, do we see... It's out, yeah. Okay, now yeah. Do, do we see that anywhere in the evidence in front of the inquiry? No, no, it's not, it's not within this report, I acknowledge that. I acknowledge uh, but that. On, on, on nowhere else? Um, I cannot recall if it's in the committee report I don't know whether it's set out in those terms. If you give me a second, I can check. Yeah. From recollections, well, that yeah. the committee report just talks about the shortfalls rather than the total provision. Well, I the know, it's, 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 Provision at five, two. five five five. Um, yeah. So page, page yes, page forty yes. PDF. Correct. Yes. Five five five. It's not one two six five. I, I acknowledge that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. You, your your suggestion that there's an that actually there's an additional two hundred and seventy three. Yeah. Square meters. Yeah, it's not. Um, really, is, yeah. Is 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 one that hasn't been raised until you've just mentioned it now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. By anybody. Right. Okay. Well, as fair not to pay any attention to that suggested addition, isn't it? No one's been able to deal with it. Uh, well, it's, it's a matter. It's a matter of fact. If you'd like, Mister well, Davy, to clarify it afterwards. Um, yes. Yeah, as I said, acknowledge that it's not in my proof and it's not referred to in the committee report. But it is a matter of fact. If we're looking at um provision well mr marx it's not a matter of fact it's not been raised before no one's had a chance to deal with it no one's pointed it out uh the factual evidence that this inquiry will conclude um when uh you are asked the whatever the final question is mm -hmm. um this evening whatever point we get to this evening um it's it's too late to be be, be, be throwing in some some extra open space isn't it yeah um it's as i say it's 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 uh, information that's been confirmed to me uh, as i said i acknowledge that it's it's not in the proof um and and it isn't in the committee report i believe it is set out in uh, the application documents um so uh as i say it's it's a matter of fact on that basis but but i acknowledge that it's that it's not um not the figure that's used in my proof nor the committee right. report. Okay. Uh, so we want the way you deal with the things in the proof is yeah. to count the open space twice. So the, the 1265 figure you do use, yeah. you, you apply it to the employment and you apply it to the resident, the residential, yeah. um, rather than adding together the employment requirement and the residential requirements and seeing that's what correct. open space you've got. That's correct, yes. Right. Well, um, let's look back at LP48. Mm -hmm. uh, that's saying how much space uh, residents need in yeah. paragraph A, and mm -hmm. it tells us how much space uh, employees need in paragraph B. Yeah. Um, and those are matters which are additional, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You add them together. Uh, it, it can be read in that way. Um, I'll take you back to the committee report of Para 5.55, Mum, where, where it does say, um, uh, and appreciate it's not expressly set out in the policy, 
um, but it, it does say uh, these areas can overlap if necessary um, after the um, uh, quote around child yield. I think it's five lines down, Mum. Um, but yes, no, I, I acknowledge that. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, M M Mr Marks, neither of us are here to defend the committee report, I would have thought, but the committee report doesn't refer to the residential requirement, it refers to the employment uh, requirement and then it refers separate then to the child yield, to the child figure. Yeah. And okay. then it says these areas can overlap if necessary, it yeah. doesn't deal with the residential requirement at all, does it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, but. The residents and employees will both add to the need for open space, won't they? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and the residents are likely to be around at least some of the time, the same time as employees are around, aren't they? Um, there may be some overlap. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the the the. I think it's as likely, Mr. Harwood, that you'd have. Um, residents out at work in the day um, and the workers using the uh, the amenity space and residents using the amenity space in the evening at the, and at the weekends. So there's a duality, a mix of, of use potentially. But your, your, your approach of just taking what isn't to be fair to you and acknowledge shortfall um, uh, and using counting the open space twice is, is not correct, is it? Um, no, I, not, I acknowledge that policy doesn't uh, expressly set that out. It's it's potentially academic anyway, Mr. Hull, which is on the basis that if you if you then go to C, C clear. Don't, we'll, we'll, we'll get to C in due, due course. Don't worry about that at the yeah. moment. Okay. Um, can you just help me on another point on the, your paragraph 590? Um, you say in the first bullet point, subject to the type of occupiers in the building the scheme could meet the target set out by part b of mm. uh, of lp 48 now that that's the target so what we're talking about there is a target for employees yeah. um and what you're saying is that subject to the type of occupiers mm. the uh, number of employees may be such that actually 1265 would be adequate under the policy. That's what you're saying there, isn't it? Potentially, yes, because obviously yeah. the uh, employment density figure that the uh, that the council base um, this requirement on um, assumes a very high density employment use. You could have another employment use that's much, much lower density. Um, if you go back to my, my planning statement, I think the mean figure that we give was was somewhere in the the mid 300s so 300 people you know obviously generates a far far lower open space requirement than 529 so that that's the only point to be made it's it's right. a consideration yeah it's good because on on that figure the 1265 would be 316 employees yeah um or 316.25 um uh <laughs> employees and it's your application work, your yeah. application form had um said 357 uh employees so in terms of the employ the, the employment benefit from the side hmm. um is, is your evidence really that actually the number of employees is 300 odd going to be rather than no, the 500 odd figure that um is the, the the basis of the calculation you're working to how many how many employees do you think they're going to be in the site no we're, we're very clear in my evidence if you go to um the benefits um that it's it's an up it's an up to 529 jobs right. um, now clearly we cannot guarantee that there's going to be that number much like holding studios as it exists the employment uh, number of jobs that that site uh, generates will flex over time. Mm. So we, you know, we're assessing it based on uh, the council's reasonable um, employment density calculation. Right, but 
when, when the inspector is understanding what you say about benefits, um, when you use the figure of 529, yeah. um, she shouldn't proceed on the assumption that it will be that figure or something something very much like it. It could well be um, in the low 300s. As I just said, potentially, it very much depends on the uh, the end users. Um, yeah. that's, that's fairly evident. Okay. Um, can we look then, please, at paragraph C, which I knew you wanted to take us to? Um, it would be, be, A and B cannot be fully achieved. Developments must uh, make physical improvements to the public realm to improve, improve access to existing public open spaces um, and make financial and or physical contributions. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, you are putting £35,000 towards improvements on the north towpath from the north side of the canal, mm -hmm. aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, and there will be public access within the open space part of the site, or some of the open space part of the site, is it? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, that doesn't remotely make up the shortfalls which even even you've identified, does it, in terms of the quantum of the shortfall? 851 square metres employment, 779 square metres residential and your double counting figures. Uh, 35,000 to tart up a existing usable towpath um, doesn't um, offset that shortfall, does it? I don't see why not, given that the um, officers previously accepted that it did. Um, and one shouldn't just look at the site, it's uh, the, the proposal itself. Um, it's fairly standard and accepted practice that you can look at other existing facilities that are within a reasonable walking distance of the site. Um, and that analysis was done by the officers as well. And the proximity of the site to uh, Shoreditch Park and I always forget the name of it, Shepherdess Park, I think it is as well. Um, and the facilities that, that those afford um, when taken in the round. Um, yes, I believe that, that um, the financial contribution and the enhancements to the public realm that the schemes delivering are sufficient. Well, you're, you're not proposing to improve the, the parks or whatever. Is, is, is what your answer is now is we don't comply with the policy, but it doesn't matter because there is public space in the locality. Is that is that really your case? Well, it's not just my case. As I've said, we, we are making improvements to public realm and we're making a financial contribution as well. So we satisfy that strand of C. And then in addition to that, one should take account of existing um, public open spaces um, that quite feasibly this development could uh, could access. And quite rightly, if if the council considered that there was any deficiency in terms of those um, existing open spaces, they could have asked for a financial contribution, but they haven't. Well, it's it's not for the council to this, determine this application now. It's appealed. It's with the inspector to de determine it in the light of the policy and the circumstances she finds on the site and the evidence, isn't it? I acknowledge that, Mr. Harwood. I was I was just explaining the uh, uh, the analysis that the officers clearly went through in the committee report. Now, can I just move on on the, uh, the open space point to uh, LP50, which is the play space yeah. requirement, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand it com common ground that the tight LP50 to get it up. Mm -hmm. um, Com com common ground that the requirement is 110 so it's 100, 102 square meters correct yeah um that's not there's no place space that's shown on the application drawings is there 
Um, the as, as I explained, um, I cannot remember whether it was in my evidence in chief or in response to uh, a question from Mr. Beard. Yeah. Uh, the, the space has been designed, um, and clearly there's a there's a broader landscape condition um, mm. that um, it accommodates playable landscape. So um, the 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 drawings will not show in detail the the landscape design. Um, at this stage, but quite clearly well, there are elements that could be included to achieve those objectives. Well, uh, we can turn the drawings off if we need to, but there's nothing on the drawings which is showing an air area or areas for play space, is there? No, not I said that's that's oh. the case, not definitively. Yeah. Well, not 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 not. Let, let's let's turn let, let's turn them up. Um, can we go to um, the landscape drawing, which is CD 121? Yeah. And we can, seeing that where the buildings are, and we can see a couple of trees and we can see the sort of hard surfaces but it's all very um general stuff and there is a reference to planting and to climbers and mm -hmm. so on. um the, the, there's nothing which is identifying an area for place space is there well as i said it's it's the the approach around um uh play um is is one which is uh as i've explained playable landscape so you, you don't have definitive bits of play equipment um and, it, and in any event mr harwood um this is a matter dealt with by condition and if you go to condition 17 i was just refreshing myself um condition 17 deals with both landscaping and play space so this is detail that's to be provided um as part of that yeah. um discharge of condition yeah well the, the short answer is in, in terms of the inspector approving the plans not nothing in approval of the plans would be approving any place space would it just in terms of what from the plans well it's a conceptual design at the moment mr harwood so um that, that there is you know that's that's fairly kind of common practice to be honest that the detailed condition around landscaping would provide that information. This is very much a very broad arrangement, spatial arrangement, no more than that at this stage. All right, full scene. Okay. Um, so the, the answer to my question, which I answered a couple of times, is just no, isn't it? It's not on the plans. No, but I've explained yeah. why. Yeah. Okay. Um, now let's look at condition 17. Uh, so that's uh, ID 23. Um, so condition 17 is uh, page 8, I think. Yep. Um, and I think we're looking here at paragraph B. Prior to the occupation of the development hereby proposed, details of proposed doorstep play provision for under five year olds. Mm -hmm. shall be submitted for approval. Now, um, we've agreed that the policy requirement is 102 square metres. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. White said yesterday that 102 square metres wasn't being provided. Mr. Davy refers to children's play space um, as being able to be provided as doorstep play within yeah. the northern part of the western courtyard yeah but he doesn't um tell us how much mm. um the condition as it stands doesn't tell us how much so how much is the proposed doorstep play provision um it would be predicated on the uh gla's play space calculator which I believe would be in the order so about 48 square meters right 
So that's the sort of the the, the under fives. Yes, that's the under fives provision. Yeah. Right. Um, and there is no planning contribution or anything else proposed to make up for um, the the shortfall between one hundred and two and. 48 or put another way the yeah. failure to make play provision for children who are over the age of five yeah well I, again mr harwood it's it's fairly common practice that one undertakes an assessment of what can be provided on site based on uh the site's capability and what mm. exists in the local area um there's the child friendly play assessment that we needed to provide in accordance with the council's validation requirements which undertakes that analysis as well um, to inform the council as to whether um, there are adequate facilities in the local area uh, that children well either from a doorstep play perspective or children uh, over five years old could access um, and I believe that was the conclusion um, set out in the committee report as well that the provision of just doorstep play on the site was appro considered appropriate um, and that uh, play space for uh, children above that age could be accommodated off site but that wouldn't necessi necessitate a financial contribution if those facilities exist they're in good quality um, I think you'll find that both Shepherdess Park and Shoreditch Park have very good play facilities well, if we turn up the committee report, you refer to it. Um, so CD 2.2, um, and we go back to um, the, the text around 5.5.5. Mm. So uh, it's, it's, it's only this, it starts on the previous page. So it's, it's three paragraphs and yep. the officer assessment 5.5.4 to Five five six. Yeah. Um, none of that is um, saying that. Oh well, there's enough provision elsewhere, so we can accept a shortfall on site. Is it? Uh, well, that's kind of what the child-friendly play assessment uh, seeks to undertake, um, and it quite clearly says, in, in light of that and the comments made above, that the condition imposed in respect of doorstep play means that the proposal overall is considered acceptable in terms of play space right well none of those comments made above um and if there's something else in the report i've missed do point it out to me please none of not none of those comments are saying well there's sufficient um provision uh available off-site for um well that's um, the, the above fives Sorry, just I was, um, yeah uh, I mean the report simply doesn't say what you say the rationale was yeah uh, so the rationale is the, the child friendly impact assessment is is the element of analysis that determines whether there are sufficient play facilities uh, both provided on site and access to those off site as well um, the condition uh, sorry the comments made above are further considerations, i.e. Uh, preservation of the, the her, uh, heritage assets, high quality nature of the space provided, and the aspect of the canal, that when considered overall, um, as I've said, um, has led the officer to conclude that the level of play is acceptable. Okay, it's like a side, there'll only be an open aspect onto the canal. Um, if your client owned the towpath which the, uh, own the um towpath or footpath where you want to put it on your canal side which you don't it's that's um what the canal and rivers trust and leased to um another uh company owned by the mccartney family isn't it do you mean were were, were that company to erect a huge fence between us and uh the canal because there is other than their property there, there isn't at the moment so there is an open aspect um that's because it's in the same that's business that's because it's in the same uh, occupation which it won't be in your scheme hmm? 
I, I, I don't know how you want me to respond to that, Mr. Harwood. It, 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 that means your, that your, your assumption that your, your there may, be assumption. A, there may well be a, a boundary treatment that's open, uh, and uh, to be quite honest, would probably be more um, uh, appropriate given the setting. Um, there's also potentially a commercial discussion to happen between my client and the the business. Uh, the owners of the pontoon because one would have thought that there's a synergy in terms of those potential uses and operations and one would want to um as a matter of good planning um uh work with their neighbor well mr marks you're you're, you're trying to throw the family off the business and the site they've created um and we know about the viability of the scheme you're not in the position to uh, make up for that with um, lots of lots of money being thrown around, are you? Honestly, Mr. Harwood, I, I don't know how you want me to respond. To that. Well, um, you're going to, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, that's, I'm what, the evidence, that's what the evidence yeah. is pointing to, and, uh, and uh, you, you, you suggested that there will be a deal. I'm suggesting you, to you that chances of of, of your clients uh, being able to get a deal in the in given their proposals and given the amount of money they've got um is it, is not really realistic i don't know how one can make that judgment at this point in time to be honest okay can i move on to another topic please housing um mix um you were we, we've looked um let's just sort of pick it back up quickly um lp14 yes uh in the local plan um which yep. starts uh page 100 page 107 pdf page 93 um for those on paper um and you, you asked some questions by mr beard on this topic and the, the figures of course i think are all common ground yeah um in terms of the justification for variation, one of your comments earlier was about, the, well, this is market housing, but the table has um, a particular mix for market housing, doesn't it? it uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Which is, the, which is the mix we've all been looking at and which the scheme doesn't comply with. Well, the, 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 policy, the policy in, in expressed terms clearly says Council will consider variations to the dwelling mix sort if this can be justified based on the tenure. Um, so that, despite the fact that there is a target against uh, the market mix, which is, you know, I accept based off um, the council's identified um, housing needs, um, but there are clearly, um, and that's the need across the entire borough. Remember, um, there clearly are justifications that can be made based on um the location uh the, the particular tenure um as i've said um so there, there can be deviation from that and again i go to um mr turner's evidence um where we have and this brings in the viability strand as well um clearly set out that there is a preference in order to um improve the viability of the scheme towards um one and two bed units over three beds um we are still making uh a, a good contribution to the overarching 33 percent target at 20 percent family units um well, one could actually extend that mr Howard, to to the two beds as well because the London plan also does accept that that they those units can make a contribution. So if you amalgamate all of those together, over half of the units are potentially suitable for families. I acknowledge the three and four bed units are no doubt most suitable for families. So overall balance, um, it, it's my opinion that we satisfy that policy. Well, you. I'm sorry, this is a matter of language. You simply don't have 33% three beds. You have, you refer to two beds for sort of family accommodation and you don't comply with that preferred dwelling mix either, do you? I mean, 
No, uh, you're far short. This isn't a marginal failure, is it? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's far short. And then actually, if you look at other comparable decisions we've identified, they fall much, much further short um, of those targets, and that's been considered acceptable based on the provisions under strand C of the policy. I mean, does your case really fall on this point, fall down to viability that you, you've not managed to no, come, up with a, come up with a viable scheme that actually complies with the policy? So you say, let's, let's produce something that isn't what policy, planning policies are trying to achieve, but should we get planning permission anyway because we can't afford to do anything else? No, that's not the case. It's it's one consideration, Mr. Harwood. As I set out in my evidence in chief, I believe there's justifications under all strands um, identified in Lim C, um, and I went through those in terms of site location, area characteristics, design constraints, and scheme viability. Um, and again, coming back to other comparable decisions, um, and I know we harp on about it, but Sturt's Yard again. Um, that is a site where, and I believe they are only at 5.5% family housing, um, three beds. That was solely um, considered acceptable on the grounds of viability. Whereas in this case, um, I'm of the opinion that we can satisfy pretty much every single um, justification that's listed in strand C. Well, Mr. Mark, you're, you're, you don't rely on the council's judgment because you're appealing against the council's own decision and the inspector has to reach her judgment um, based on the policies and the circumstances, isn't it? Not, uh, not, 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 not reinforcing non-policy compliant decisions elsewhere. Uh, I'm merely, uh, Mark, just flagging it as, as I have done previously as, as, uh, a comparable decision that potentially is material in the determination of this bill. Okay. Um, can we move on to um, employment floor space? So I'm taking longer than the hour I anticipated, but uh, I hope we're moving fairly quickly. Um, can we go to the local plan and to LP27, yeah. which is page 130 of yeah. the PDF 116 hard copy? Mm -hmm. um, And um, let's just look at um, LP27. Yeah. Um, para A uh, says, amongst other things, that the development must um, have fourth line good natural light. It's not the case in the basement, is it? Um, there is provision for some light to be afforded down to that level, um, absolutely. But um, again, it was acknowledged that the space, whilst it could be used potentially um, for offices, um, the, the likelihood is that um, it would be used for film and photography use or another creative use where there, there is less reliant on natural light, and that's clearly set out in my planning statement in the officers committee report um so um i uh, that that's our justification on that point and then if you look at the remainder um of the commercial space which uh, the majority of space is provided above ground there would be good natural light to all of that i, I, I wasn't asking that given given the time we're at let's just if mr marks if we stick to the question um and then we can we can move even even quicker okay. um para, para b um meets the needs of likely end users again just thinking about the basement um well the the end user it's designed for is for photographic purposes it is said um and you've had, we've had acres of evidence from hope and studios and others that uh, they're going to want to go there um no, there's no likely end user that's come forward saying we want the basement, is there? Um, well, we, we haven't uh, actively marketed the site as yet. Um, so I don't believe one can reach that conclusion. 
and on the basis of the evidence that we've prepared mr harwood um through mr stevenson and as i explained before the employment um viability report mom that was submitted with the planning application itself which does include the marketing strategy as well to satisfy this strand of the policy um we are confident that um there are likely to be uh, potential occupiers for all of the commercial floor space that's being proposed and again that was previously accepted um by officers and is common ground with the council right. okay c c1 um is a, at least 60 percent b1 employment floor space which is not met um is your excuse on that viability still no uh well it's it's not an excuse um the policy allows for it um so um yes there has been a viability analysis um it's hard as i, I explained before um you know what one could end up here with with a scheme where you slavishly follow the 60 percent requirement um but end up with um less floor space um that makes a contribution to the priority office area um so in my mind um the primary objectives of this policy and other policies of the development plan that encourage um an uplift and enhancement to employment floor space in this area are satisfied um but i do acknowledge that we haven't slavishly ticked the box on the 60 percent requirement but well, the policy allows us not to do that well, Mr. Marks, you wouldn't be having a uh, a smaller scheme to get yourself in sixty percent because it will then be pointed out you haven't optimised the use of the site. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Para G, just as a as a link, but let's just pick it up. Um, low cost employment floor space in uh, private offices must be be provided in accordance with. Uh, LP29, which takes us to LP29, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's turn up LP29, um, which starts at um, 134 um, on the PDF, 120 um, on uh, the hard copy. And yeah. I want to look, first of all, at... Uh, B, um, redevelopment of existing low-cost employment floor space. First of all, um, you agree that this is the redevelopment of existing low-cost employment floor space? Uh, yeah, I don't think we've argued that that's not the case, yes. Okay. Um, so the policy requirement is to reprovide the maximum economically feasible amount of low-cost employment floor space in perpetuity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that's different to the 10% uh, affordable workspace, which we'll um, come to, which gets triggered later on. It's not, a, it's not an answer to B to say, oh, well, we've offered 10% affordable, mm -hmm. is it? That, that, that is our case. That's also common ground with the council. Um, so yes, uh, that, that is my answer to that question. Well, um, but it's not, the, the policy um, is that, um, it's, it's not to say, well, we can just offer 10% affordable or 11.4% as you put on the scheme. Um, the policy starts to say you have to reprovide the low cost employment floor space and that is at the moment all of it at Hoban Studios isn't it? Um, I don't know whether that would necess uh, necessarily be the case um, but as I said it, it is accepted um, and it's common ground between us and the council that the, the policy read as a whole the fact that we are providing low co uh, sorry affordable workspace um, and providing that in perpetuity, which Holborn Studios doesn't do at the moment, and and the rent could change in future. Um, that uh, as a 
uh, provision is deemed acceptable and satisfies the policy. Well, I'm asking you about the policy, I'm not just what the council may think about that. The policy B is to provide low cost employment floor space. We've agreed at the low cost employment floor spaces. You're not reproviding low cost employment floor space in accordance with B, are you? Um, no, but then you've got to go to C, and it says if the low cost floor mm. space equates to less than ten percent of the gross floor space, or there is no low cost floor space to be provided, new affordable workspace should be provided as follows. So on the basis that we're not providing it, we satisfy strand C, um, and therefore the scheme's compliant with the policy overall. Well, no, but you you have to justify not providing it before you can then default down to 10% affordable workspace, don't you? Otherwise, the effect is to, to ignore B um, and simply jump straight to C, which well, there's nothing in C. is not sustainable on the policy. Well, there's not any reading of the policy, is it? There's nothing in C that suggests that one needs to justify not providing it. Um, and, you know, the overarching policy is, is again, subject to viability. Um, viability is uh, mm. agreed between all parties. We've demonstrated that um, we've maximised the provision of affordable workspace. Um, we're providing more than the 10%, as you well know. Um, so um, my my uh, conclusion is that as a whole, we satisfied policy LP29. Look at the last bit of B. I don't just track through each of the individual i think we've covered them overall but the the last part the desire of existing businesses to remain on site so the policy is saying that in regard to what the regard to the to the user rather than the use in that respect isn't it the desire of existing businesses to remain on site sorry mr harwood where are you pointing to there? i'm sorry par paragraph b in lp29 um yes okay so, yeah so the, 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 the that's, last that's, words of the paragraph the desire of existing business to remain on site so that is a policy unusually yeah. uh let's recognize it is unusual which relates to the user rather than the use doesn't it yeah that, in that context it does yes yeah. yeah okay um in terms of the existing the desire of existing businesses to remain on site hope and studios limited want to remain on site don't they uh well, they they don't as part of the redevelopment, is my understanding. Because well, they, 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 the they don't want to remain on site <laughs> if the site is redeveloped because the redevelopment doesn't work. That's their point. So when you're considering whether or not the redevelopment should be approved, you have regard under this policy, given this is low-cost employment floor space, to the desire of Hoban Studios Limited to remain on site, don't you? I think they're two different things. I think that this is in the context of low cost employment floor space being re-provided. And if we're providing affordable workspace, which in, in effect serves the same function as low cost employment floor space, appreciate the terms could be different. If there's no desire for the current business to um, occupy the space being re-provided, um, that, that's, that's the basis upon which that strand of the policy um, has been written, um, not whether they want to stay on the site in its current form. Well, the, uh, the redevelopment doesn't work. The, 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 uh, just two points very quickly on this. The affordable workspace um, rents are not equivalent rents and service charges to the rows of the present, are they? They're more. Um, oh, again, reliant on okay. Evidence of um, Mr. Turner on that point. I, I can't recall. Yeah. Again, it's, it's really what's at the heart of your case is that you can't design a redevelopment project which makes enough money for the landowners and the developers so it's viable. Um, which actually retains the existing low cost employment floor space on the site. That's that's really your case, isn't it? 
Um, there is cert there is certainly a viability strand um, to our case, um, but um, as I say, as Part C allows for, we are providing affordable workspace, and we are providing more affordable workspace than the minimum set out. Um, and as I say, when read as a whole, the policy allows us to do that. There isn't an express requirement to deliver the low cost employment floor space. I appreciate it forms part of the policy, but quite clearly C allows for that not to be provided because we're providing the affordable workspace. Um, and again, that's common ground with the council, Mr. Harwood. Can I pick up on one of the points, please? Uh, London plan. Um, now, you, you don't refer to policy SD1 in your proof of evidence. Um, Mr. White, in his questions to Mr. Callum yesterday, said that arguably SD1 is the most important policy in the development plan. And then um, you heard his questions, Mr. Hodgson. Did you get harangued by Mr. White as well for not including SD1 in your proof? Mum, I object to that, Mr. Howard. Okay. That's offensive. Okay, it's Howard. ridiculous. Yeah. Were, were you? Were you? Uh, was 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 Mr. White criticising the absence of SD one from your proof of evidence? Uh, no, Mr. Howard. On on the basis that um, my proof clearly sets out that, uh, in my opinion, the schemes compliant with the development plan um, when read as a whole. Um, also, I believe my paragraph 3.7 um, specifically says uh, and references all policies um, uh, that are listed in the committee report should be assumed to be complied with, uh, and SD1 is one of those policies. So uh, appreciate, Mr. Howard, it's not expressly set out in there, but um, the inference is that we have considered it. Well, to be, be, be fair, I mean, be, hopefully be very fair to Mr. Mark, um, SD1 is not referred to in any of the proofs because in terms of determining whether or not this planning permission should be granted, um, it doesn't take anyone very far. It's a pro-growth policy, um, but it doesn't help in terms of resolving the merits of this particular planning application. That's why... Uh, you and the other witnesses have not sought to take toner ink or time talking about SD1, isn't it? No, I don't, I don't believe that's the case. As, as I said, to, I mean, we've dealt with this issue. I dealt with this issue, I think, with Mr. Beard earlier. Um, the, the approach that I've taken, as I said, as a starting point, is that um, all of the policy, all of the relevant policies of the development plan are complied with. Um, it wasn't necessary for me to relist those and undertake an assessment against them, but quite clearly, it's a very important policy um, that uh, the decision maker needs to take account of. Um, I think Mr. White's criticism was that on the basis that both the council and the rule six are coming from a position of the scheme being unacceptable, that one who needs to list uh, and, and understand the policies that are uh, the way in support of the proposal. And there's an absence of that. I think that's the point that was being made. Right. Now, can I just move on to one of the, the current use of the site um, is um, a use that's beneficial, isn't it? It's a valuable cultural facility which um, contributes to employment and the, the, the international standing of London. Um, isn't it? Um, that's certainly some of the evidence that's been put to us, yes. Yeah, yeah which you're not disputing. Um, I don't believe that I'm in an informed position to comment on um, the contribution Holden Studios makes in a, in a pan-London context. I certainly won't mm -hmm. argue that it is a cultural asset and um, it generates employment. That's, that's oh. absolutely agreed. Oh. Uh, and, and it's a use which um, both Hogan Studios are continuing to occupy and uh, the rest of the site continues to be occupied under licences other than Unit 2, which is under the control of the appellant. 
that's fully far occupied other than unit two far far on the way. Way. yeah 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 um no reason to believe that it wouldn't continue to be um fully occupied by home and studios and other similar uses uh on on the basis of mr mccartney's evidence when we last heard it um that would appear to be the case um but potentially circumstances may well change who knows and the current operation of that site um is going to be lost by the redevelopment and so looking at the benefits of the redevelopment you have to take into account what's going to be lost um don't you well this i suppose this is where we differ um in the in our opinion um the facility is not being lost because the facility is um film and photographic studios and other creative spaces and that's what the scheme can be provided um so that's not being lost holborn studios uh, as the business entity uh if they choose not to come back on the site that may well be lost um but that's not what the policy considers if you're wrong about the replacement in terms of what's being replaced um then you do have a loss don't you uh i, I acknowledge if i'm if i'm wrong that um reprovided film and photo space for film and photographic studios and cultural and creative space um hasn't been achieved by the scheme then yes there is a loss but that's not our case um and in terms of the employment benefits more generally um the increase if there's a benefit it's uh, um an increase of about 900 square meters net internal area 25 percent increase on net internal area that's that's the element of the employment benefit isn't it um on a comparison in mm. that, that, that includes the cafe as you as you well know from id 17 we've got various different up yeah benefits. um it's a thousand square meters if we potentially exclude the cafe on an nia basis um and it goes lower when we look at it on a gia basis yeah so I mean, but however you, however you, whichever particular row of figures you want to take, yeah, yeah. within that, I mean, yeah. we're we're looking at, and I mean, twenty twenty five percent is um, a, a relatively generous set of figures for those, but we're we're, we're looking at an, an increase of however you, you take those figures, an increase of that sort of order on the employment space which is on the site at the moment, uh, up to thirty odd percent, I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you're disrupting the existing businesses to achieve that degree of employment benefit, aren't you? Um, well, quite clearly, any redevelopment is likely to um, disrupt an existing business. But again, Mr. Howard, there's nothing in policy that deals with that. So I don't see that that is a particular issue for the decision maker to face the council. <laughs> Um, and also in terms of the extent of benefits, the discussion yesterday about compromised um, benefits, looking at the benefit from the housing, um, you described more benefit to a housing scheme which was 50% affordable housing than you would to a housing scheme which has got no affordable housing at all. Uh, and it makes a very small offsite affordable housing contribution, wouldn't you? The amount of benefit would be different. Um, on on the matter of affordable housing, definitely, um, there's greater weight, but one also needs to look at um, the need for housing as a whole. Um, so I think they're two different matters, in my mm. opinion. Um, one needs to look at um housing need housing supply housing provision and make a judgment and then i think you also look at um uh, housing mix and affordable housing as well oh, and if you look at look at housing mix so you have greater benefit to um a housing scheme which complies with the housing mix policies rather than one which doesn't again it still makes a meaningful contribution though 
and that's that's the uh, take to account. And the, the the benefit of a housing scheme which complies with the dual aspect policies and which has sufficient open space and so on, that benefit is greater than a scheme which doesn't comply with those as respects, isn't it? If the scheme didn't comply, but our case is that the scheme does comply. And um, what you've got and something that comes over from the committee reasons for refusal is a scheme which is fairly described as compromise, isn't it? Doesn't comply with so many elements that should be there in a mixed use scheme. There's not enough employment, there's not enough dual aspect, there's not enough family housing, there's the loss of the low cost employment, there's not enough open space, there's no affordable. It's, com it's a compromised scheme, isn't it, Mr. Marks? I, I don't agree with that, as uh, we've set out, um, and I set out in my evidence. Um, it's, it's my analysis that the scheme does comply um, with all of the policies. And you heard from Mr. Callum yesterday um, when he, he clearly set out that um, it's unusual um, for every single strand of, you know, the beginning of policies to be um, satisfied on complex mixed use schemes in London. Um, that's, that's not unusual at all. Um, so um, I don't believe that we're proposing anything out of the ordinary here. And as I said, on, on the basis of our analysis, um, when read as a whole, uh, we're compliant with the development plan. And of course, this isn't a site that's sort of in desperate need of being cleared and redeveloped because it's, it's semi-derelict or it's horribly underused or it's not doing anything particularly, particularly valuable. It's a site which your client acknowledges is a high viable site in its current use. That's one of the reasons you have viability problems, that the benchmark land value is quite high. Um, it's a valuable, productive site, which you're suggesting um, should be redeveloped for the scheme which, as we've discussed, doesn't meet the expectations in many respects of mixed use schemes that's the position here isn't it no no not at all um i mean it, it may well be the case um that um you know the the existing site as you say is, is in use and there is a valuable use but um if unless you can point me to a policy which says those sites shouldn't be redeveloped the starting point um of the development plan is quite clear that in highly accessible locations um previously developed land um should be at the starting point for the focus of redevelopment and there's a plethora of policies which support delivery of housing delivery of employment floor space in this specific location so everything from a plan perspective mr holder um points to the site being an optimum site for redevelopment Everything, the policy of protecting cultural facilities, the policy of protecting existing uses. Uh, this is a site that's protected, isn't it? As well as the heritage aspects. On the but on the basis that we're reproviding um, the the cultural and creative uses, um, we satisfy that policy. We've we've been through that. Mm. And if you don't, you lose. Is your case? Must be, doesn't it? If we don't provide the cultural facilities, no, well, we do. Discuss, we discussed that as well, Mr. Harwood. Yeah, but, you, you, but that, that's the position. If you, there are plenty of other issues, perhaps, but if you don't provide the cultural facilities, that's game over for the scheme, isn't it? I don't believe that to be the case. That's that's not what we've set out. We've clearly said that there are a number of other benefits that were in favour of the scheme, uh, and even before one gets there, um, you you need to weigh up. Uh, the, the delivery of, you know, the, the, the other overarching policy objectives for this site, um, which, as I've explained before, look to deliver homes and employment floor space uh, and weigh that up against the, the cultural use policy if one concludes that we haven't reprovided 
the cultural and creative use, which is not our case. Mr. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Harwood. Mr. White, can I invite you to re-examine the witness, please? Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. You'll be pleased to know that I'm going to be very short. Mr. Marks, three points in re-examination, um, please. The first is, do you remember a moment ago, Mr. Harwood asked you about the economic benefits in the context of the quantitative amount of floor space. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. When the inspector's reaching a view on on the benefit the weight to give to that benefit in your planning judgment is the creation of jobs and material factor or not absolutely yes now mr stevenson has given evidence in the interest of time um i won't ask you to read it but he has an appendices the holborn studios um company reports and he gives a figure from there 23 jobs currently um claimed by holborn studios and i yes. just want to ask you in the light of that and a number of jobs obviously from the licensees compared to the agreed position with the council of 529 what do you say about a comparison of the jobs that will be hosted from the site from the current position with the future position please right it's clearly a substantial uplift um which one should it take uh, uh attach um uh, substantial benefit to thank you next point please could you just take up the statement of common ground and it's please yeah. could you go to 8.25 yeah uh, and this is this is the, the statement of common ground with the council and it's just on this issue of use classes and what would be allowed or not Indeed. do you notice without prejudice to the reason of refusal it's agreed that while the particular occupational requirements of holborn studios photography studio may not be fully accommodated by the new floor space the space is considered to be of a design standard where it could be occupied by other potential occupiers in the class egi use class including creative uses such as film and photography studios and more conventional office uses so i just want to ask you uh, put aside what mr harwood contended but what does that indicate to you if anything the view of the local authorities view of where film and photographic studios fall in the use classes order please quite clearly that uh, a film and photography studio could accommodate uh class egi floor space um as well as other conventional office uses thank you can i then finally mr R would put the point about game over he said to you if you breach effectively hc5 and an lp10 in your judgment and the application of of paragraph 38.6 is it your view that it is in this case the position that if you, there are two breaches of the numerous policies you identify in the development plan is it your view that that would amount to effectively lead to a conclusion of contrary to section 38.6 or not what's your overall view on that no, as i responded to to mr harwood mr white uh, that that's not my opinion and that um the other um numerous policies of the development plan as we've discussed which promote uh redevelopment of the site um it, it being a sustainable location um the need for homes and jobs to be provided um as i set out in my um evidence in chief are the most substantial policies um that, that need to be taken account of is there from your recollection is there any indication in the development plan of a preference or more weighting for example to policies hc5 and lp10 over say st1 gg2 gg4 for example is there is there any text that the inspector could look at that gives a clear indication of the weighting or preference for a particular policy over another uh not that i'm aware oh, sorry there's certainly not policies that i am aware of that specifically um afford greater weight to um the cultural policies of either plan um the contrary can be said for um housing and um employment objectives uh of both the london plan and the local plan um 
which throughout um, clearly identify those as the priority uses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, right, Mum, can I just make two comments? I don't accept, um, Mr Harwood, you'll know, Mum, I didn't want to, we don't accept in any way Mr Harwood's characterisation of the legal position on the towpath, you know that's in dispute. So the, the questions put by Mr Harwood, I just want to make it clear, we completely reject the scenario that Mr Harwood put or his summary of the legal position, and I just want that recorded. The other point is, I uh, just want Mr Harwood put to my learned friend that the committee report identified the development as compromised. I couldn't find that reference. So could I just ask Mr Harwood, he can do it privately, but could he just tell me where in the committee report that, that comment is made as it was put to Mr Mr Marks? Well, I didn't suggest the committee report use the expression compromise. You did. You no, I didn't. Um, did. And I decided that wasn't the point wasn't put. Put, put in that way. Uh, it was. I, I, put, I put it to Mr Marks that the scheme was compromised. No, you didn't. You said that the committee report identified that the scheme was compromised. I took an absolute note on it because I knew it wasn't correct, frankly. Anyway, let Mum, you will obviously reread the committee report on reflection. I'm just, um, looking, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay. Thank you very much. Those are, that's my re-examination of Mr Marks. Thank you very much. And that also concludes the case for the appellant in this matter. Probably words you never thought you'd hear. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, OK, it's now 18.06. We do have a few matters uh, to go through. And I would like to do them now, if everyone's comfortable with that because obviously if we're taking we have to have everything wrapped up before closings now the matter of the condition um condition 41 uh was raised that that's the 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 one that uh deals with the use classes does anyone want to well it's really a appellant and council do you want to say anything on that I think it's probably for Mr Beard to start off because, as you know, the council is seeking to restrict mm. yeah. in law. The, yeah, I'll let Mr Beard, he needs to frankly tell you why condition 41 is necessary, particularly in the light of the case made by the rule six. Madam Chair, so I'm pleased to do that. Uh, we've discussed this previously um, and the reason for the condition is uh, uh, is made clear and and is accepted. It's accepted that it is necessary, as I understand matters. I've taken instructions on the specific point regarding the ambit of the um, of the restriction, and certainly um, those instructing me are not concerned. Would not be concerned if it was widened to class E, paragraph G, uh, without without the limitation on on um, uh, Little Roman I, if I can put it like that. Um, clearly, the issue, uh, as has been canvassed, is that uh, the, the proposal uh, is for um, employment floor space in class E G1, which is the old uh, uh, B1A, if I can put it like that, yeah. um, as, as I understand matters. but. And that is obviously because um, it's an employment-led development, and it's claimed to be within the priority office area. All of that being said, it is not the council's case, uh, having regard to what has just been referred to, um, um, the agreed common ground as to um, the flexibility of the uh, potential use of the employment force base it's not the council's case that it should be necessarily restricted outside of what is agreed upon which is uh, office use um, with an element of creative use now it seems to me that there is nothing within um, um, um there is nothing within uh, e, class e g two and three that would necessarily offend against the priorities of the development plan having regard to this site but we need to be careful here because it is not any part of the appellant's case to say 
that there should be ultimately flexible um, floor space um, or that the, the proposed development is something for is something involving the re, uh, the provision of employment floor space outside of uh, the office type of b1 uh, uh, sorry, b1a once when it was applied for but also in terms of uh, how it's now redefined if i can put it like that um under e class e g1 so there's a balance to be struck here um against the extent to which it is necessary to impose this condition having regard to the nature of the development that has been applied for so whereas the local planning authority is is entirely um content madam for you to take a view on uh, whether and to what extent that that uh, condition is necessary uh, to make the development acceptable the development applied for acceptable um it has to be remembered that the nature of the development applied for is was specified in the terms that it was in the description of development. So I hope that I hope that assists you, Madam, and, and the appellant to understand where, where it comes from. And maybe just one more point of clarification. The local planning authority cannot go and does not go behind what he has already already accepted in terms of the nature of the develop uh, the commercial floor space that has been uh, has uh, that is proposed to be provided, which has the flexibility and could be used by creative industries. I hope that's a success. Okay, thank you. Mr. White, do you want to say anything? Oh, I, I don't think so, no. I mean, if uh, you've got, I think we, we obviously line up with the council that we take the we take the definition that the council do on, on EG1, and, um, and we also stand fully behind 825. If that's the position of the council, we're very happy. And frankly, we support the council on that view, and it defeats the point that Mr. Harwood sought to make in cross examination. Okay, is anybody anticipating any change to that condition? Are you suggesting any change? Uh, not at all, madam. But might, I'm, might yes. I just make absolutely clear that um, I agree with my little friend, Mr. What Mr. White has just said, but that does not exclude. Um, that does not exclude the reality that there will be creative uses that fall outside of um, EG1 um, that you, that are related to photography and uh, and the like or studio uses. So really, what really what um, um, uh, in my respectful submission needs to be considered is that the is the nature of the development that has been proposed, and it is not proposed. The development that is proposed is not in any sense proposed for uses that would not ordinarily come within uh, the characterization of class uh, EG generally, EG1 in, in particular. So I don't want it to be misconstrued uh, that, the, that there's any agreement on behalf of the um, local planning authority that there is that this proposed development could be used for a form of creative industry that does not comply with the characterization as it's generally uh, that could generally be justified as class e g generally okay thank you for that could i also uh, sorry ma'am just one point just, i mean in yep. terms of, in terms of what the limit is and so on we're not um a bit but just the, the point on the wording of the draft which is shall, um second line shall only operate within that use class of course the use class is class e it would given the intention is to confine it to eg1 will be in that paragraph of the use class or something to that effect but it's um the, the the wording um whilst the reason and appreciate of course that whilst there's a reason here the reasoning won't appear were permission to be granted in your decision letter um so the the reasoning suggested here wouldn't actually be at all to the interpretation of the mission but, but the second line um is is vague about is it restriction to class e or is it to egi so that, that would need sorting yeah. regardless of any any merits considerations i understand yeah. thank yeah. you um also the other thing on uh 
uh, condition one approved drawings the statement of common ground i think has got something uh, 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 drawings that form part of the application can i for absolute clarity can i have a list of doc, uh, drawings or uh, that, that are sought to be approved so i would if i could have that and um the point that mr Har harwood made in relation to condition 41 an agreed position on both those points and can i have that um reasonably by 12 o'clock tomorrow okay um timings for closings please if you're able to update update me on that could i just Mark, shall i go first as, as please, i'm please. giving mine um first no more than one hour uh mr harwood um up to an hour and a half and uh mr white Mum, I think we will be about an hour and a half as well. So that's four hours, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, at this point, any costs applications? No, madam. Mr. White. Um, I, I will. I will confirm by twelve o'clock tomorrow in the light of the evidence we've heard yesterday. But I think we address this at the CMC. So. The likelihood is the position we set out in the CMC, Mom. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, Malika, just make so one final point before we close. Malone friend was um, between the end about it suggests saying that I had suggested to Mr. Marks that the committee report was compromised, and I said um, and I said correctly that I didn't say that. Um, but when he raised that, it didn't occur to me quite where he got the misapprehension from the it was a point at, towards the end of mr mark's evidence where i put to him that from the reasons for refusal the committee considered that the scheme was compromised so that was the point i was pushing that the committee considered the scheme was compromised not that the committee report had said the scheme was compromised okay, okay. yeah so i hope that's helpful don't, don't worry mom i'll let mr harwood have the last word okay okay um okay so um 9 30 we'll um not able to sit tomorrow or thursday and we will resume again 9 30 on friday and that will be for closings um have i got somebody on the line who's available to do a test uh for the link yeah mum before you deal with that can i just ask you a question because it, it will affect planning in the light of the time estimates would it be your aspiration to have a mid-morning break and try and finish and then frankly leave before a lunch break is that your aspiration if we have if we are free what are we four hours nine thirty takes us to one thirty would that i mean yeah. i just is that roughly what we obviously we I might have a so, yeah yeah okay I would have thought so we'll have a mid-morning break and then we'll yeah yeah Thank I wouldn't you. anticipate if we have to we'll go into the afternoon but I wouldn't have anticipated it great thank so, you so. now sorry if I can just say I don't actually have the link through uh for uh, 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 is it a new new link that would uh, be required yeah, Friday's one is a new link I've sent it again to Helen I won't get it. When did you say? I, I won't get it, I'm afraid. Um, one second. Let me try and turn the messages on so that I can send you the link there. So I don't know if you can see the messaging column. I've just turned it back on. So I've put oh, the link there. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the link? So where it says video call link. So.
Okay, so I've admitted you on that one. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Has that link been sent around to everyone, please? Yeah, all the participants should have it in their calendars. Okay, that's fine. I've just tested the link. It's working up and running. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Now, um, 18.20, that's a long day sitting. We've had two long days, but we have got through it. Thank you very much, everyone, and um, we'll resume at 9.30 on Friday. Thank you very much. The inquiry is adjourned.